Welcome, dear listeners. I'm Jonathan Carlin. And I'm Benjamin Carlin. And we invite you to join us through the Gryffindor, your one-way ticket to the enchanting world of Harry Potter. So grab your wands and dust off your broomsticks and join us as we unlock the treasures behind Chamber of Secrets, Chapter 4, Flourish and Blots. Oh, man. So I feel like we, we left last episode potentially on like a, a glorious cliffhanger as to your thoughts for uh, the Chapter 4. Oh. Uh, thumbnail art here. Uh, yeah, the chapter have, art. The chapter for chap- art. Yes, for yes. Flourish and Blots. I mean, it's a 12 out of 10. Ben. It, I mean, maybe the best chapter art in any book <laughs> uh, in all seven <laughs> books. We might have peaked peak, right here. <laughs> it's pretty peak Gilderoy for sure. He is so spot on, so <laughs> oh silly, so goofy with a sparkling smile and his it's book has the exact so same face. So silly, I know. Oh, man. It's this idea of like wizards wearing hats, like the one that Gilderoy is wearing in the chapter art for this one is also... Like, I feel like it's highly introduced in the beginning, but then it feels like a, like kind of forgotten eventually. Yeah, that like wizards wear hats. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Like like your classic wizard's hat. So he's got his little stars there going on. I think there's a little moon right on the end of his hat. Oh, uh, there is. Yeah, like it's the, it almost like it's it's such a funny photo because what I love that the he smiling is holding a book of himself smiling in the exact same way, and then he's supposed to be this like super famous like fashionable guy, but then like even like. It's it's like so gaudy at the same time. Like his hat, even in black and white, clashes horribly with his robes. Yeah, like, yeah. It's this. It's like not the same color pattern. It's not even the same like pattern of stars. You know, it's like the the robe has stars and moons, and his hat has just stars with like the little moon at the end. But I, yeah, it's just it, oh, it's so wonderful. I love it. It's hilarious and silly and just such a such an introduction to the character. It is such an introduction to the character. It is, it's really funny. And it, I also love that you wrote 12 out of 10 because I wrote 11 out of 10. Just <laughs> wow. A plus and three gold stars. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. <laughs> that, that, that was my that was my my uh, hyper analysis there of our, our chapter art. So there you go. Yes. Very good. Very good. Well, there you so I'm sure you guys all agreed endlessly. And if you saw the thumbnail ahead of time, you were like, wow, 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 wow. Amazing. 10 out of 10 chapter art, if not higher. Um, and you'd have nothing but uh, personal agreements about it. So let us let us know if you disagree, but I feel like it's almost impossible. Um, anyway, so Flourish and Blots, this is a, uh, a pretty interesting chapter looking way down the line in some uh, scenarios, but then also just sort of um, is it's where the thing happens that sets up the book. It's like where the diary is sort of introduced. Yeah, I, I know it's kind of it's it's an interesting chapter in that way because, yeah, you get introductions to some some super key characters characters that we haven't met uh, before at all. There's some super key artifacts that end up being vitally important as time goes on. Um, so yeah, kind of kind of an interesting chapter to unpack where it was kind of like I got to the end of it and then was almost being like I was having like more thoughts and having to like go back and find specific passages and like re-highlight and add more notes and stuff. So my, yeah. my chapter is actually pretty scribbled in for this. Oh, one. absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot happening in this one for sure. So um, I mean, I love we, we touched on this a ton in the last chapter, um, but I love even just the opening sentence. Life at the borough was as different as possible from life on Privet Drive. It's like, yes, yes, it is. It is indeed. Yes. And, you know, it's it's funny because this is like something that we've touched on a few different times. And I, and I feel like maybe I, I like was able to step back from it and sort of like gleam the important bits. But it, the, the, ner- the very next sentence is the Dursleys liked everything neat and ordered. The Weasley's house burst with the strange and unexpected. Um, and this is it's like like, it's kind of something that I, I like, especially as I get older, I like it's a sentiment uh, that I could almost struggle with because there is something really, really nice about your house being clean. Well, OK, I think uh, you're right. You're right. It is like one of those things where it's like, well, there's nothing wrong with being clean. It's like there's nothing wrong with being clean, but the Dursleys are almost like sterile, like they're clean for almost the wrong reasons. Th- like, the, yes. they're clean because it is a matter of like conforming and because it is like a matter of adhering to their imagine, imagined standards of like normality. Whereas like if your house is clean, it's simply because it improves the living quality. If you're like organized and clean and stuff at your house, it's not you're not like necessarily adhering to conformity as much as you are trying to make like a more comfortable, enjoyable place for you to like habitate. Yes. Yes. Right. And and that's exactly it. You know, and I think like when you look at even like Hermione as a character in general, like she's a very like neat and orderly person in a way that doesn't come across as like 
like problematically so. So I think right. I think your sterile line there is exactly right. It's like the I think they even describe Petunia's kitchens as being like surgically clean. And yes. It's like, okay. Th- th- like that's taking it. That is taking it too far. And it's like she's clearly bought into something that has told her that this is like of utmost importance. And she's yeah. trying to do it to such an extreme level that it's like, okay, well, now you're just not making the, the space hospitable for anyone. Right. Yeah. You, it's yourself like, it's, included. Though. Right. Yeah. It's not, it's not even better for them to live in. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yep. So anyway, I think that that's, that's sort of like the, the delineation there. Cause we, we, we've said several times the podcast has progressed, like magic is messy and that's kind of fun, but it's also like then as a, you know, as a grown adult with a two year old, it's like, I don't like messy. <laughs> yeah. Know? Like, right, like pick up the, Oh God, there's, I can't move in this room or yeah, there has definitely been times where my, my son, Luke's room is like so cluttered with things that like just being in his room makes me like physically shake. I'm like, Luke, I, I'm sorry. I can't be in here right now. I need to leave. I need, I need, you know what? I'm going you know to have to just, sit, breathe it out a little I bit. Know. Yeah. This is We're not what the Weasley's again. meant. <laughs> yeah. This is, yeah. It's not Weasley. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. that's perfect. Um, and then we get the next line though, where they have a mirror uh, over the kitchen mantle and it shouts at Harry, tuck in your shirt, Scruffy, which is one of those lines that I would have bet you $12,000 happened at um, the leaky cauldron. The leaky cauldron. I mean, I have a note right here that says, does this happen at the leaky cauldron? And the answer is yes, there is a second mirror at the leaky cauldron, which also talks to Harry and is like a little snarky with him. I don't think it says this exact line, but it does happen again with a different mirror. Okay. Okay. Well, that makes me feel a little bit better because I was like, I, I would swear up and down that that is where this scene happens. And apparently it happens here instead. And it's like, it almost seems odd to me and out of place again in the Weasley's house where it's like, it doesn't seem like they would have a rude mirror. Yeah, right. Like if this is a mirror that has a problem with a little bit of scruff, then um, it must constantly be bothered. It's got a lot to say. It's got a yeah. lot to yeah. say. It, yeah. e- it even seems more in line with uh, like number 12 Grimald Place. Right. You know, like like kind of right next to the, the portrait of Sirius's mother. It's right, like, right. Like she's like, yelling at you. The mirror's yelling at you. Like, yes. Yeah. yeah geez, yeah. man, you're an embarrassment. Yeah, exactly. So uh, anyway, there's that. Uh, we have the ghoul in the attic, which the ghoul is always kind of one of those random things from like, is the ghoul there? on purpose is is it like uh yeah, are they, did they like take it in exactly yeah yeah, yeah. or is, is this some type of sort of like you know some houses have ghouls it's like you know <laughs> we can't get rid of it you got ghouls you got a ghoul you know it's like yeah it does seem like can you not get rid of it like, yeah what's the problem do you right. want it up there it reminds me of those insurance commercials where it's like we moved into a new house and it's it's great but it has ants right. and what they mean is like like ants yeah like, like family, a-u-n-t-s yes yeah. aunts, aunts. Uh, are there uh, that is one of the best commercials ever though it's got ants <laughs> and they're yes. just like criticizing everything they're basically just literally aunt petunias walking around the house being like it's a lot of house yeah right yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, i mean literally like two of the aunts in that commercial are named uh rose and joan and like my wife beth literally has an aunt rose and an aunt joan and it's just like it makes me laugh so hard that they got the names exactly right for the aunts that, <laughs> that is like, so funny no way right there's that's no way. that's like one of those like am i on the truman show joan here yeah <laughs> yeah yeah like, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah oh mm-hmm. man it's got ants, uh, so like that ants. that's the question though with the ghouls is that is that just like having ants and they're just sort of right. it's like well it's something we live with you know you get ghouls. used to it yeah there's a ghoul in the attic and I'm like you're getting rid of that like if uh, excuse me <laughs> it's not, not an option it's not really it's like, like you, part of the house you don't really so get rid of it you, you know just, you have a ghoul right you, know, you just have a ghoul it's we like a ghouls. poltergeist right but there must be some sort of delineation or else i'd call it a poltergeist good point uh, so i don't know about that i love how there's also it says uh there's small explosions from fred and george's bedroom were considered perfectly normal which just sounds like they're a thousand percent doing magic yeah almost like, certainly like mr and mrs weasley must have ju- they just like resigned themselves like yes some magic happens in the house against the rules that like there's we cannot it's like we cannot possibly enforce it. Yeah, no, you know? I mean, especially yeah, with with the determination and will of of people like Fred and George, right? Where it's right. just sort of like there's there's really no way around it. Like they're going to do it. They will it's, do it's it. It's inevitable. Yeah. It's just like having ghouls. Exactly. There's nothing you can do about it. Exactly. It also seems crazy to me that like like even if you like took away this whole the rule seems so. Di- I mean, the, we have, I mean I have a thousand questions and problems with the trace yeah. as a concept, but it's like even if like you like took away their wands like wandless magic is still a thing you know like would you be not allowed to do wandless magic 
Right, you know? right, like like Harry like making the glass disappear at the yeah. zoo. Or yeah, but like there's the like there's like wizard schools that are canon where like they don't even use wands; they just teach wandless magic. Right, right. Like th- that's the thing too is that like you know you, you learn about the emotional outbursts of uh, like wizards or witches who will eventually learn to harness it, it like between like birth and age like eleven ish when yeah. they get their letters for school. But like there's a lot to be said for the fact that ages eleven to seventeen are also like like highly emotional eras of your yeah. life where you're almost absolutely going to inadvertently be causing some amount of magic. Oh, oh yes, so, almost yeah. inadvertently. But then like even like Voldemort before he's even like uh, like Tom Riddle at age 11 is like purposefully doing yes, controlled wandless magic. That and that's one of those things too where it's like you almost have to imagine the ministry was detecting these like alerts and being like okay, we get it. Yep, we will send somebody as soon as possible with haste like we know that there is someone here who can do magic and it's like that is like it's like it's so unusual that this orphanage is having so many instances of of magic happening yeah but they had to have assumed that it was all unintentional right but that that's like a, that probably more of a testament to tom riddle's own power where that's it's true. like it's like he was doing it on purpose right yeah yeah, yeah. i love the line too so the thing that's the most different is the fact that everyone there seemed to like him and it's like oh oh what a gut punch i know Just like I know. oh my gosh <sighs> it, it and I mean with I, I've said it before, but it kind of goes back to the same thing for these first few books. It's like I feel like the amount, the, the the actual genuinely limited amount of time that we ever spend with the Dursleys and how well you inherently understand that it is not a good place for Harry to have to go back to, and then the ever looming threat of the expulsion thing. Yeah, it just seems to like keep coming up, especially like in the next couple of books as well. It's just sort of like it's like. You, it's like the main reason that that's such a dire concern other than obviously like you know missing out on like learning all this cool new magic stuff yeah it's just like it means life of the dursleys forever. it means life of the dursleys yeah, it's, like, it's like it feels like dumbledore could have just pulled up beside him and like look 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 you know follow the rules and stuff but like you're the chosen one so um like don't worry like we're going to take care of you you're not going to have to live with them yeah, in, in and, the end no matter what okay right, like it's it's best if you do because protection but also, like, don't worry. Like, you're not. You're 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 coming back, <laughs> dude. That would have been the nicest thing. Like, Dumbledore's whole thing is sort of like, well, I wanted to make sure you had some some version of like a normal life. It's like, just tell him this information. I know. Tell him he is not doomed to live there forever. Right. Yeah. You don't have to know him as a chosen one. Just be like, don't worry. Right. You don't. Right, you right. will not have to live there. Right. We, yeah. We, we all get it. We all they, get it. They are not nice. Anyway. Yeah. But you're right. Yeah. It is. It yeah. is such a gut punch. Super uh, sad. Then there's uh, Mr. Weasley asking Harry how, to explain how things like plugs and the postal service worked, which like also it's it's funny to me. There's two things about this. One, it's funny to me that he thinks a 12 year old knows how like plugs work, but because like I couldn't tell, I couldn't like describe to you the way in which like a plug works after you plug it into the wall. Oh my gosh. No, I know. I, yeah. I remember the first time uh, I, I had my aquarium store uh, back in like 2008 and I remember I was trying to install new outlets and so I like went to the store and this is not advisable by the way um, always hire an electrician instead and I was trying to like do it on my own oh, wow. and, like, run wires and stuff like that yeah. and I remember I had a customer who was an electrician I was like yeah I can't get this plug to work and I like showed him all of the weird wiring that I did where I was just like making it up attempting to interpret like yeah. the intended like function and he was like I see your logic, but this is not even remotely close to correct. Wow. And I mean, it was like, it, it, like I had done like such a ridiculous configuration. Were you just like guessing or did you like look anything up? No, I was just guessing. Oh, yeah, wow. Just straight up guessing. Wow. Yeah, so huge hazard. Okay. In the but end. Th- okay. The other thing that's about this though is that like for Mr. Weasley, who was someone who was like genuinely interested in muggle artifacts and like fascinated by them and like wants to know how they work, like you know, to me, I put, I plug it into the wall, electricity comes out, I don't think about it. Like, he is interested to know how that works. Like, how and why it works. But, like, to me, like, and I don't know if this is just, like, in the age of the internet, which obviously he has no concept of or anything, but, like, even, like, it feels to me, like, if I wanted to know how a plug worked, I could, I could know how it worked by the end of today. 
Oh, sure. You know, yeah. like the information, even if I didn't have the internet, I feel like I could I could go to a library and be like, I'm looking for stuff about like electricity and how plugs work or how to install something in my home. And they'd be like, yeah, we have books about that, of course, I right know. over here. Like, it seems like if he's so fascinated, it just seems so learnable. <laughs> It, it does, but it's like you. This is this is what I wrote down. I was because I, I also kind of highlighted the same area, and I said it's really so interesting to try and get into the head uh, in perspective of someone who can perform magic because yeah. it's like all I'm trying to think is like if you were to go to like a remote tribe, like deep in a jungle, and try to see like the way in which they were able to replicate a common piece of. Uh, like technology that we're used to having, right. like like a like a like a hammock or something like that, you yeah. know, and like like weaving it together out of um, like you know the the materials that are potentially on hand, or, yeah. or turning like a piece of bamboo into like a like a sleeping situation mm-hmm. or something. It's like it's it's like man, without like modern tools, it's amazing to me to see how you are able to come up with. What is otherwise a solution very similar to like what our ultimate outcome is, right? But we have like power tools and such, yeah. And so his specific line is um, ingenious, really. How many muggles have found a way of getting along without magic? And I feel like that's like, like you might go and and see like this remote tribe and be like, man, it's it's kind of brilliant that you were able to figure this out, like, right? Yeah, you know. And I, and I think that that's probably like it's like you take for granted so much of like what the technology you have at your disposal solves for you and in this case their technology isn't technology at all it's It's just magic it's just magic so i think it like certain processes that you have to figure out like because you you are forced to solve these problems you know gives you just completely different manner of thinking i guess so i guess you're like like i don't think that i'm hard about like electricity or something but for him i'm sure it would be like wait a minute so like there's a there's like a you guys built a wall on a lake and then you let the water out and that's turning on the lights in your house or yes. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, like, 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 yeah. Like, yeah. Referring to building a dam. Like making a dam yeah, for like yeah. hydroelectric power or something. Yeah. Right. 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 Exactly. Um, and that's the type of thing yeah, that must seem like so completely like, strange right. and foreign. Yeah. I can see. I guess so. Because the other thing is, I guess he is like pure blood. So it's like he has never lived in the muggle world at all yes right yeah so maybe even like the kinds of things they'd have at lot like i don't know it's like crazy to me that because like but like libraries exist in the wizarding world it's like does he not think libraries exist in the muggle world sure that's a good point as well and and given his profession it just seems like he should know given his more than the average person about how muggle stuff works not only his profession but his hobby of like yes. being able to successfully like magicify you know the the flying fort anglia yeah like, even that alone suggests like you must because he i think he it says he took it together and put took apart and put back together the car. Yeah. So it's like, that's an impressive amount of knowledge to then also not know how something is yeah. common. It's like a household plug would work. Right. Um, I suppose there is like this line that like technology doesn't like work at Hogwarts. There's like too much magic in the air. So like maybe the act of just being a wizard and trying to fiddle with like electronics, like it just like, even if you're doing it right, maybe it just doesn't work. Sure. Or something. Yeah. Well, and this is another one too, like where I think, um, Anything can sound like like techno babble, like uh, like the Marvel universe. I feel like, and especially I think it was Ant-Man oh, and the Wasp. Yeah. Like there's a there's a line where Scott Lang is like, you can't just throw quantum in front of everything and make it sound like important or whatever. Right. And I I think that this is like one of those where it's like, oftentimes as you're ever entering like a new arena that has a whole bunch of like terminology and everything attached to it. Yeah. Um. Certain things can sound highly complicated, and your preliminary understanding of how those things work yeah. can then make you feel like you know a lot about a given topic. So like again, if I were to go like back into my aquarium days, it's like if I were to start explaining to you like solenoid valves on my calcium reactor or something like that, like that might sound like techno babble. Right. And if somebody was like like attempting to sound smart to me about aquariums in reference that they know what a calcium reactor is, it would become very obvious to me very quickly whether or not they actually know how one works right. or if they've ever used one before mm-hmm. because like it is a complex thing. So it can, it's like you might know the vernacular. You might know to ask, oh, do you run a calcium reactor? And that's very different from knowing it how one works right sure um and and so i think sometimes that i don't know yeah so i i I think that like his his lack of knowledge i think 
Like it, it seems, it, it does seem surprising to me, but I also like, I, I feel like I also get it. I, th- I think that there's something there. So I don't know, but yeah, M- Mr. Weasley and his fascination with all things muggles. Like, I mean, it's just like, I think the number of times I could probably write just like, and I, and I even scribbled it in at least uh, one other line uh, where he asked about the escapata- escapators. The inst- oh, like uh, escalators. Yeah. yeah, I just said, LOL. I love Mr. <laughs> Weasley. I feel like I could do that, like with everything he asks. Yeah. I'm just always like, I'm just so interested in all the questions he he wants to know more about. Right. Yeah. Like, what? What? Why has this thing stood out to you amongst all of the Muggle inventions? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, speaking of which, they get their letters uh, from school. And uh, Mr. Weasley points out that Dumbledore already knows you're here, Harry. Doesn't miss a trick, that man. Um, or he at yes. So, which to me I think is interesting. But like, so when Mr. Weasley sees this, he attributes Dumbledore's knowledge or d- the fact that the owl came to Harry is Dumbledore is the one who addressed the letters and sends them out. So does that mean that Dumbledore was the one like tracking Harry around last year through the different rooms of the Dursley's house? And to the hotel and to the hut on the rock and stuff like that. I, I feel like it has to be. Right. <laughs> like, you know, and, and this is another one that, another one where it's like maybe this is like the trace coming in like in a good way. Like like where it's kind of like now we know the exact like like positioning, although that would break down very quickly once you applied it to like Fred and George having explosions coming from their room. Right. You know, yeah. it would be like, you know, third floor on the left you know, right room with bunk beds or whatever. Yeah, I could, it's just interesting. I was assume there's some sort of like magic to the owls and the way they just know where stuff is because like like fast forward to Goblet of Fire, Harry will send Hedwig to like go find Sirius and he'll be like, take this to Sirius. <laughs> and like he has no idea where not even like on Earth Sirius is because he's like switching countries and stuff. True, you true, know? true yes. And Hedwig will find him. Right. And it's just like, well, how did that work? You know, like that, that I do think is magic. Yeah, I think right. It's got to be like magical positioning or, or something about the owls that like is, is very unique, which also makes you wonder whether or not these are magical owls versus like your everyday owls. Oh, right. Yeah, because like, there are difference between, yes, magical owls and regular owls or all owls magical or. Oh, I like that better. Yeah. I like, all owls are magical. All owls are magical. Just there's too many of them and muggles know about them. Yes, exactly. Yes, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah. Right, no, right. I, that's that's the that's the preferred way of thinking. All right. So anyway, they get there. Um, this is where your uh, other your next introduction to Gildor Lockhart here is that you see that the second year students or basically every single year's worth of students requires every single uh, Gilderoy Lockhart book, which has got to be just one of the greatest scams ever. I like, know hey, he's got to be making like a flat out killing so much like ev- I mean, he's only, I mean, how many books do they have to get of his uh, seven? There are seven Gilderoy Lockhart books and like what at least 200 students at Hogwarts. I mean, he is just selling books like crazy right now yes no it's it's and it's hilarious to me because you literally get the standard book of spells grade two by miranda goshawk which it, this is like a fun continuity thing where it, it's like there's a standard book of spells for every year and right. it's always written by miranda goshawk yeah so that's a fun like throwback but that like it it stands to reason though that like back in their first year when they bought like fantastic beasts and where to find them by newt's commander it's like there are certain books that you're just able to use year in year out because oh right that's the other thing too is that like in my mind i was like did he somehow convince like snape like is is holiday with hag somehow like a potions book you know like like these or are all of these books attached to the defense against the dark arts class that they're going to be taking i've assumed that they are all specifically for defense against the dark arts so that would normally mean that for 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 second year students you would typically only actually need two books whatever the dada uh book would be and then the standard book of spells grade two. Oh, you know that i see what you mean yeah like if lockhart wasn't there would you only have to buy like two books yes yes or I, you know i've always sort of assumed that we just don't get to see the rest of the list they just sort of stop there i guess that's also possible yeah. but you're right otherwise that'd be interesting too if you just had because other yeah you're right fantastic beasts somewhere to find them or like a thousand magical herbs and fungi yes um could still conceivably just be like yes you are still we're gonna we didn't cover all a thousand in the first year right 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 so yeah, yeah only yeah. covered one eighth right one and you, yeah. you're still gonna be using a lot of them for potions and stuff like that so right. whatever um, or yeah whatever the potions book was like probably didn't make every single potion in the book or whatever so yeah that would be crazy if it's like instead of having to buy like two books per student you now have to buy like eight <laughs> yes <laughs> which is yes. Tr- also it seems so silly to me that um 
like it seems like such a red flag that if you're that that every single year because Fred and George's list are the same. So it's like, why are the books the same for each different year of defense against the dark arts? Like why would it seems weird to me that like second year students would need the same books as like seventh year students. Oh, I know. Well, I mean, but, and that's the thing is that it's like, I, I wonder if at all, like part of like Lockhart, like I wonder if Lockhart has an agent and Lockhart's agent was like, sure, he'll come teach defense against the dark arts. Right. Every single student needs to buy his entire collection. Exactly. You know, and yeah. it's just like, it's like, because, I mean, and when it really comes down to it, it doesn't seem very likely at all that Lockhart has any intention of successfully teaching them anything at all. Oh, I know. I just like, imagine, imagine you just see, it seems so obvious that you'd be a fraud so quickly, like, like, especially like the seventh year students or something, you know, like, cause he doesn't, he doesn't really teach anyone anything. He just tells them stories. Oh, I know. Yeah. And yeah, it's of like his own heroics of his own heroics. And it just seems like you would be so, it'd be so obvious that you weren't good at doing anything. I know. Well, I mean, again, this goes back to the <clears throat> Dumbledore's big plan thing where it's like Lockhart is specifically hired. Yes. For one key purpose. Which, yeah. To show Harry how not to be. Yes. Precisely. <laughs> basically. Yep. Uh, anyway, um, let's see. There's um, I love this. so after we get this there, uh, Harry speaks to Ginny and he says, oh, were you starting at Hogwarts this year? Yeah. <laughs> like this at this point, Harry has lived there for like a week. And so like a week later, it hasn't come up at all that Ginny is going to Hogwarts this year. I know. Like, I know. Poor Ginny who's sitting there like literally speechless in love with Harry. Right. And he, he hasn't even taken enough notice to know that she's going to school this right, year. Right, right, right. Yes. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's like, oh, come on, Harry, man. Pick up on something. Jeez, like, dude. Th- th- this is like another one of those where it's also like, like him and Ron have just also been best friends for a whole year. It's kind of right. like when he like got into his room and didn't like, it was like, oh, you like the Chudley Cannons, huh? It's yeah. Like, somehow this didn't come up from our whole year of friendship. It's like <laughs> at no point in time, it was relevant news that like I have a younger sister who will be starting next year. Yeah. Like, yeah, this actually, you know what this reminds me of though? It, it, it doesn't, maybe it is a little more believable because some days like I will come home from work and my wife Beth will be like, how was uh, everyone's weekend? You know, whatever we get up to it. I'll be like, oh, I guess, um, uh, Ben and Alice went to some restaurant or, you know, whatever, whatever you told me, I'll just say that back verbatim. And then she'll have like seven follow up questions about it. Like who did they go with? Or like, what did they get? Or, you know, like who watched Addy or whatever. And I'm just like, "Mm, (laughs) yes, there were more questions I could have asked. Ben went to dinner and (laughs) that's what I know. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah, so not nearly as much information. As right, exchange. that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, it's like, but it does. Uh, on that note, though, um, it does seem like sports would have come up for Ron and Quidditch and the Chudley Cannons. It does. It does indeed. Yeah, yeah. With your with your best bud. Yeah. Um, uh, in other news, though, then we've got. Um, uh, Percy entering the scene. He was mm-hmm. already dressed. <laughs> like I-, I love how he was already dressed, and it was like it's almost like I'm judging him for already being dressed because Fred and George came in, in their pajamas, and it's like, well, clearly Fred and George have it right. And I'm like, what would he be doing already being dressed? Um, but then he- it says his Hogwarts prefect badge pinned to his sweater vest, and <laughs> I wrote in his own <laughs> home audible eye roll. <laughs> <I know. laughs> like, why are you wearing the badge around outside of school, dude? Right, it has no authority here. I know. It's just like, I wanted you all to remember in case you forgot that I'm a prefect. Yes. Yes, indeed. The highest honor anyone could have at this age. We have not forgotten, Percy. Yes, no one has forgotten. It does seem silly to wear it around. That'd be like, you may as well just be wearing your school uniform around the house. Like, dude, we're not in class yet. What are you doing? I know. I know. It's so true. Yeah. It's so true. But then, I mean, on the flip side, though, we'll find out in a few minutes that Hermione has been like feverishly working away uh, on schoolwork all summer break. And it's like, it's like, well, maybe, maybe they have some similarities. There is some of that. I mean, there is there are some similarities between them. But yeah, I highlighted that as well. Where um, in Hermione's letter she says, "I'm very busy with schoolwork, of course." And uh, Ron's like, "How can she be?" Said Ron and her, "We're on vacation." And it's like that's true. And yet, the very next year, I think they do have homework over summer break. Do they? I think so because like Harry is like 
it's like Harry Potter was not like most kids. For one, he wanted to be doing his schoolwork. Ah, as, true, true, true. And, and yeah. then it's like, it's like one of those like, let me remind you how much Snape hates Harry who because he would love nothing more than to give him a failing grade and on the first day. Right. Or yeah. something. That's a good point. That's yeah. A good point. But it's like also, but like, yeah, he's right. How can she be? Because they don't, they don't apparently have homework this time. Well, I know. And then the other thing that I wrote in here was like, she also like, like we know that in about a week they're going to meet up to get their uh to get their books right. so it's like it's not even like she's just like studying the books that she's going to need for the upcoming oh yeah it's not like she's got new books and she's like well i'm doing schoolwork in the ways that i'm reading my new books exactly right which is always one of those things like when like whenever i think about hermione doing this i'm like man how much would i absolutely have crushed school if before the school year started i had already read the whole textbook oh that'd be crazy like, yeah. yeah i mean you'd be so <laughs> ahead Yes, yes. So. If only I was so motivated to be great at school when I was 11. Yeah, I wasn't. Yeah. I wasn't. Not so yeah. much. Oh, well. Uh, Maybe if you're like a wizard, though, and you have to go back to the muggle world and just live with your dentist parents, and they're just like, Hermione, you're so great. And she's like, she's probably just dying to get back there the whole time. Like, It seems like it, because her, Hermione spends next to no time whatsoever with her family. I know. Yeah, she's <laughs> like, I got to get out of here. Yeah, it's like, it's like year one holiday, she goes home, and then I feel like every other occasion after that, she's pretty much like, yeah, no, I'm going to go and stay with the Weasleys. Yeah, that's pretty much it. That's I'm going to stay in school this year. Yes. All right, so um, there's uh, so there's fun trivia on the next page here, where well, there's a couple of things that happen. One, they all go to play like Quidditch and stuff, and I think they like ask Percy to come with them. That yeah, they'd ask Percy if he wanted to join them, but he said he was busy, which is like a little bit, little bit more of that like, what could you be busy with, dude? Yeah. But it is interesting that they ask Percy because it means like at some point there must have been a point in their childhood where like Fred and George and Bill and Charlie and and like Percy would go play Quidditch together. Yeah. You know, yeah, like yep. he could go play Quidditch. Like they don't think he couldn't do it. Right. You right. know, which is kind of like you never imagine Percy being athletic in any capacity at all, but he must be enough to the point where they included him. Right. Right. Which right. So it's like, interesting. What, it's hard to imagine Percy on a broom. It is it's extremely hard to imagine it, though. Although in the same note, they do ask Percy who does not join them, but they don't ask Ginny. What's which up with is, that? I yeah. know, which is like such a bummer because she's like actually turns out to be amazing at it. So I know. I, know. I think that's funny. That is funny. Um, but so then there's this other line about how, you know, everyone loves Harry's Nimbus 2000, which is easily the best broom. But then Ron's old shooting star was often outstripped by passing butterflies. And I'm always like, which one? Sometimes I'll think about like when we're like up at the lake, um, like uh, or in our little like Vermont cabin. Yes. There has been times where we've been like, you know, zipping along on the boat and I'll have noticed there's like a butterfly keeping pace with the boat and I'll be like, <laughs> what is happening here? It's like how fast are butterflies? <laughs> <laughs> what would have been even funnier is if you were like in that moment looking at the butterfly following the boat and being like, man, Ron's broom is so fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think what's happening in that case is that the butterfly is getting in some sort of slipstream and that's how it's keeping up with the boat because I do not think they are that fast. I know. Um, yeah. What is the average wind speed velocity? Wind of speed a of a. So I learned this about butterflies. The way they fly is with the, both up and down of their wings. Okay. It's like when they flap down, that is how they go up. And then when they're like, when they close at the top, they like touch and that's what propels them forward. So they like press down to go up and then flap back to go forward. Oh, that's amazing. I know. I was Gosh. like, boy, that was a really fun fact I learned over the weekend. Man. Any, anyway, I'll only bring this up. The point is that Ron shooting star, the point is that butterflies are slow and Ron shooting star is even slower than a butterfly. I, yeah, like based on Harry's own assessment here, my question is like, is this hyperbole like or is it actually that? Slow? No, I think it is. Okay, because so I looked this up. Um, so in in Quidditch through the ages, we learn that um, the shooting star brooms were started being produced in 1955 by Universal Brooms Limited, um, which even even when they came out, like even a brand new shooting star, if you got it, was considered like cheap and sort of poor, poor quality. And they were known for losing speed over the years. OK, so like the longer you have it, the slower it will go. Um, so and that said, the bit the company goes out of business in 1978. So Ron's broom at this point is minimum 14 years old, uh, if not like 26 years old. <laughs> so it's like it was it was not good to begin with, right? <laughs> and then continued to be like worse, worse, right? Yeah. yeah. So even brand new, not great. And now he has a really old crummy broom so it actually uh, makes sense that 
uh, his he's passed by butterflies. Although at this point, it just seems like he's if you're passed by butterflies, you're just sort of sitting on like a floating stick. I know. You know? Yeah, I know. It's like it seems it seems so slow. The other thing, I mean, what's kind of hilarious about this, though, because we know that Charlie Weasley was exceptionally good at Quidditch. Yeah. What it almost reminds me of, and this is going to seem like such a such like a, a geeky or nerdy uh, comparison to such a such a jock driven sport. Yeah. But I do remember having a computer game when we were kids called Tiberian Sun. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yes. It was so much fun. Command and Conquer Tiberian Sun. Exactly. Um, and I remember we had this like really old computer. And we it did. Was so painstakingly slow. And so the end result was that like you were really bad at the game because everything took forever to lose. Yes. Load. And it was like one of these things where it was like, I basically never won a game ever. And then I remember going over to one of your friend's houses and I think you guys were playing out on the trampoline and they had like a brand new computer and I sat down to play it and I was like, I am like a god in this game right, right. now because everything loads as fast as it's supposed to. So it's like, I am unbeatable. I do remember this exact phenomenon happening to myself where like, yeah, I mean, if you don't know, it was like a real-time strategy game where, you know, you'd have to, like, build a base and you could build units and you'd go attack another base. And it was like, I mean, it was so... I would play it today. Oh, I absolutely Like, would, I've yes. played other real-time strategy games. Not as fun. Like, nothing has ever lived up to... Tiberian Sun. To Tiberian Sun in my mind. And I, I've even looked in in our... In the present, in 20... Like, 24, like, for ways to play. Like, is it on Steam? Can I do it? It's like, no. For whatever reason, they haven't, they haven't you know brought it up the line yes to play yet but Man. some someday i will relive the glory that is tiberian sun but i remember yeah sitting there like you know I, I think if you wanted to make like infantry in that game i remember on a fast computer you could make them about as fast as you could click yes you know it was like click and they're ready and uh, on our computer it was like the, it would they were still the fastest thing you could make but it would take like 30 seconds for one to be like trained or whatever yes and let me tell you, that's way slower. Like way, way, way slower. Games could take like four hours. Yeah, no, it was know. it was it was crazy. So the really the the big thing that, that stands out to me that would be like if Charlie was was training on these brooms. Yeah. And like potentially even if he like had the school broom, which was just like a little bit faster. Right. It's like all of a sudden it's like, wow. Right. Like, like took the ankle weights off, didn't we? Yes, yeah. Yes. Because I mean it seems like all the Weasleys are so good. That's you know, true. That's true. Maybe so, this is like their secret strategy. Yes. It's yes. like Goku training with the weighted clothing. That's it. Yes. Precisely. Exactly. Man. And in high gravity. Raise your hand if you followed every reference we just made just now. Absolutely, you did. I'm sure you did. I know. People people are they, it's like they, they come for the, <laughs> the Harry Potter deep dive the, and then they stay for the Tiberian Sun. They stay for the <laughs> Tiberian Sun Dragon Ball Z comparisons. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Okay, but Ben, one of my favorite theories ever spawns from the next paragraph here um which where they're trying to wonder like what percy's doing in his room all summer uh, and fred says wish i knew what he was up to he's not himself his exam results came back the day before yours did 12 owls and he hardly gloated at all 12 owls ben do you know what's crazy about that is that hermione doesn't even get 12 hermione OWLs. doesn't get 12 she gets 10 i believe right because she drops two classes uh and she gets obviously an ow on every class she's taking but uh before that she was taking all 12 classes yeah. which means and and the only way she was able to do it was by the use of a time turner yes meaning that percy is also taking all 12 classes and gets an i guess a, a passing grade in all 12 which means percy almost definitely also had to be using a time turner yes yeah yes. no i mean there's there's no two ways about it and then bill as well because bill got 12 too bill got 12 too and honestly it's sort of like it almost makes more i almost like this better because it makes more sense that hermione is given one it's as if like yes frequently this is a solution to the problem right like right. we have it, to like do some we have to fill some paperwork out and we have to like make exceptions but like yes students are there are just good students a lot Yes. Yeah, exactly. Like, and, and I think that you're exactly right. Like it does, it sets the baseline for like Hermione getting one to a, to a point that is like much more, like it makes much more sense because I think the three people that we know get 12 OWLs are, um, Percy, Bill and Barty Crouch Jr. Yeah. Barty Crouch Jr. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which means he had one too. Oh my gosh. Which I mean, whew. it's not surprising that Barty Crouch Jr. gets one either. Cause I mean, 
he's so good. Like I, it is such a tr- it is such a bummer to me that you don't get to see him in action outside of being Mad Eye Moody. I know because like he, I mean that guy was so dangerous. I know, ah. I know. Yeah, if, if if you could imagine just like 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 uh, year five where there's Bellatrix and Barty Crouch Jr. It's like yeah. Voldemort's basically unstoppable. Right. Like what is okay? The other interesting thing about like Percy getting twelve OWLs is that it means he gets an OWL in divination. I know. You know, like, like he's he successfully does it. So like, does Percy have any amount of like like good at predicting the futureness about him? Because like when Harry goes to do it, he has to like look in a crystal ball or something, and like you know either something happens or it doesn't. I, yeah, it feels like one of those classes that like defies traditional like <coughs> um, like studiousness. Yeah. So it's like he must have been able to like crack the code on Trelawney somehow. Right. Yeah. Because Trelawney would have been his professor, and like we sort of know she's like like she's a bit of a fraud. Well, it's hard to say. It's like her teaching is fraudulent, even though she herself is constantly making correct predictions and is a true seer. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So it's a good point. She, and yet. Percy gets an OWL. Yeah, he did. So it. Maybe it's a lot well. of outside studying. I don't know. Could be. Could be. But yeah, that's always that's pretty interesting to me. And uh, in my head, there's no doubt about it. Percy, a thousand percent, had a time turner. Uh, pro- maybe even still does. I don't know. You think so? Well, I don't oh, know. Maybe uh, like for classes. Past. Maybe for classes now, or would you maybe not? Maybe you like narrow in at this point and start dropping some classes. Yeah, because I mean, you take fewer classes at NEWT status anyway. That's true. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I could see being more Yeah, specific. so at this point, back down. Back down. But so he'd have been three years of time turnering. Probably. Amazing. At least. On the very uh, next page, there was another theory. Boy, this, this chapter was just full of them. Surprisingly, I don't remember like referencing this particular chapter a lot, but um, this is when Harry first gets introduced to flu powder. Yes. Yes, yep. because he's going to accidentally end up in Nocturne Alley here in a second. Um, and this, like, the way that flu powder works um, is this is one of my, like, just one of my favorite theories that we've ever come up with is. Uh, and our theory is that it is just made. The secret formula for flu powder is made with phoenix ashes. Yes. 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 Because, um, like as you know, uh, in Order of the Phoenix, I'm sure you remember. At one point, even though you cannot magically transport yourself in and out of Hogwarts to, by, via um, traditional like apparition, Dumbledore is still able to utilize Fox to like basically travel by fire yes. out of the castle. Yep. So like it is a way uh, so you know that phoenixes can travel by fire in like a teleportation fashion extremely similar to flu powder which is you know you use fire to travel from one place to another basically like by teleporting. Yep. It you can use flu powder inside of Hogwarts and obviously Fox also works inside of Hogwarts. So yep. like whatever limits are there are not there. But then there's like the person who created it, Ignatia Wildsmith. Smith, that sounds right. Ign- yep. Who I think I want to say had like this random second coming when Hogwarts Legacy came out because like the way you move around the map is with like the flu powder and stuff like that. Oh, okay. the gotcha, but gotcha, yeah. every time you like pass one of her little statues, she like says one of like two lines to you. And so people are like super annoyed with Ignatia. Okay. But okay. Anyway, besides the point, um, there's like this weird like Pottermore article about her where it's like they never answer the door. If you knock on the door and dying an alley that like that, like for whatever reason, they will not answer the door if you knock on it, which is just like a random inclusion. Why is that? But then also they're the only known producers of flu powder ever. And they claim that the price of flu powder will be two sickles no matter what forever. And like it will not change, which is like there's a bu- like why is all why are all of these things included? What what a bunch of random anomalies and stuff. But it's like our theory was that um, the reason they don't answer the door is because they don't want you to come in and see how they're making the flu powder. Right. And the reason Highly they have such a constant supply of it and have had such a constant supply of it for such a long time is because they're just harvesting phoenix ashes. And so they have a continuous never ending supply because the phoenixes are always just completely reborn. Right. So you would never like there is no like normally prices are dictated by supply and demand. Right. Um, and there is a 
like the supply for it is uh, is a, it's a static constant. Exactly. You have and I think the other thing that we that we added into this theory is that it also explains possibly where Ollivander is getting his phoenix feathers. Exactly. Wands. It does because he advertises that he uses unicorn tail hairs, dragon heart strings or phoenix feathers, but in the canon, at least during Harry's time, the only two phoenix feather wands we know of are Harry's and Voldemort's. Right. And if those are the only two he's made in the last 50 years, then like he can hardly advertise that he uses all three. Right. It's right, like right. I use two and I've I could do others, <laughs> but like and but to that end, we know exactly where those two fail, tail feathers came from because they're both from Fox. Exactly. So it's yeah. like if you're making them, you would need a constant supply. And like phoenixes are not easy to tame. No. Like at all. So like how are you getting such ready supply to Phoenix tail feathers outside of the two that were gifted to you 50 years ago? It's like, uh, maybe it's the guy selling flu powder three shops down that won't answer the door <laughs> because you just harvest the tail feathers. They burn. They collect the ashes. Fantastic. Boom. Boom. Bam. There you go. That's how flu powder works. Don't let anyone else tell you otherwise. No, I love it. I love it. It Boom. totally makes sense to me. Yep. Yep, I'm I'm all for it. Um, but anyway, then you get like another. An, an, in addition uh, to this, you kind of get like another like glimpse and kind of understanding into. Well, it, it's it's interesting because I think the economic system within the wizarding world is just so 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 very different. Yes. Um, where like the Weasleys are definitely regarded, you know, as like being stretched thin financially speaking. Yeah. But like they also don't seem to um, like food seems to be perfectly a plenty right you know so it's like there are certain demands financially on them um that i think like it's i I think it kind of gets like very wholesome into their nature which is that like they're just not status driven people right and, and therefore like like it could be like one of these things where it's like maybe like there's like the malfoys would would and we even see it in this very chapter, like take pity on the Weasleys for being so like, you know, poor or whatever, but it's like only poor in the way that you perceive. Right. Poor. Yeah, right. It's like, cause like, I mean, yeah, it's like, you're right. Food doesn't seem to be like a, a concern, which I think falls under like Gamp's law of transfiguration, fast forward to Deathly Hallows or whatever. Like if you right. have some, you can make more of it. So it's sort of like, yep. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Plus they have a garden. So whatever, you know, they're growing, they can just, you know, whatever, like, whatever they harvest, they can multiply. Right. If you can grow a endlessly. tomato, we can have all tomatoes, all tomatoes yeah. all the time. And you have to imagine like, they probably don't have like a mortgage or whatever, you know, it seems like True. wizards can just construct their houses, right? You yep. know, does I don't feel like they bought the burrow, <laughs> you know, they just built it. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. That's my understanding of it anyway. Um, but yeah, like wizard economics is so weird because you're right. Like so many of the things you would traditionally think of as like needing to spend money on, they can just do with magic. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep. Precisely. Yep. Um, but either which way you do still feel for them in this chapter a little bit because they are of course running low on the, uh, the flu powder and this sort of like already just coming on the heels of being like five sets of Lockhart books and Ginny needs robes and a wand and everything. It's like, Whew, okay, it's gonna be a big day. To me, it feels like Fred and George can probably share, and that like probably they're not gonna read them anyway. <laughs> that was exactly yeah. my thought. Too. I was like, <laughs> Fred and George are gonna see through Lockhart in no time flat, right? You know, because I think that's it. Probably, it's like I keep saying this, and it's kind of blowing my mind a little bit. But like, I feel like Fred and George as characters stand out to me in such a huge way in this like very. Uh, careful dissection that we're doing here on the podcast. Yeah. Where it's just like, I'm like sort of just so like on board and supportive of everything that they do. Yeah. Um, but like it, to me, it's the type of thing like where Fred and George will care as much in class as is needed to help them accomplish their own goals. Yeah. But, but like, which might sound sort of like, like, well, that's not going to make the world's greatest student, but it also, I feel like would, would make it very clear to me that that like, that's why they would see through Lockhart so quickly. It's like, there's nothing we can get from you. Right. You exactly. don't have anything to offer us. Showmanship, Ben. Yes. Yeah. It's showmanship. Like, yeah, yeah. But they also have like they have their own flair for showmanship. So they that's also true. like they see it for what it is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's true. I wonder if there is something that like they take away from Lockhart, like in that capacity. It's like, like, are you like actually like, you know, it's like when it's, it, it's the example. I think I brought it up last week where. You know, Hermione. They're they're doing their demonstration with the skiving snack boxes, and you know, Hermione is like, "Oh, that's not useful." And Ron's like, 
they've made 26 galleons already you know right, it's like right, right. i mean it's useful sort of right. <laughs> you know the they're not flowing. accomplishing anything but they are getting money and it's like that's a lot of what lockhart's doing i mean they are definitely more talented wizards than lockhart by oh, absolutely, leaps yeah. and bounds but like there is certainly something to like the hey a good showman can make money as much as anyone else. You right, know. right. You know, there's, there's some value here. Plus, to your earlier point from that from that chapter art with like his clashing attire, I'm pretty sure that when we hear about the outfits that Fred and George are wearing mm-hmm. when when they go in to Weasley, Weasley's Wizard Weasley's, yeah. I'm pretty sure they're clashing. Oh, okay. They're, they're like like kind of like like so over the top in like a completely different way. Right. But <laughs> either way. So. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, so then Harry has to go do the flu powder for the first time. And I feel like they do not give him enough instructions. I feel like they're just like, there's so many fireplaces to choose from. And it's like, wait, what? What do you mean? I could, huh? I know, I know. No, yeah. I was trying to think of what a good example for something like this would be in everyday life. And I, the only thing I could think of is sort of like the way that each individual person has their own like computer set up and like yeah. where, like which direction the mouse wheel scrolls. Oh, or yeah. Or like the speed of the cursor or, um, like the way that like folders are aligned or if you have like all of your icons hidden or something like that. Like, you know, it's one of those things where you're so used to the way that like you interact with something that you, that you have such your, like your own personal imprint Mm -hmm. like laid upon. But then like, if you try and go and use somebody else's computer, it's like, you know how to use computer perfectly well. You do it every single day. If you go and try and use someone else's with the upside down scroll wheel, it's like, what am I even doing? over here? You know, like I am so lost. So it's like, I can't, I, I can't even think of the types of things I would try to instruct somebody if they were attempting to like use all of my, Right. Weird little quirks and configurations. Yeah. So maybe that's like this where it's like, it's like, it's not that hard. Just go and like point the cursor at the thing and click. And yeah, it's like, you got it. Yeah, but it goes the wrong way. Right. I clicked on something. What? Uh, yeah, yeah, but there's like a thousand things you clicked on. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. I guess that's true. It could be something like that. Um. Anyway, Harry goes in there and he doesn't speak clearly enough. He gets like one great over and ends up in Borgen and Burks in Nocturne Alley, which is sort of like interesting to me that if you, if he just, if you were trying to go to Nocturne Alley and you said Nocturne Alley, would you show up in the shop? That's a good question too. Yeah, th- this is like kind of like one of those where like the movie does like the whole like diagonally, yeah, you know, thing, um, which I feel like was mostly just for people who hadn't realized yet that Diagon Alley is diagonally. Yes, um, diagonally, and yeah. Nocturne Alley is nocturnally. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, there, it's wordplay, people. Got it. Um, <laughs> it's so fun. Um, but the, to me, I think what's happening is that he. I think they even explain like he must have like mispronounced it or uh, mispronounced it like because he coughed because the hot ash in his mouth or whatever. Yeah. But I think what's really happening here is just simply that like you're supposed to like look for the right fireplace and then like he misses it by like one. Yeah. Um. But I, I would be curious to know like even in Diagon Alley if there's just like a like a like a fireplace that just like is open to like the center. Oh, of to the like market. the center of the street. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it, it also seems like if you were to like arrive there at the same time as somebody else, like would you just like fall on top of them? I know. Something? Right. Like I'm also kind of surprised that like, you know, because he does show up just in the middle of the shop, like just appears out of their fireplace, like that. It's not like that. No one notices that like, like is it Mr. Borgen who's there. The, uh, he doesn't like notice Harry, like arrive in the fireplace. Oh, true. You know, he just sort of like pops into the shop. Right. Sort of like, yeah, okay, whatever. Um, But in any case, Harry shows up in Borgen and Burks in Nocturne Alley, um, where just, I mean, this is such a fun little bit here where the Malfoys come in and he's hiding from them. Uh, there's evil looking masks staring down from the walls, which are almost certainly like the Death Eater masks, I right? Wrote, I wrote the exact same thing. I was like, I had not caught this in the past. Me neither. Like, are they Death Eater masks? I mean, probably. Probably. Based on the rest of the stuff in here. Well, I mean, there's so much stuff. I mean, you got the hand on the withered, uh, the a withered hand on a cushion, which is uh, the hand of glory, which yep. we know Malfoy eventually does end up getting. Yep. Um, there's the, the evil looking masks. And then we also, of course, have the cabinet that Harry crawls into. That oh, my God. I know. Like one of the vanishing cabinets and the opal necklace that says it's like claimed the lives of like 15 yeah, ex- muggles. Right, right, right. So there's that. Um, 19 which, muggles. Yes, which so the um, the opal necklace shows up again in book six when um, 
Malfoy's trying to kill Dumbledore. This is one of the he buys this necklace that we read about in this chapter. Yes. And it's the one that Katie Bell touches with just like a little like bit of her finger and she like floats up in the air and is almost killed herself. Right. And then yeah, the uh the the vanishing cabinet. Um, it's almost somewhere, there's like a light and it says Harry looked quickly around and spotted a large black cabinet to his left. He shot inside it and pulled the doors closed, leaving a small crack to peer through, which is like kind of funny because like if he'd shut the cabinet the whole way, would he have ended up at Hogwarts? Oh, that would have been know? so weird. Because at this point, Peeves hasn't broken the other one. Yeah, true. right. Yeah. So like, I guess we don't know if there's like an attached like incantation <clears throat> or or any type of like like intention needed yeah but that's a good good point like yeah. it, like is it possible that if he doesn't leave that crack that harry ends up yeah just at hogwarts at like hogwarts. what just yeah. happened that would have been so wild that would have that would have been pretty wild because that is the same cabinet that they eventually used to break in um and then yeah draco buys the necklace he buys the hand of glory at some point even um this is sort of interesting there's Dr- the lucius is there selling poisons from his house uh, to Mr. Borgen, like that's what he's there to do. Oh, you're right. right. Yeah. And Draco, uh, like I'm wondering, like does Draco buy the poisons back to put in the mead to that he tries to sell Dumbledore? Wow, the ones that ends up yeah. poisoning Ron. Right. Whoa. I right. Bet so yes. I know. Yeah. So it's like I feel like Draco is like given the task to kill Dumbledore, and he's like, okay. Um, I'm going to Borgen and Burks. I'm going to see what kind of tools I can get here. And he like buys the necklace, buys the poison, buys the hand. Like, I know, you know, like number one new customer. I know, number one. And then uses the cabinet in the shop. It's all like, book six stuff. Too. It's all books. And I guess he could have even identified the cabinet because it's in book five that Montague gets stuck in the cabinet. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's all book six stuff like Malfoy, like just spots a bunch of stuff on this particular visit that yeah. he eventually comes back and gets all of it and like uses a bunch of it to try and kill Dumbledore pretty unsuccessfully. Um, except I guess it gets the Death Eaters in with the with the cabinet, so there's that. Yes, but yes, indeed. Yeah, so I, that was just a it's such a fun chapter in that regard. Yeah, no, it's it's super super well. I I know yeah. I kept highlighting stuff, and I was like, oh, this shows up later. This shows up later. Yeah. Um, super super interesting. I love the thing about the poison though. That's that's a that's a good catch. Right. Um. So then the the next thing we get to see though is sort of the relationship between Draco and uh, Lucius. And Lucius we're meeting for the very first time. Ever. Yes, we are. Um. The the thing that I found to be kind of interesting about this is that forever and ever, I've always sort of said that, like, I feel like Draco uh, is almost just the exact, like, equivalent of Dudley in the wizarding world. Like, he's just been grown up, like, being told he's, like, the most special thing ever. And, right. Like, blah, blah, blah. And, and I feel like this chapter, at the very least, kind of gives you, like, a slightly different perspective. Like, I feel like Lucius is harder on Draco in a way that the Dursleys are never hard on Dudley. Yeah. Like there's a bit more expectation being set. There's a bit more like protocol and manners and that type of thing. Right. Sort of being like not not from a good place from Lucius's perspective. No. I'm not giving him a father of the year award. Certainly not. Um, but he does he does have a bit more intensity than we ever see from the Dursleys towards Dudley. Right. Um, so then it's interesting though that while they're why they are there, uh, Malfoy says that as you've heard, the ministry is conducting more raids, said Mr. Malfoy. And he's like, I have a few uh, items at home that might embarrass me if the ministry were to call. And he's there selling poisons, but it's like Mr. Weasley was doing raids, presumably for muggle artifacts. So it's like, does does Miss does Lucius have like a bunch of like misused muggle items at his house? That's that they would be, you too. know, like yeah. that they'd be raiding for. Unless the entire ministry is performing raids in each of their respective departments. Well, I suppose that's true. Which always seems possible. But he also does name Arthur Weasley uh, in this exact exchange. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so yeah. It, it does seem seem possible. Um, I suppose, yeah, like, and, and specifically says, there are rumors about a new Muggle Protection Act. No doubt that flea-bitten, muggle-loving fool, Arthur Weasley, such a mean, mean person. <laughs> Talking oh. about my boy, Arthur. Like oh, man. Um, uh, let's see. It's also, I think, later on, maybe we'll come up with this later, when they talk about the raid, yeah, when when they use the Apologies Potion later in the book, they'll learn, like, Draco tells them that those, like, they don't know about, like, the the secret basement or whatever or something. Yes. Which yeah, I yeah. think is later what they use as like the 
prison or as like the dungeon for like Ollivander and Luna and Dean Thomas and stuff in Deathly Hallows. Yes, yes, right, yes, yes. Yeah. Which which seems like its own sort of like magical stronghold, kind of like Hogwarts. Like you right. can apparate in and out of it. Exactly. All sorts of stuff. Unless yeah. you're a house elf. Unless you're a house elf. Right. But of course, sir. I'm an elf. <laughs> I'm an elf. <laughs> That's one of my favorite moments. That's right. Let's see. Um, I think there is uh, speaking of like Malfoy's like expectations. There's like, you know, he's yelling at Mr. Borgen for like trying to say like my son will amount to more than a thief. And it says like, though, if his grades don't pick up and Malfoy tries to like bl- blame Hermione and like Lucius sort of calls him out on it. And he's like, uh, no, it's not her fault. It's your fault. Yes, yes, I know. <laughs> like, that, that's a thing where it's like, like, and it's interesting to me as well, because I mean, this is again, I mean, if you compare it to Dudley, <laughs> like it seems like the Dursleys can't see Dudley's faults. Right. Um, and so on some level, this could be like the opposite end of the spectrum where it's like, you know, sometimes people who grow up with parents who are too demanding, it can cause its own, you know, sort of like like struggles and stuff. Yeah. But the thing that kind of surprises me is that like the more we get to know Draco as a student, he seems to be a pretty high achieving student. Right. Like, like he gets like uh, an outstanding in potions at the very least, and he's able to take you know, the NEWT level eventually he's able to learn uh, legitimacy yeah. uh, where, or occlumency, I guess. Um, yeah. In some ways he sort of like does have a point. He's like, it's not my fault that, you know, it's like, it's not my fault. You know, Hermione Granger so good at school or whatever. And it's like, he's not entirely wrong. It's like, for all we know, Draco is like second in the class. Oh, sure. You sure, know, sure. it's just like, if not for freaking Hermione Granger coming in, being like the smartest witch of 10 generations here. I would be doing just fine, Dad. Right, you know? right, right. Yeah, like that would even be interesting if that's the interpretation of this scene. Because, like, if like, especially if if Drake was getting like straight A's, right? But he's not the top student, <laughs> right? Like that would be such a situation where like Drake would have absolutely a point because he does even classify it as favorites. Like you know. It's not like that he had the bad grades. It's just like the teachers have their favorites, you know, ah, yes, it's like, yes, oh, yes. yeah, I got the same grades. They just like her more or something. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's so frustrated. Oh, man, I love the headcanon that Draco was like second in the class. I know that's sort of <laughs> that's kind of interesting. It's pretty yeah. cool because um, like I think no matter what, Harry can still oust him at Defense Against the Dark Arts yeah. because Harry also Al's Hermione at the yeah. Skin Stark Arts. So maybe not in that particular subject, but um, it also means, though, that it's not just Harry who is outshining Malfoy by being like one of the most popular kids at school and like the Quidditch star. Yeah. It, Hermione is also outshining him by being the most academically like gifted. Yeah. So it could also feed into like why Draco hates her so much because it's like that it's could not be. just being muggle born like yeah. from his perspective. It's like you are making me look bad. Yeah. Like, because I would be killing it if not for you. Uh, yeah. um, yes. So that's an interesting thought. Um, so there's another interesting line here from Malfoy where there he says I'm in something of a hurry book and I have important business elsewhere today. So I just highlighted that one because it's like is that a reference to the diary? Is that what he's talking about? Do you think? Like I have important business elsewhere. Like okay, I have a lot of thoughts on this because okay. I highlighted it too. Yeah, and so I, I do. Yes, I think I think he does. The important business that he is talking about, I think, is the planting of the diary. Right. The big question is whether or not he is specifically targeting <coughs> the Weasleys. Yes. Because or if, if he was maybe trying to target Harry. Or if he's trying to target Harry. But the big thing would be that they make their plans to go to uh, Diagon Alley on this specific day based on the letter from Hermione, from Hermione yes. which says we're going to go to London next Wednesday to buy my new books. So this makes me wonder whether or not like, like Dobby was able to overcome like his programming to go and warn Harry, but he probably can't overcome the direct order to spy on when the Weasleys would be there. Oh, well, this is pretty... I mean... That could be. That's pretty interesting. And also, we know that Dobby was intercepting letters. We also know that Dobby was intercepting letters. So the letters to Harry. So who does the letter go to from her? I think it goes to Ron because she's asking like, "How is Harry?" Yes. Right. So could could Dobby have just been inter like? Oh yeah. Like could Dobby have intercepted the letter and gotten the information and like been forced to give it to Lucius? Yeah, I think so. Oh man. So I think, I think the fact that the Malfoys are here on the same day is no mistake. No mistake. Yeah. Mm, Cause they're even sort of arriving at, we sort of, this is them arriving in, in town, in town. And yeah. it's at the same time, same time. Uh, even the timing is pretty. So the only other thing that could 
possibly um, facilitate the timing is is the Lockhart book signing. Like it could be well known information that Lockhart will be there. Yes. And so he could like maybe like guess this is when lots of people will be there, or like make this is like my best odds for. Hogwarts students to be here because this famous author will be at Flourish and Blotts, but it seems more likely that um, yeah, there was some foul play. I think foul play. Yeah. Yeah. It fits with Lucius too. Fits, fits him a little bit more than to have been tracking the um, <laughs> Lockhart. <laughs> yes, 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 yeah. indeed. Um, then uh, basically we have sort of like Lucius' uh, departure from the store where he basically is like kind of using his his power to force uh, Mr. Morgan's hands and uh, I, I do I do like this particular line because basically he's been referring to him as like Master Malfoy the the whole time um, and upon Lucius leaving the store Morgan says good day to you, good day yourself Mr. Malfoy as if the stories are true you haven't sold me <laughs> and if half the stories are, are well I'm butchering it I'm sorry <laughs> Good day yourself, Mr. Malfoy. And if the stories are true, you haven't told me half of what's hidden in your manor. Mm -hmm. The the use of Mr. Um, like as sort of like because it's even italicized in in our copy of the book. It's right, like, it is. It's like it's like he's absolutely emphasizing like uh, when you're here, you're master. When you leave, Mister. Well, like, does it say? I mean, it's looking at the other places. He says like Mr. Malfoy. What a pleasure to see you again. Oh, okay. Maybe. May, I think he refers to. Um, He's uh, at Draco as Draco, young, master young Master Malfoy. Malfoy. Yeah. yeah, that's it. It that's is it. it is different in which that it is spelled out the word Mister versus the other times when he's talking. It's the abbreviation M R. So I'm not sure why there'd be like a difference, or if that's like a could that be like a British thing where Mister means Master or something? I don't know. Or yeah, like it, there is a slightly different spelling. Or you were listening to the audio. Does he say Master? No, he says no. Miss, or he, uh, on the. Uh, oh, that's like a good, good. That's a good question. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know, but either way, he's definitely as soon as as soon as Malfoy is out of sight, he's like shifting tones. Yes, 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 yeah. yes, absolutely. But the the thing, I mean, the thing that I always find interesting about that is like Borgen is like not a good dude himself. Yeah. But like it's it's sort of like the enemy of my, my, the enemy of my enemy is my friend situation. Yeah. It's like. You know, it's like sort of like a good little moment there. Yeah. It's like, yes. Ah. Right. Totally. Um, so Harry gets out of the shop and then uh, I think there's like a little interesting thing here where it says the one he just left Morgan and Berths look like the largest but opposite was a nasty window display of shrunken heads and two doors down a large cage was alive with gigantic black spiders, which is like we know that gigantic black spiders are going to be a big part of this book later on. So it's like, are those, is this shop selling acromantulas? I know. Do you yeah. think like, is that possible? Which then makes me think back to like the actual first opening of the chamber of secrets where like, you know that Tom Riddle frames Hagrid for, um, you know, having an acromantula at the school. Yeah. And we know that Tom, I don't know what, what, no, I guess Tom Riddle graduates and goes to work for Borgen and Burke. So it's not like, he was working there. It was like, oh, maybe this is where he bought the acromantula from to give to Hagrid or something. Oh, because isn't it the case that like he supposedly came like the pocket of a traveler? Oh, something like that. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're yeah, right. Because I think like, a lot of people theorize that like Newt was the one who brought the acromantula. Acromantula. Back. Okay, so there could be that. There could be that. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. I was trying to get into a zone where this is where Tom bought an acromantula to give to Hagrid to frame him or whatever. That would be pretty wild. But that on that wild. same note, uh, Hagrid shows up like one second later, and he's like flesh and slug repellent or whatever, and it's like, or maybe you were there looking at spiders. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Indeed. <clears throat> it, it is like one of those things too. Yeah. Where I'm like. Like I understand that like uh, that Nocturne Alley is sort of like a dodgy place overall, but it feels like other places would sell flesh eating slug repellent. It does. You know, I feel like this is maybe one of those things where it's like because Hagrid is going to be like framed later on as the one opening the chamber. It's like oh, Andy was a Nocturne Alley earlier. Uh, oh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sort of like a little bit of a misdirect. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah. I mean, this is like one of those where like I can never go back and re like I don't have the ability to go back and read it for the first time. So I just know that Hagrid is completely innocent. Right. So I can't like there's no part of me that can even like read that sentence and think like nefarious lot thoughts. Yeah. But you're right. Like that. that's probably like the original setup is like, oh, right. Why was he there? That's right. Yeah. I was looking for 
flesh-eating slug repellent, growled Hagrid. They're ruining the school cabbages. Which, to me, it's like, does Hogwarts grow its own food? Like, I don't know. You think, I've never, do you think they grow their own food? They must. They have school cabbages. They must. They must. Yeah, must yeah. be. Um, but it's also like, why do you have to grow that much food if you can just replicate it all the time, right? These are the questions. Also, what, how much cabbages do they think they need? <laughs> Seriously. Who <laughs> even likes cabbage? What kind of, what kind of high schoolers are just like, oh man, they're no, they're out of cabbage? Bummer. Darn it. Because <laughs> I have to eat these drumsticks and delicious desserts I instead. Know, I know. Who is opting for the cabbage? The cabbage. Anyway, um, uh, moving on. Hagrid does ask, uh, how come you never wrote back to me? And Harry explains about like Dobby. And then you get uh, a line interrupted by Hagrid. He says, lousy muggles. If I'd have known. And then Hermione interrupts and says, Harry, Harry, over here. Yeah. Um, it's like, I want to know what Hagrid would have done if he had known. Like, shown up on Sirius's motorbike, shown up and knocked down the door again, yeah. like brought in Dumbledore. I also like, think Hagrid just completely glosses over Dobby. It's like Harry explained all about Dobby and the Dursleys, and he's like, dumb muggles. It's like, well, what about that house elf, though? I know, yeah. yeah. Like, Aren't was, you concerned about that at all? That was interesting, wasn't it? Right. Just now? It's not that was unusual. To, there's yes. No, there's not supposed to be a house elf at Privet Drive. Yeah. 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 Nope, never mind. Does anyway, it, Hermione shows up, saves Hagrid, saved by the bell. As usual. Gosh, mm -hmm. she actually plays Belle. Oh, Emma, you're Emma right. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. What a good joke. <laughs> oh, man. Totally didn't mean to do that, but whatever. Um, let's see. Oh, just a tiny little like um, thing they do here where in uh, the movies when Harry shows up at Diagon Alley, Hermione immediately fixes his glasses as sort of like a throwback to the first movie where she does it on the train. Yep. That does not happen in the book. It is instead Mr. Weasley who does it and uh, returns them. Good as new. Yes. So there's yep. that. Just a little quick correction there. Movies. Yes, indeed. Which because mm -hmm. it is always, again, one of those things where it's like you're not supposed to be able to do magic outside of school. Exactly. And there's Hermione just doing it in wizard public. Right. Right, 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 exactly. Especially mm -hmm. Hermione, who is like, you know, she's like, she's like yeah, Miss Rule follower. Right, for the most right? part. Although, all, exact, this is also one of those things where it feels like if anywhere you could just get away with doing magic, like this would be it. It definitely feels yeah. like everybody would be so excited to go to like to go shopping, back yeah. to school shopping. It's like I, I'm just, I need to perform some magic. I need to perform, but it's like it, like the trace here would be worthless. Yeah, there's no every. It's all wizards everywhere. All you the know? time, yeah. yeah. Magic happening in every corner. Yeah, so yeah, the, even if they notice you doing it, doesn't matter. Exactly. They can't prove it's you. Right, 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 right. Yep, 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 yep. Um, so then we go down to Gringotts where you get like just the, the really devastating, mm -hmm. um, you know, like a uh, small pile of sickles uh, and just one gold galleon for the Weasleys, which like based on the typical conversion rates, which w I've gone back before and like kind of like reconfigured myself based on like the, the like value of gold. Um, but I think approximately the entire like family wealth at least that's being stored in the vault is approximately like twenty five dollars. Wow. You know, it's like it's 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 just it's like in a like for the amount of stuff that they're supposedly buying on mm -hmm. this day and as much as we know, like I think Harry's wand costs seven galleons. Right. Yeah. Ginny needs a wand. Ginny needs like, a wand. You know, so it's like it's like hopefully they just have like they just keep more of them. Hopefully money. there's just more on hand that yeah. you just don't know about. Yeah. Uh, but then I also, yeah, it's like, I think you already said or said this earlier. It's like, you know, it's like they don't have a lot of like gold money, but they are certainly like rich where it counts. Exactly. Versus like, you know, they're the exact opposite of, you know, the Malfoys very on purpose um, where they have tons of money, but are terrible people. Exactly. So. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, then you have Harry who has a lot of money and is a great person. So yay. Yay. <laughs> Um, let's see. Then there's Percy being shady again, so muttering vaguely about needing a new quill. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, okay, whatever. Just going to skulk off there so we can suspect you of opening the chamber later. No big deal. Um, then let's see. They go down to uh, Harry wants to go spend some money, so he buys three large strawberry and peanut butter ice creams, which I just highlighted because um, one, if you actually go to Universal and you go to uh, the Harry Potter land section of the park, you can go to Florian Fortescue's, and that is the order you should get. It is such good ice cream. Ugh. Like, do get this order. That's what you want at the shop. That's all. 
Okay. Moving no, on. I, I think it's I, no. I think it's a it's a great thing to to dial in on because strawberry and peanut butter ice cream. It's I I know we've had this trivia question before, and I was just like guffawed yeah. to discover what the answer to it was. And it's like <clears throat> it is such an unusual flavor of ice cream. I know. Like, it doesn't seem like it should be because it's just PB and J. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> But like I don't even think in in England. I mean, we had our, our buddy Seamus come once upon a time. He had never had a peanut butter and jelly before. Not so. only had he never had it, he had like the the very thought of it seemed like gross to him. He thought that it was. He thought that our jelly was like Jello, gela- like gelatin. Yes. Jello. Yeah. Not like not like like spreadable. Not like spreadable. Yes. Like what you would think of as like Welch's grape jelly or something. Yes, exactly. But like even when we made him the sandwich, he was like pretty hesitant to take a bite. Like this is about to be really weird, and it's like. Dude, Seamus, this has got to be the most common, the most common sandwich in America that five-year-olds eat at lunch every day. Every day, <laughs> like, yeah. And then how could you have never heard of it? But then he loved it. But then he loved it, yeah. yeah. So, was, so yeah. we got it. Shout out to Seamus. Go check out his uh, YouTube channel as well. He does lots of Pixar fun Disney stuff. Yes, indeed. Um, anyway, also they mentioned uh, Gamble and Jape's Wizarding Joke Shop. I just highlighted that. And I was like, I- I've read this book so many times. I could not have told you that was a place that existed. Nope. Yep, I was like, they talk about Zonkos all the time, and I'm always like, I, I couldn't have told you there was also a different joke shop at Diagon Alley. No, absolutely yeah. not. This this could have been given to me on like a multiple choice before, and it would be like, Gamble and Japes, and I'd be like, that's not a thing. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. So I underlined it as well, and I yep. was like, I should probably try to like store this away because it feels like the type of thing that like a year from now, we will be asked this question, and I won't know the answer to it. Yeah, so. right. Uh, then there we run into Percy again. Prefix who gained reading his book. Prefix who gained power. <laughs> yeah, it's like, very on the nose. Like the, the misdirection that is being like applied to Percy in particular in this chapter is being yeah. laid on thick. Yeah, like you are absolutely as the story unfolds, you would have every reason in the world to think that Percy is supposed to be suspicious. I know it is. It is so interesting to me how uh, how thick it is being laid on here because like I remember reading this as a kid. I remember like hearing as an adult that like Percy is supposed to be like a red herring and I was like what no why when how I never thought Percy was opening what what are you talking about <laughs> it's like it, I think like you you uh, well me as a reader dislikes Percy so much for the most part that yeah I, that I'm usually just sort of like it would never be him yeah like, <laughs> <laughs> I can't no. give him that much credit no exactly yeah. exactly it's like it's like Draco you can at least be like all right well now that guy he's going he's going for stuff right Percy is just like you know it just doesn't feel like the type so yep never never really had that that potential belief so i don't i don't think i was properly thrown yeah by percy which I, that could be like its own thing where it's like the most ineffective red herring of all time is is and we're i mean we're not even seeing the end of it at all like there's so much more where like percy shows up like in weird places throughout yeah. the rest of this book and it's just gonna be like nope right yep not it yep i think it's kind of funny too that like it actually is Ginny and like both Ginny and Percy are behaving unusual for Weasleys at the moment. And it is actually like both for the same reason. It's like Percy's acting weird. And we know the reason is because he's like going out with Penelope Clearwater and he's like embarrassed by it or whatever. And like Ginny's reason is because like they say like she won't, she usually never shuts up, but it's like she's being super quiet. And it's like, it's because she has a crush on Harry Uh and it's like, you know, they both are sort of acting differently for the same reason. Right. That's true. (laughs) That's true. So maybe maybe this is just how the Weasleys be (laughs) when enamored. Exactly. Exactly. Um, So then there's a, now we finally get to a Gilderoy Lockhart at Flourish and Blots and there's the sign it says this is a trivia question by the way is what hours he'll be there i hate when that trivia question comes up it's 12 30 to 4 30 remember <laughs> it right now yes. um it says he'll be signing a copies of his autobiography magical me and i just highlighted that. I was like it, it's funny to me that he has an autobiography called magical me because like aren't isn't isn't every single one of his books autobiographical supposedly supposedly to the public right so is magical me just a collection of like all of them you know, you think you'd have to cover all of the stuff you did in the other books. It does feel that right? way. Unless, unless in this book, he's just like, if you check out my my copy of Year with the Yeti. Year with the Yeti, exactly. Right. Uh, but like, that even that title alone suggests there was an entire year of his life spent with the Yeti, which feels like you would include that in your autobiography. Yes, you, it would seem like you would almost need to. It would have to. Yeah. Yeah, formative year. I know. I mean, he's not that old. <laughs> no, no, you know? like, yeah. a full year. <laughs> you got to include some mention yeah. of it. 
That's a good point. Yeah. Anyway, and more trivia on the next page is that uh, whatever, y- if you can keep track of what color robes Lockhart is wearing <sighs> throughout uh, the different events, um, that will answer you a lot of trivia questions. I can tell you. Yes. Uh, he's wearing Forget Me Not Blue. Yes. At Flourish and Blots. That exactly matched his eyes. Exactly yeah. matched his eyes. He has forget me not eyes. Maybe that's a good way to remember it, actually. Oh, that is, yeah. yeah. Forget me not eyes. Anyway, I they like match that. his eyes. Let's see. Uh, then, of course, he walks in. He spots Harry, pulls him into the camera. He says, together, you and I are worth the front page, which, of course, Harry just be worth the front page by himself, so he doesn't even need Lockhart. <laughs> I don't. That would have been so funny if Harry was like, please. <laughs> <laughs> I have the chosen one. <laughs> Please, <laughs> that that would have been hilarious. Yes. Oh man, if Harry just like leaned into it, it'd be great if like he took the exact wrong lesson and was just like, "Oh, this guy thinks he's famous. That's it. <laughs> no, I'm famous. Hold my potion. <laughs> Hold my potion. That's so good. Oh man, let's see. Uh, but so Lockhart gives him the books, which Harry just generously gives to the Weasleys or gives to Ginny anyway. And that's fantastic. Yeah, and what has got to be like the world's biggest cauldron. I know. Well, I think it's got to be like uh, part of me. I was wondering about the cauldron too, because like Ginny is like what eleven here, and this cauldron is loaded with books. Like, there's it, is is this some sort of like um like magical cauldron that like expand like a, as an expanding charm, like Hermione's bag or something? Yeah, it could be. Like could maybe be. I don't know. Yeah. Um, because yeah, it, it seems like it seems like um Harry is like weighed down by the sheer weight of all of these books yeah and and then there's there's jenny just just hanging on to oh him. i know well it's sort of like whatever i imagine when i remember as a kid thinking whenever they're making like potions and cauldrons like you see in the movie and they have these little like tabletop cauldrons which seems like it makes more sense but like to me as a kid like whenever i heard of a, a you know a witch in a cauldron it was a cauldron the size of you know that like sat on the floor and came up past your waist and was massive, you yes, know? Yes, 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 yes. A cauldron. A, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, you know what I mean? A cauldron. A cauldron, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Ginny's carrying this thing around. <laughs> massive. Yeah. Uh, obviously not. It's more of a small cauldron, which, you know, that's not as much fun if you ask me. I want yeah. big cauldrons. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but then we have Ginny's first line in front of Harry, this book, which is, uh, to Malfoy and it's sort of that like uh, that like glean of um, or gleam of Ginny's like fiery attitude where she says like leave him alone he didn't want all that and it's like oh that you're like standing up for Harry with your first words that's kind of fun it is pretty cool and, yeah. and it's neat too because like uh, otherwise Ginny's character it's like it's so hard to imagine her going from this like very shy person to being as like bold and and like you know, sort of center of attention as she eventually will end up yeah. being. And so you're exactly right. It's like you're starting to see like that glimmer of like, that's what's really hiding underneath that surface. There. Yeah. It's like a, a pretty strong person. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And then I love Malfoy's response as Potter, you've got yourself a girlfriend. It's like <laughs> in this book, especially it's like the idea of having a girlfriend is like so embarrassing to everyone. <laughs> it's like that's his, that's what he's insulting him with here is that like you have a girlfriend. I know. I, I even I was trying to like contextualize that in my head and like go into like a real world situation like wow ben you have a girlfriend it's like cool yeah like, <laughs> you like girls haha yeah, yeah it's like, basically i know yeah you're, you're right though yeah yeah it is kind of funny but then i also just highlighted and it's like well actually yes though eventually so yeah, he's, they he's, do date he's pretty dead on the you money. are you are on the money here uh, but then ron has this weird line where he just says but you're surprised to see harry here eh? a <laughs> he's like what why it, i was trying i was trying to unpack that too do you think that's from like like because Dobby came and tried to get Harry to not go. And right. They like, don't know that Dobby's there for like protective reasons. And so like they think it's a practical joke. And so right. it's like, like this is Ron like having settled in his brain that the re- I, that's what I thought too. Like this, this goes back to the conversation they had in the flying car where they're like, do you know anyone who would have who hates you and this would be like their idea of a practical joke and they're like Malfoy and it's like and Ron seems to have settled on that I guess yeah now like he's bringing it up as if this is like obvious information to Draco like oh we know what you did with Dobby uh, right, you know right. they don't even know that Dobby works for the Malfoys yet it's like we almost need a line from Draco where he's just like, like what what <laughs> like, excuse me why would I not think Harry what, uh, would be here but you're surprised to see Harry here huh yeah right, yeah yeah yeah, that that's the moment right there where it's like sometimes like <coughs> in in real life, I feel like you would have like more situation unfolding where the person would be like, 
I don't, I don't actually know what you mean. Can yeah, you wait. Can you Hold on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like, but in Ron's mind, it's like, we're on to you. We know you tried to get here and not to come back to Hogwarts. So I bet you're surprised to see him here. Ha <laughs> ha. Yes. Like <laughs> for Ron, this is a real gotcha moment. It is. And for Draco's like, okay. Draco says they, nothing. I guess you said that. Moving on. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but actually, he's he sort of responds as not as surprised as I am to see you in a shop, Weasley. Oh. So he's sort of. I guess maybe he does sort of be like. I am surprised to see, but not. It just sort of turns it into an insult about Ron being poor. Yeah. Um, as ever. Um, let's see. Moving on to the next page, though, we definitely get like uh, the another one of these moments where you know it's it's well not it's Arthur versus Lucius. Yes. Really, which even this is kind of like one of those things where it's like, um, is Lucius attempting to bait Mister Weasley? into this particular like fight specifically yeah. to to bring about the opportunity to plant the diary. Right. Like is he doing it on purpose here? Like we know we know at the very least. Well, cause based based on what he says to Borgen that he has other business. If we assume that he means planting the diary, then at the very least he means to plant it on someone that day. And I would say it's more likely that he knows the Weasleys and Harry and Hermione will be there. So he is trying to plant it on one of them. And it almost seems like he would be trying to plant it on Harry. Like, do you think his intended target is Ginny or just like, like, do you, do you, do you think he has to settle for Ginny or like, you know, I don't know. He, I don't think he's really targeting Harry. No. Okay. I don't think so. Cause I mean, like, because he's just trying to open the chamber of secrets, right? Like, right. Like we oftentimes contextualize for like our what if theories and stuff like that, that like the diary is planted to weaponize as a way for Voldemort to get to Harry from inside of the school where Harry is otherwise protected. Mm -hmm. but that's not really what Lucius is up to in real life. Like he's just trying to open the chamber of secrets. He doesn't even know. Oh, he doesn't even know. Like, yeah, like exactly what it'll do or that it's a Horcrux. Like he doesn't know hardly anything about the diary at all other than it has this one power. Right. So I think that he's it'll just trying it. to yeah. get it into school. And I, I think that he, he's probably trying to disgrace, disgrace Arthur. That's true. So Maybe he is targeting the Weasley family a little more because he does pick. I mean, he picks up Ginny's books. He picks up Ginny's books. And it's like, and he even says, here, girl, take your book. Um, so yeah, and like that's when he does it right there. Here, girl, take your book. It's the best your father can give you. So it's like that is when he does it. But like in the meantime, she has like dropped her cauldron and stuff. So it's like I guess he picks it up. She drops the cauldron. The books go everywhere and then he gives it back to her. And that is when we assume he gives her the diary. That's supposed to be as moment. well. Yeah. So it seems like you're right that because because he could have picked up anyone's books and he like specifically picks up the one Jenny's holding. He's like he must walk in decide she's the one. Let's go. Yes, yes, um, and I, I think that's exactly it. And I mean, it goes back to exactly even the same reason that he's in Nocturne Alley in the first place is because Arthur Weasley is supposedly in, injecting these new laws that are causing all these new raids, right. which is causing him. So, like, I, I, a lot of the diary planting doesn't have anything to do with the return of Lord Voldemort. Like, as far no, as like, I don't Lu think so. Lucius at this point in time is just trying to like live his best outside of his responsibilities as a death eater. So if anything, like when he appears to Voldemort, Voldemort has every reason to be like, Lucius, what the heck, man? I know. Like, Where you been? Where you been? You should have um, been looking for me. Also, how's that diary? What? <laughs> you definitely protected the diary, right? He's <laughs> uh, like, uh, uh, ooh, well. Turns out the Potter kid destroyed it. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine having to give him that news? <laughs> I'm pretty sure he would kill you. Uh, yeah, you know, but he must. He must not have. He must right? not have. Yeah, yeah. he must have figured yeah. it out. I mean, we have a whole video about how Lucius is just the worst Death Eater. He and by so when I say worst, I mean the least effective Death Eater. Yes, he, he has no competence rating <laughs> whatsoever. Yeah, like he gets nothing done. Yeah. Almost at all. Gets one of the Horcruxes destroyed. Of course, that's another one of those things where it's like, if Voldemort had trusted Lucius enough to tell him that it was a piece of his soul like certainly it would have just remained protected he wouldn't have been so cavalier about it but um of course he can't do that and that's to his own demise but that's it always comes out it's always a big circle like that it's always he's always setting himself up for failure it's true all yeah. the time and always um, um i do think it's almost surprising here that 
Mr. Weasley like physically attacks Lucius. Like it feels out of character. It does feel out of character. And that's, that's what I was saying too. It's like, I think, I think like we actually get a really good line from Arthur and I love it. And I love it in the movies as well. But like, I, I think that if you were watching this entire scene unfold from Lucius's perspective, Lucius, I think gets the better hand of this entire exchange because he's successful in his mission. I think that he is baiting Arthur in the first place, which he's successful at doing yeah and he basically does that by saying dear me what's the use of being disgraced the name of wizard if they don't even pay you well for it and um mr weasley comes back with the we have a very different idea of what disgraces the name of wizard malfoy and i love that response because i think like we would all agree with arthur in this particular occasion that yeah. like, the weasleys are a much better representation of what it means to be a wizard but i it's like i almost think that like lucius is like baiting him like he is intentionally trying to get him to to strike yeah and it works yep. um so yeah I, I do think overall in the end it's like you love to see like arthur stand up for himself you love to see him like be as quick-witted you know he's just as good of a wizard if not a lot better yeah um like in terms of like magical prowess and ability and stuff like that but yeah i i think that the the physical attack does feel I it guess be, it feels odd or out of place. It, it does. I suppose it's because the final thing that gets him is that he like he notices Mr. And Mrs. Granger who are just straight up muggles here in Diagon Alley. And what he says is the company you keep Weasley and I thought your family could sink no lower. So it's like that's the line that he crosses is like insulting the Grangers. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That I guess like that's that is to Mr. Weasley like worth fighting over. Yes, it's like which no, I suppose. Yeah. Yep. I mean, which is also sort of like the it feeds into the greater theme of the book because as far as Lucius is concerned, like yes, the diary will open the Chamber of Secrets, but then the goal of the Chamber of Secrets will be to purge the school of uh, Muggleborns. Of Muggleborns, yeah. So that that could be his real target here. Yeah. So I mean, when you look at it through that lens, you're exactly right. The overall themes this this one page. It, uh, it, has, it has like an imprint of the theme of the entire book. Right. Yeah. Like illustrated on it. Right. That's is that point. like um, it is? I mean, that, that's really what they're trying to, I think, is being set up is just like the the weird like wizarding racism between pure bloods and like non pure bloods. <laughs> yes. Which is just yeah. it's like it's so it's even so kind of like like just backwards in its own weird way, just because there's so few pure bloods altogether that like right. the like the amount of like limiting that this does on, on your ability to like, like, like expand or, or right. anything. It's like, it's like you, you, there are like in, as of the 1920s, there were the sacred 28, there are 28 families that fall right. under this category. And like the, which the Weasleys do, the Weasleys do. Yeah, <laughs> and they yeah. still don't like them. Right. Right. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. It's just like, it's like, it, it feels like it would be, it feels like the system would break itself down because surely anyone anywhere along the line would be like, no, I would like to just go and date somebody else because I like them. Right. You know, or whatever. And like, and like merge these families in this particular way. And like that would break it down to even fewer people who had maintained. Yeah. This absolute pure blood stat. Right. Like, and I mean, that's, I mean, that's basically what's happened to the gaunts when you meet them. Yes, exactly. It's like they've yes. just like, like sort of like, yeah, like problematically like inbred. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, but that, that pretty much brings the chapter to a close. Yes, it kind of does. That brings us to the end of, uh, brings us to the end of flourish and blots, a very eventful chapter that sets up all sorts of stuff for, books to come all this i love all the stuff in nocturne alley that was a like I, I i never noticed the poison you know that like oh my gosh like even the poison is there even the poison like that no. means which means that like draco sort of successfully poisons ron i guess that's always true but like with it like from this scene you know yes yeah from, yeah. yeah yeah exactly like yeah and i mean i don't see any reason why not to assume that it's the same poison when everything else i know that we see inside of this chapter is used yeah in his is efforts. used used in his efforts and because the poisons literally used to belong to his family yes yeah yeah, yeah. 
like as far as he's I'm sure concerned, maybe it, it, it like it's rightfully his poison. Right. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. That's my family's poison. Sure. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Why not? why not? There yeah. we go. All right. Well, Jay, do we do we have a review? We absolutely do, Ben. All right. So uh, I have a review here. I don't. I, for some reason, did not copy the person's name, which is unfortunate. But sometimes it jarbles it anyway. So whatever. A uh, review is so fantastic. I love it. Hey, I've watched your YouTube channel since forever, and I love this way of looking at the book. There are so many things I never new. Thank you. I have a question. Why do you think the Dursleys don't want Harry to leave? They hate him. Don't they want him gone? <laughs> I I often am confused by this exact thing right. as well. Yes. Where it's it's almost like <clears throat> like they're the like they should be leaping for joy that he's like that Harry's accepted to Hogwarts. Right. It's like you don't have to deal with him. You don't have to pay to go to some other school. You don't have any responsibilities really attached to him at all whatsoever. Right. Like, it's eight weeks a year. Right. Like, yeah. This should be such a win for you. It's like, hey, turns out all of our troubles are gone. Like, yeah, this kid will barely be an inconvenience on in our life anymore. Right. But hilariously, uh, the thing that comes to mind is almost from like the TV show Survivor, where it's not uncommon in the show for care uh, for players to strategically keep somebody like if you're a physical threat in challenges, oftentimes people will want to keep the even more physical threat in the game so that ev- like as a shield. Yeah. Because everybody's like, well, they're all looking at that person who's like a little bit bigger, a little bit faster, a little bit stronger than me. Nobody's paying attention to me over here. Right. But like once like, you know, so if I can keep them around as like a, like a perceived bigger threat, then, you know, like, then they're not going to get rid of me because exactly. we got to keep getting rid of that guy. Exactly. But I'll keep throwing votes off that guy because he's not a threat to win. Yeah. Exactly. But so I almost wonder at all if like the, like Harry is this bizarre like unifier to the Dursleys that allows them to all like each other that much more in contrast to how much they all agree that they hate Harry. It's like a way for them to reinforce to Dudley their ideals because they can always point at Harry as what's wrong with the world. Exactly. Right. Yes. So it's like all of a sudden if Harry's not there and it's just the three of them together, then they are absolutely forced to like, and these are, these are people with opinions. Oh yeah. You know, and if they have to direct those opinions at each other in any way, that can very quickly become harmful. Right. It's like a it's like an out, like they're negative people, but Harry becomes the source of all of their the the outlet for all of their negativity. So it never gets redirected at the other people in the house. Exactly. Ah, uh, that's interesting. Yes. That's an interesting thought. Yeah. And then I think on top of that, they just are they're like we talked about it earlier, how like Petunia has that like sterile environment, like like non functionally so. Like there's there's clean because clean helps you live a nicer life and then there's clean because like it gives you the sense of like superiority or something right like not my house is clean or than yours right yeah right, right, which right. is yes. all which is also clean um and so i think to them it's like the idea like if if someone found out about harry it'd be the same like the, or the, the they're afraid that having harry there and knowing about magic is like so much more likely to draw any sort of like bad perception to themselves as like not normal. Wait, hold on. So I'm I'm trying to follow your logic here. Right. So like by having Harry there, why would that not make them want him to leave? I you're right. It, it, you know, I maybe I'm defeating myself in logic here. Um, my because my thinking similar to I think because they know he has to come back each year. Okay, and so every year he goes back. Every time he goes to school and comes back, he's going to know that much more magic, which could expose them in that, some way. That's true. That's true. Like as his powers <laughs> grow, such will the likelihood the, the of, threat of, of their normality. Of, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it it could interfere with their exposure, which eventually right. it does. I mean, their normality. <laughs> I mean, even even in this book, it already has. You yes, know. yes, indeed. It's like um, you know, otherwise, Mister Dursley probably just successfully sells the drills. You yeah, know? they yeah. get the vacation home, so. right? And they don't have a flying yeah. car outside of their house in the middle of the night. Which actually, even even that though isn't fair, because like you know what, it's not really Harry's fault. Harry doesn't do anything. <laughs> That's also true. Yeah, That's also true. Um, my other thinking would largely just be like the outside pers- like uh, like grapevine talk if you will around if 
people of the neighborhood knew that the Dursleys had taken Harry in and they win some points for that like generosity. Oh, oh. But then if all of a sudden that kid disappears, then it like it leads to questions. Right. It's like, well, what happened to the kid? Yeah. Now they have to deal with like, weren't you taking care of another kid? Yes. It's like, wasn't yeah. there somebody else who lives? Because that's the other <laughs> thing that always surprises me that they like they like let him go to school and like oversized baggy clothes and stuff. It's like that must look bad on your reputation. Right. Yes. Like, doesn't people, it? People like the teachers are going to see that you are sending this school this kid to school in oversized and old and worn out clothes in a way that like is so different from how you're sending the other kid from your household to school. Yeah. Like right it does seem like that would come back to bite them quickly. Yeah. It's like like I mean not not, not to compare like because it feels like such a like drastically different things but I'm speaking purely through the eyes of the Dursleys but like they're they're so uptight about like the their the like height of their grass, the perfectness of their you know hedges and and landscaping and the cleanliness of their house and yeah. stuff like that. It's like surely they must be aware that this is a per, like like a a way in which you can be judged, which right? Is how you care for your wards, right? But like I also don't see anything wrong with the way they treat Dudley either. But yes, <laughs> so, also true. Also yeah. true. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, <coughs> maybe it's like maybe we're we're demanding too much. Uh, we're we're expecting reasonable things from unreasonable people. That's true. Yeah. yeah. It's like you're trying to be like because yeah. you know what if they were even just regular nice people they'd be fine. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Nobody even know. even if they were lightly inconvenienced it'd probably still be fine. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, so there you go. It does seem like this eventually is like a plot point I think for um, going to the Quidditch World Cup too where. Mr. Weasley's like, well, or not Mr. Weasley, Mr. Dursley is like, mm, oh gosh, going to the World Cup will make you happy, so I don't want you to do it, but also you won't be here, which would be great, so what do I do? Yeah, so frustrating. So frustrating. Come on, man. Like, it's like, like if you're just upset hmm. at the prospect of some other individual being happy at all. Oh, so. I know. It's like, what's at war there is like his desire to make someone else happy versus making himself happy. And he is letting. Like it is a real contest of like he almost lets make someone unhappy win. Yes, I know. Yeah. It's like that is ridiculous. That is terrible. Like Let it go, yeah, man. dude. Yeah. Like it, yeah. So anyway, that's a good question. Good question. It it is a little nonsensical, but yes. the Dursleys are pretty nonsensical themselves. Um, but that's gonna do it for us for chapter four, flourish and blots. Make sure you uh, join us next time as we venture into chapter five. We're finally gonna make it to Hogwarts as we travel into the Whomping Willow. Next time here on Through the Gryffindor. Welcome, dear listeners. I'm Jonathan Carlin. And I'm Benjamin Carlin. And we invite you to join us through the Gryffindor, your one-way ticket to the enchanting world of Harry Potter. So grab your wands and dust off your broomsticks and join us as we unlock the treasures behind Chamber of Secrets, Chapter 5, The Whomping Willow. Oh, man. Oh, uh, yeah. What I love is that the, the Whomping Willow plays almost no role in this particular book at all, and yet it gets an entire like chapter title and art and introduction and you're just sort of like yeah the whomping willow that's at hogwarts but it's like it's actually much more of like a book three thing like you don't learn the secret about the whomping willow until like a whole book later no i yeah i feel the exact same way and i think that uh if i were to be quizzed about which uh book this chapter exists within like if if somebody was like you know if you were doing jay versus ben and the question was like you know which book is the whomping willow in i would be like prisoner of azkaban like right. obviously yeah. the yeah. one where it's relevant yeah um the kind of ironic thing with that particular note in mind is i'm it, it's sort of like a it's it's like a very slow play set up for a huge plot point one full year later in the meantime though um i think the overall like inclusion and way that the Ford Anglia is set up in this story is very well done. Dude, I kept writing it down. It was just like this chapter more than anyone like really made me appreciate so much like how 
every like everything in this story is so well connected. Like every action leads to like another consequence, which like informs the next thing, which is the next thing. Because like there's a point in this book that for a very long time I always just sort of felt like it was like like it, it felt like uh, a Deus Ex Machina situation, like when the Ford Anglia shows up to save Ron and Harry from the spiders. Yeah, like it always just felt like, oh, that's convenient. Like, oh, this is the whole reason the car was written in, and it's like, no, that is not the case. Like, it is all very serendipitous. The reason Harry and Ron and Aragog and the Anglia are in the woods at the same time is all, like it is. They are all there because fifty years ago, Tom Riddle opened the chamber of secrets like it is all connected in like it's like it's like th- none of them are aware of that in the moment but like that decision 50 years ago is the reason these three entities are now together in the forest at the same time and it's like it's not an accident like they're all there because of each other yeah yeah i mean down to the fact that the very reason they can't get through the barricade at right. platform nine and three quarters is because the house elf dobby is of course preventing ron and harry from having their access to it and so that leads them to the flying of the car right you know which leads them to the whomping willow and then the like wildification of the vehicle right. itself even even the boldness to drive the car comes from the fact again that dobby was blocking the letters and yes. got harry locked in his room which is like so Ron and Fred and George were like, well, let's fly the car. Let's do it. And it's like, if they hadn't done that, Ron wouldn't have suggested, like, let's do it again by ourselves, you know, but it's like, because they already did it, now they feel comfortable doing it. It's just like, and it's still down to Dobby, which means it's still down to the diary, which means it's still down to the chamber. Exactly. Exactly. And it's like, Aragog's in the woods because of the chamber. Right, yes, because (laughs) that is the creature that supposedly Tom Riddle framed Hagrid for releasing on the school so many years prior. So, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really neat. Yeah, like, I, I, cause I was having the exact same sensation. I was like, man, this is, I mean, there, there's the idea of like Chekhov's gun, which is sort of like, you know, if you're going to introduce a gun into a scene, then like by the third act or whatever, the gun needs to have been fired. Right. And so it's sort of like, I feel like the Ford Anglia is one of these things where it's like, it's not just a plot device that is dropped in front of us. It's sort of like every reason why it seems to be relevant keeps like, like it, it all just sort of like folds into itself and has been like perfectly melded together. So yeah. it just it just works. Um, it just works. And so I'm, I'm that, it was interesting to me though that you that you caught that same thing. I so did. I, I like, mean, I have like little like circles of arrows drawn all over the place. Like this is all connected. It's all connected. It's such good. I mean, even if you want to say like you put like a smoking gun, you put a gun on stage. It's like Chekhov's Whomping Willow here too. It's like yes, yeah, you yeah. put a fighting tree in there. It better have you know it better be there for some reason. And it's like oh it will be, but definitely by the third act. Don't worry. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. yeah. It'll 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 come back. But what's Not- also cool about the Whomping Willow is that if you look at like the maps that were drawn like before the first book was written like it's on the maps so it's it's, a, like, it's always it's been intended always to be there been there even if you don't hear about it in the first book too now, which is kind of fun the big question that, that and this was another thing i highlighted a few times where i'd be i'd be questioning whether or not the continuity was quite as firm is on numerous occasions they refer to the whomping willow throughout this chapter as being like the very old the ancient whomping willow and it's like mm. this willow was specifically planted <laughs> for uh, Remus Lupin upon his right. arrival to school as a way to uh, disguise the secret passageway to the Shrieking Shack. So it's like th- those, I mean, even like Snape, him- Snape himself, um, s- although the the little Freudian slip there of Snape himself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but they didn't mean to though. Um, but either way, um, like Snape himself at this point in time, I think is only like 38 years old. Right. Um, and so the the tree is like 27 25 years old it's like right. by tree standards that is that is not ancient or old it is not ancient or old it is i suppose possible that the tree was like transplanted I've, there yeah so i've it, had that it thought could too be ancient yeah. and was just moved from a place where it has stood for a hundred years to hogwarts instead what do you suppose would happen if you made either a broomstick or a wand from wood from the Whomping Willow. Oh, that is such a great idea. Right? Wouldn't that be so cool? Well, okay, but so then um, bow truckles are supposed to live in trees of like wand wood quality. Yes, correct. Right, yep. so it's like 
I wonder if they would ever live in a Whomping Willow or if like the Whomping Willow wood would not make a good wand. But I suppose whether or not it makes a good wand doesn't mean you couldn't make a wand out of it. That's a, that's a good point too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but the on the flip side though is that most trees are not inherently magical and the Whomping Willow is. That's so also, there's, that is also true. Like yeah. most trees are not inherently magical and yet their wood is used for wands. The Whomping Willow is like a magical tree. So you could have a magical wood, a magical core, and yeah, that could be very interesting. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, dude, yeah. I would love to see a Whomping Willow wand because you can make trees out of willow. You mean you, you can, can make, make wands, wands out of willows? Of course, willow. you can make yeah. trees yeah. out of willows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, or willows are made out of trees? Made, yeah. <laughs> Which way does that go? <laughs> Which way does that go? Anyway, wi- willows are just real trees. They um, are indeed. But yeah, so that, oh yeah, that'd be a very interesting, like a uh, very angry, like could you hit people with the wand? Would it be like huge or? Or, or would it even be like, uh, you know, they, they refer to the flexibility of the wands yeah. quite often. Like, you know, uh, like I think Bellatrix is like unyielding or something yeah. like that. Like it's like very, very rigid. Whereas like, uh, like I don't know, like Cedric's is maybe like swishy or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it. That'd be like a curious thing too. If it'd be like a very, very bendy wand because I like a willow switch is pretty about bendy. Bendy wands, like like could there be like I always imagine wands as just basically being like straight sticks. Sticks, yeah. Yeah, but like I suppose it's possible that you could have like a, a longer like if you know if you had like a longer wand, it could have like a real like bow to it, almost like a fishing rod or something. You yes, know, or you, you know, like, like, like you say you're casting a spell, you could really be like. Whoosh, you know, like, like whipping get, it, like, like a little, yeah, it. yeah, yeah, right, 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 like adding a little extra velocity there, right? Yeah, like imagine how much harder aiming would be, yeah, you yeah, know, like oh, you guys could just point your wand at something. Mine's got like a droop, you know, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, it reminds me when we were kids, we had a crab apple tree in our in our backyard, yeah, we and did. we would go out there and like we like you know cut off branches or whatever from like you know the nearby woods, and you would sharpen an edge, put the crab apples on the end, and then huck those things, oh, man, and I mean, whip it was unbelievable. I yeah. mean, you know, as like a as like a seven year old, you could easily send one of these sailing like like fifty plus yards, yeah, if not awesome. way further. Yeah, yes. yeah, it was like, yeah. oh my gosh, it was like the most remarkable thing. So, but now I'm imagining every time we whipped one of those apples, if that was sort of like the complexity of. Uh, directing a spell, yeah, you know, and it was like I couldn't have directed the apple where I wanted it to go. All I was doing was just heaving the stick as far as I could, right, or as hard as I could. So, like, imagine trying to actually like directionalize that, and right, then yeah. if that was as difficult as magic actually was. Uh, hopefully, you just get good at it. Hopefully, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll flick of the wrist. Yeah. Um, any which way, we can actually talk about the chapter now. We can talk about well, yeah, yeah, we could talk about it here. So, I love the very first sentence of the chapter where it just this the end of the summer vacation came too quickly for Harry's liking because like. That just that one sentence is like that has never been true before. He you yeah, know? that's the first time he has ever experienced because this is another one of those weird things that was like hard to comprehend as a kid is like you as a child going home for summer break like that was the best time of your life. Yes. Like there was nothing better than like, you know, two months, two and a half months of no school. Right. Um, and for Harry, it's been the opposite. He's like, I cannot wait to get out of this house and go back to school. And so for him to actually get to like enjoy it and be like, oh man, school right school, around the corner. I know. Wow. Like I love school. Of course, it's the best place in the entire world, but maybe this place is just a little better. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's that. Uh, so nice. Uh, I love that. And then, okay, I wanted to get your uh, opinion on something here on like the second paragraph where they're talking about um, it says on the last evening, Mrs. Weasley conjured up a sumptuous dinner that included all of Harry's favorite things, ending with a mouth-watering treacle pudding. So I think like treacle pudding is like a known Harry Potter, like his like favorite dessert, right? Is that a thing? or or like treacle tart? Treacle maybe? tart, yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. maybe I don't know enough about treacle or whatever. If, that, I, if that's a flavor or a texture or a kind of cake, I, yeah, yeah. Tr- you know, and it's funny to me as well because I think like when I think of treacle, I like my what my mind goes to is almost like um like hard not quite toffee but what what is the other I feel like there's another like caramelized nougat or something. No, not no. nougat. More like like crunchier than that. Like a brittle. Yeah. You know, like a peanut brittle. This says treacle is any uncrystallized syrup made during the refining of sugar. The most common form is treacle. Of treacle are golden syrup, a pale variety, and black treacle. And it's just basically just just like molasses, but it's like syrup. Oh, it's like syrup. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. see. And here I was thinking like of a like a rigidity to it. Yeah. Like, me like, too. Like treacly. I, I think don't it's know. more. Like, maybe it's more of a flavor. And this is another thing where they say pudding, and like, and my American brain is like, yeah, pudding, like. Like like Jello pudding, right, right, like, like like too thick to be soup, but right. definitely not a solid, <laughs> right. So it's like even when they say treacle pudding, it can mean treacle tart. But my question is, it is is this 
dinner the reason it becomes his favorite thing. I could totally see that. Yeah, especially if if on some level, like, because um, I, I think treacle tart is one of the things that Harry eventually smells in the Amortentia uh, potion. Is it? Yes. That's amazing. I think it is. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Oh, well, it's because it's very much one of those, like, there's no place like home kind of things. It's like you can go out in the wide world and try five-star restaurants, and it's somehow it's never better than mom's cooking, and it's just like, yes. is this that for him? Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, actually, you said you had to say mom, and then it always kills me. <laughs> I mean, I know I've talked about it before, but the relationship between Harry and Mrs. Weasley just absolutely, like, Ugh. both warms and so breaks good. my heart at the same time mm -hmm. in, in the best possible ways. So yes. um, anyway, but yes, yeah, so it sounds like what is otherwise just a really great evening. Another one of these instances where it's like, I mean, it's just so obvious that like if you want to call the Weasleys poor, it's just purely in the things that don't matter because otherwise it sounds like they just have like a really happy, full, warm household. Right. It's like this sounds like just the best evening ever. Yes, it does indeed. Yes. Um, uh, going on to the next page, though, um, I think that we're, we're getting ready for uh, leaving the borough and making our way to platform nine and three oh, quarters. I love the description of how everyone's getting ready. And it's like, even though everyone seemed ready the night before, like no one was ready at all the morning of. And it's like, that is just so the way of it. It, it totally is. This gets me every single time. Like I so often will find myself like, uh, like just this past weekend, you and I and our younger brother, Tyler, were going on a ski weekend. And it was the type of thing where I, we were leaving Friday after work and it was Thursday evening. And I was just so tired from like the day you know that I had had uh, and actually wasn't feeling well last week and so it's like you know I'm, I'm it's like Thursday night at nine o'clock I haven't packed I'm like you know the right thing for me to do right now is to go to bed I'll wake up early and I'll put all my stuff in the truck tomorrow exactly. morning it'll be fine um, and it is it was like the worst decision ever so then you wake up and you're like where are my socks <laughs> <laughs> I, it worked I actually did the same thing I have like a normally when I take uh, Luke to school in the morning I have to drop him off at like 7 30 okay and then typically I go to the gym at like 745, but it's only two days a week. And so the other three days of the week, I normally just go to work and have like an extra hour of just like alone time at the office. Oh, not so so bad. on this particular occasion, I was like, I'm going to use that hour. I'm going to go home and pack during that time. And nice. it, was, yeah, it just worked out very nicely. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that's not how it's just supposed to go. You're supposed to be missing socks and stuff. I know. Well, you know, or, I just... or possibly uh, almost breaking your neck, tripping over a stray chicken. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Jeez. Almost broke his neck. My goodness. Which is something that happens to, uh, to yes. Mr. Weasley. Um, there is a bit of there was like uh, some almost uncharacteristic or maybe just sort of like um, wizard muggle naivety that happens on the next page where like um, like uh, Molly's like muggles do know more than we give them credit for, don't they? <laughs> and, like, and she's well, I think she's making reference here to the fact that like uh, they're getting inside of the car. Mr. Weasley has clearly magically enhanced it so that it can fit this massive group of people that is traveling yes. and they're all able to get into the back seat of the car uh, and just be completely comfortable like hip to hip. And this is Harry, Ron, Fred, George and Percy all sitting comfortably side by side, right? <laughs> you know, so it's like this is one of those things where it is kind of fun to me that like this is this is almost like I, I was trying to figure out like if like it's like a kind of like wizard privilege or something where it's like she is so like she, she looks at the car from the outside then gets on the inside she's like wow it's way bigger than you'd expect you yeah. know and it's like it's like well no it's not <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not <laughs> yeah but yeah. like it doesn't even occur to her to like to, to kind of like do the math and be like how could it be this big inside it is I guess there is okay I guess maybe there is more of like a benefit to the doubt kind of situation here where it's like her assumption is that muggle are smarter than she gives them credit for rather than it's been magically enhanced. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That was so. that was sort of my takeaway as well. Yeah, um, but like it is also almost surprising to me that she doesn't realize it's magically enhanced. That's the thing. Yeah, it seems like it should be obvious, but that's that's again what I mean, where it's almost like if you've lived in a world of magic for so long, like and like take Hermione's beaded bag, for example, like, you know, we see it as this like really like remarkable thing. But if you live in the wizarding world and you've got like uh, like a sock drawer that you can oh, I'm stuck on socks today, but a sock drawer you can open up that can hold like 4000 socks or something, right. then like maybe you just like it never occurs to you 
the ways in which you're benefiting from magic yeah. is, is sort of what I'm trying to say. Right, like if all interior space is always just like way bigger than it's always supposed to be, maybe you lose concept of like what interior space is supposed to be. Yes, it, yes, exactly. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like because uh, even the borough itself never I mean, there's there's a lot of people sort of like living inside of this residence and it never seems to be like people are completely on top of each other yeah. either. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Maybe that could be a part of what's going on. Then we get a sequence here and I think it's pretty well written because because there's there's uh, like a myriad of um, just total like, of course, high school aged people have forgotten little things and then yes. remember the little things. And it's all part of the calamity that is also setting up like the reason why uh, they're like so. Yeah, like, they're so uh, late. Yeah. Why they're so late and why it's also rushed when we get to the platform. Exactly. But yeah. you know, this is the exact type of thing you could totally imagine where like, you know, somebody leaves the house. And I mean, this happens with my daughter Addison all the time where we're like pulling down our street and she's like, I need an oh no, which is like what we call her like little comfort blanket. Yeah. And we're like, you know, like I'll look at my wife, Alice and be like, did you pack an oh no? And she's like, no. No, and it's like, yeah. all right, I'm turning around. But I'm turning like, around. Yeah, we can it do is it. It's very clever because it looks like a series of events that looks like the reason you were told all of these things is to inform the lateness of the situation and like why they couldn't get through the barrier and why the the timing was so important. Yes. Uh, there at the last second. But actually, there's also a very sneakily hidden, like enormous plot point in the innocuous list of things that makes them late. Yes. So yeah. it, it starts with George had forgotten his box of filibuster fireworks. Five minutes after that, they just get it to a halt in the yard so that Fred could run in for his broomstick. They had to, they had almost reached the highway when Ginny shrieked that she'd left her diary. Yes. And of course, the diary is enormously important and it immediately makes you think like, well, what if she just actually forgotten it? You know? I know. I know. How much of the book wouldn't have happened. And the, I mean, this is another thing too, though. It's like it, almost certainly, I think Ginny has already met Tom Riddle. Oh, yeah, like you she, know, like the reason she's like you know freaking out about it is because she's already started writing in it. Yes, yes. Yeah, so the allure sure. has already like got got yeah, its like hooks it's inside of Jenny. But also, if you just back up to the first thing that it says George had forgotten his box of filibuster fireworks, I'm like, I'm sorry, there's no mom on earth that would turn around to go get you your troublemaking supplies. <laughs> you know, like, oh, mom, hold on, I forgot to bring my fireworks to school. No, okay, but if we go to the next page, yeah. you know who might? Who? Arthur Weasley. So I am I am starting to think that there is a possibility that Fred and George take after their dad more than any other of the Weasleys. Do you think he was like a class clown? Like I don't know that he was a class clown, but I think his unfailing enthusiasm towards muggle artifacts and like his tinkering rubs off on them in such a huge way because they get in the car and Mr. Weasley, he's like, oh my gosh, we're running late. And he says, Molly, dear, no, Arthur, no one would see this little button right here is an invisibility booster I installed that I guess up in the air. Then we fly above the clouds. We'd be there in 10 minutes and no one would be any wiser. It's like this is such Fred and George diet light calorie free thinking yeah because it's like it's just a little bit of like light-hearted rule breaking it's like we're not actually out to like cause harm or right. to like point you know this uh like you know i mean he's in the misuse of muggle artifacts department right. and this is a misuse of muggle artifacts yes he's breaking his own laws in the process but the other thing is that the specific function that he has here is the invisibility booster which immediately had me thinking about the uh, vanishing head hats that Fred and George eventually create. Yeah, that's like, true. Is there any possibility that they are like using the same spell that Arthur used on the Ford Anglia? Like, because it's something that Hermione again remarks at like the brilliance of. Yeah, She's, I, what, I think it's a disillusionment charm that they're able to like extend past the object. Okay, yeah, yeah. maybe that's what it is. Maybe yeah. that's what it is. But, but like, she's like, that's very tricky magic. Right, yeah. right. But so I wonder, I wonder if any way. I mean, we we sort of made the mention of um, like eventually how they'll have like the muggle playing cards, you know, yeah. Weasley with Weasley's wizard wheezes. Um, like, I, I think maybe there's some possibility that like, like the boys just sort of can't help themselves, but they're directing it more towards like at causing laughs. Whereas like Arthur's coming more from a place of like just utter fascination. Right. Sure. I can see it. Yeah, yeah. it does. There is there is some like, yeah, like taking after dad kindness there. 
but then they're just a bunch of jokester at the same time. So yes, that's true. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. All right. Well, let's see. Uh, so then after we we finally we get all the stuff, we remember everything. They arrive at King's Cross Station, and everyone is in such a hurry to get to the platform that uh, that this is like one of those things. Like when you're reading, you don't think that much of it, but like the order in which they go through like doesn't really make that much sense to me. It's like it's clearly written in a way so that Harry and Ron are able to get stranded, but it's like what if Harry and Ron had just gone through first? Like would Dobby have still stopped them, or would it be like a oh man, wait now we're all stuck? But it doesn't matter because Harry didn't go. Yes, th- this whole sequence is very similar. It reminds me a lot of like the opening sequence to the movie Home Alone, yeah, where it's definitely like okay, we need to call, we need everybody to be like tight enough on time. You know, we need everybody yes, to be bustling. Very Home Alone. Yes, it's it's sort of like it's like ah, oh, that's how this could happen because right, the, because the of urgency. The, yes, precisely, precisely. But you're you're definitely yeah. right. There's no doubt about it. It's like Percy going first is like kind of like a like an unusual call. Like it almost seems like like Ginny and and you know Mr. and Mrs. Weasley would go first as like you know it's like her. Yeah, you know. or it would seem like the one of the parents would stay back to make make sure everyone got through. Or, yes, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. or that. Yeah, or like even of. that. Like Mrs. Weasley goes through the platform with Ginny. It's like she didn't go through with Ron. You know, like on right. his first year. Like, I mean, I guess she had Ginny with her still, but that's a good point you know, as well. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But like they're just they just sort of leave Harry and Ron back there, and of course they get blocked by Dobby, and they'll they immediately freak out like, what are we gonna do? Um, let's see what else did I write down here. Uh, the way, yeah, Dobby's Dobby is there. Well, how often is Dobby? This is the other thing is that Dobby is there. Like, how often is Dobby watching Harry? You know, like he's he's at King's Cross Station. Yeah, no, he is. Um, this is this is a. Uh, it's it's a really good question. Like, I mean, again, I kind of go back to, um, I kind of go back to like the the whatever commands Lucius was giving that may be permitting this. Like, on the one hand, I think at some point in time, Harry asks creature to keep an eye on Draco Malfoy for me. Would you? And like, he doesn't specify that there is ever a time to stop. And right. so like I think a week later creature shows up and he's like he hasn't slept for a week oh, right. because he's like I've been keeping an eye on the on the, the Malfoy, Malfoy boy, boy. Right. <laughs> you know as per your request and it's sort of like oh goodness gracious I didn't tell you to sleep did I oh my gosh yes. <laughs> you know so it's like you almost wonder if maybe on some level like back at Malfoy Manor Lucius is like now Draco keep an eye on that Potter boy, would you? And Dobby sort of like, okay, I stepped in that conversation at keep an eye on that Potter boy, would you? Yeah, right. <laughs> like that's his bending of the rules. And I so it's like, s- I suppose you could like surmise that none of the Malfoys are home right now either because they're all at this exact place dropping Draco off for school. Also true. Yeah, also so true. Like maybe yeah. Dobby can just be like, well, see you. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Yep. That's another good point. So, um, but I mean, as per always, like I think that I give so much, I would extend so much credit to the power of elf magic that they're just capable capable of doing a lot of yeah. stuff. Uh, pretty powerful. But it would be something to look for to see whether or not Lucius is in attendance at the game during the rogue bludger. Oh, um, right. I because think in the book he is. If in the book he is, then it stands to reason that possibly Dobby just goes with them to King's Cross Station to see Draco off to yeah. school. So, I mean, you know, because yeah, Lucius... just yeah. like freak whatever the... He did, they just bring him with him. Yes, with exactly. Yeah. Yep, yep. That's, so, um, that's true. That's true. Yeah. So, I never thought about how does Dobby get the bludger there. <laughs> I, I always just assumed that Dobby was just manipulating a bludger that was otherwise inside of the, the, okay. the box. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that, that's been my interpretation of it. But um, the next thing that sort of happens is this is another one of those where it's like, it's a little bit of a leap in terms of like reasonable reaction for two 12 year olds. But yeah. basically like they're not able to get through Ron looks around wildly and just immediately gets the conclusion of we're going to miss the train. I don't understand why the gateway sealed itself. And this is like one of those. And like Harry looks up the clock and like all of a sudden we're counting down like 10 seconds, nine seconds, you know, two seconds, three seconds, one. Se- yeah, yeah. Wow. I did that wrong. Uh, three, two, one. And it's gone. And this is like one of those things where like at this point in time, Arthur and Molly would certainly be like waving as the as the train pulls out and then immediately walking back through the oh, platform as, as would so many other wizards you know yes it, it's like, like the fact that they're like hey you know what we should probably solve this before mom and dad get back yeah like it, they're going to be mad at us yeah it's like that's pretty unlikely because otherwise the like the honest truth would just be like 
We don't know what happened. We couldn't get through. Look at Hedwig. She's clearly upset. Like, we don't want to miss the train. We've all been hurrying all morning. Like, none of it would make sense that they were like, like, you then, know, yeah, they like, were unable to pass through. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's like this is this is one of those where, especially for me as a twelve year old, like I would still be at that age where it's like when I have an issue, it's usually like go ask an adult to solve it for right. you, yeah. not like hey, let me try to solve this on my own, so I'm not an inconvenience to anybody. I'll probably just steal their car. They won't care. Right. You just operate. It's not going to be a big deal to them. They won't care that I stole the car because they'll understand I needed to get to school. Right. Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, so it is. I mean, it does feel like a little bit of like a. a few um leaps of uh not leaps of faith but a uh, suspension of disbelief maybe just like yeah we're flying the car okay yeah. yeah yeah don't worry about it uh before that just one quick note that there was i just found this to be like an interesting little line is uh so they're they're kind of like oh no what are we gonna do harry do you have any muggle money and harry with a hollow laugh says the dursleys haven't given me pocket money for about six years and so it's like you know harry's 12 here which means that apparently they did give him pocket money when he was six and i was like i wonder what was going on that year I wonder if they're like we're having like a little pang of guilt or something like, <laughs> like all right all right we're doing it this time right you know I mean I suppose this is what sub- this is September 1st so like that's it's like almost exactly one month after Harry's birthday so maybe he thought maybe he got like some pocket money for his sixth birthday or something that's exactly it yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. For, right. for some reason or uh, what does do we, do, do we actually see him receive like a 50 cent piece yeah I guess at, so. at some point yeah. which is I mean, technically pocket money right also that they, they can't like figure out like oh mo- they, they talk about money but it's like they are in London so like they could still conceivably go to like Diagon Alley like Harry knows how to get in that's also true Cauldron, yep you know like they could return to the wizarding world in a different way, I guess, if they needed money, if that's their concern, um, where they could get to Gringotts or whatever. But anyway, they head back to the char, the car where Ron unlocked the cavernous trunk with a series of taps from his wand, which just feels like underage magic. <laughs> yeah, it right? definitely does. It's like, is this Alohomora or is this like, like sometimes I wonder whether or not like magic uh can can sort of like it's like we're not really casting a spell we're not really like doing anything but like um, th- there's still a, like a little bit more that you can do with your wand that doesn't qualify like you know it, it's kind of like when they do detention in the forbidden forest and it's like throwing up sparks yeah it's kind of like is Hagrid giving them authorization to like cast a specific spell or is throwing up sparks just sort of something that like your wand can do that's sort of like a fun party trick for the first 10 minutes you've got it and then you realize that all of them do it and it's like well it's only really useful like whenever you need it to do something so in the right. meantime so I wonder if there's like some like very like light magic that can always be done with right, the wand yeah, but I like don't know. or if this is just spells. like well it's the middle of London, so you know we certainly detected that magic was done, but uh, it's so much more likely to be an adult. Yeah, that that also tracks. Yeah, as far as the trace like, is concerned. Yeah, yep. as far as the tr- the trace, it is so inconsistent and annoying. I know, but yep. whatever, yep. whatever. I don't want to bring it up in every episode, but I probably will. Um, let's see. There's also okay. So when they get up, there's also this moment uh, where the invisibility booster like um, falters for a second. Yes. Yes. Which to me is a little interesting because it ends up being a problem. Like because it falters, they get seen by some muggles and stuff. But it's like it's like it falters for a second right when they start, but then works fine the rest of the trip. Um, Does it come back on or is it that they get up into the clouds? Well, I guess maybe there's that. Um, but anyway, but but what my what my theory is, is that that the invisibility booster like blinking out on them is Dobby running more interference. Oh, and he's like, oh, no, they found another way. Uh, wait, stop them. <laughs> yes. You know what? That even tracks because yeah. like that's the thing I was just saying a couple pages ago. I'm like mentally giving like Arthur so much Weasley for. Or, well, I'm giving Arthur so much credit for being able to like come up with this invisibility booster. And it's like, you know what? I have a feeling Arthur's magic wouldn't be faulty. Yeah, um, exactly. So I no, it, it would, I don't think it is. Yeah, because otherwise the car does a pretty darn good job through this entire process. Yeah. Um. <coughs> so that's that's kind of interesting. Um. Although I maybe maybe circle back on that in a minute because I do have some more thoughts on the car. So that could be okay. that could be kind of a fascinating thought. Okay. But so yeah, they get up in the air and then I don't know why I find this hard to believe, but they are able to like look down and just like see the Hogwarts Express. Yes. Like, I I wrote a note about this exact same thing. I was like, I don't know why I never really think of the train actually physically leaving the station like because they're going like 
this would suggest that like if you just had like an aerial like you wouldn't have access to platform nine and three quarters but if you had an aerial view over king's cross station you could still see the scarlet steam engine leaving from what is otherwise like a brick wall or like a uh, like a service tunnel or something right. like it's that like you know it's like wait a second there's not supposed to be a train there like it's like in my mind it almost like exits to this magical you know like right. portal to yeah. the, to the wizarding trail or yeah. track system. Like my my head canon for this almost has to be that it sort of like follows like Dementor rules where it's like yeah, Muggles just can't see it. It or does like, seem like Harry and Ron can see the tracks and the train because they're wizards, but like otherwise, like a bright red steam engine leaving like the most you know heavily trafficked train station in. Europe like would be noticed by the muggles. It definitely seems so. Right. Yeah, like, like I mean especially cuz you're in the middle of London here so yeah. like, the infrastructure for these tracks would would be would like be there. people I mean they wouldn't be like ah yes the old the old tracks nobody knows where they go. <laughs> right like <laughs> it's super easy to figure out where train tracks go. Exactly cuz it's a straight line to the destination. <laughs> <I know. laughs> So no, uh, I, I agree with you like the, the fact that they're able to find it so quickly. But again, I mean, maybe maybe you're right. Maybe it's like one of those things where it's like muggles just can't see it. So it's like they can and it is otherwise very eye catching. But yeah, like a little bit of a little bit of like Thestral or or Dementor type yeah. behavior going on. Right. Yeah. Um, that being said, though, there is um, there is this like one line that I feel like uh, demonstrates. It reminds me so much of us as high school age students, but they're basically in the air. They've successfully like made it through the challenging parts. They found the train and now they basically are just like on like a like a like a journey an adventure. And Ron says, all we've got to do now is worry about airplanes. And they looked at each other and started to laugh for a long time. They couldn't stop. And this is just like friendship to me at its most pure. Right. Like this is like when you're getting into like trouble or you're getting into the shenanigans or whatever it is that you're doing. It's like that those like lighthearted high school age people who don't have like the rest of the world to worry about beyond. Right. And like for the most part, it's just like we're having so much fun right now, aren't we? What right. an adventure. Like, look what we're doing. Look what we're doing. Uh, can, you, thought. can you even believe it? Yeah. Look yeah. at us. Look <laughs> at us. Not me. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Oh, oh man. man, yeah, very, very fantastic. Um, it always surprised. Like it's a several uneventful hours later. I'm like, man, it is just so far to Hogwarts. It, it is like, really far, yeah. which is I, I'm sure we talked about this in book one, but this is also one of those things where like, what about the students who just like live in Scotland? Oh, I Do, know, like, right? Yeah, you know, like because they never talked about the Hogwarts Express, like stopping off at the at like another train station to yeah, pick, to, up, like, more pick up more students. Students, it's like if you live generally near to Hogwarts, like too bad. You still have to make it all the way to London. And then take the train basically past your house. But yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, it does so, seem like there should be some other stations. Yes. Or like, it does. What if you just lived in Hogsmeade or something? You know, certainly. Oh, yeah, I mean, because that's like must. the only, only like wizard, all wizard village. All wizard so like visit, that yeah. suggests there's residents. And the right. fact that it's so close to the school, like, seems like some students would live there. Right, right, right. Yeah. And who knows? I mean, maybe maybe there's like a piece to that and it's just never been relevant to any of the characters that we've that we've known or I maybe the train true. is like stopping periodically and it just I don't know, we've never been informed to it. Um the one line here though that we get though is the uh the, the toffees that they had made them extremely thirsty and they had nothing to drink. I have no idea why, but it's almost like there's a part of my brain that has like experienced this exact sensation before because every time I read that line I am just instantly so thirsty yeah. oh I'm like God, I want no water I want nothing more than a glass of water and then I always think about how a glass of water seems like the worst thing to like satiate satiate yourself from uh, like having eaten a whole bunch of toffee <laughs> specifically like it doesn't seem like toffee and water it's not gonna help. yeah no you need you need like milk or something something like with like a like a creaminess to it anyway so mm. I don't know why that sticks to me uh, but it does and then they talk about the ice cold pumpkin juice from a trolley pushed by a plump witch oh man that pumpkin juice now that sounds like I it know, would work which is like weird because like it always sounds so good when I'm reading it in Harry Potter but if you were just like if I was just like at lunch and someone was like you want some pumpkin juice I'd be like no yeah it's like you, <laughs> no I, I went and took a pumpkin I pulverized it a la orange juice now we have pumpkin, pumpkin juice. juice like that sounds terrible yeah the, now pumpkin spice latte well, no, no, that's a completely different, different story. story yeah there you yeah, go anyway 
Um, so anyway, they get to Hogwarts, and I always think it's like funny. It's always like almost not, not. I don't even know funny. Like weirdly annoying to me that it's like the car makes it like ninety nine point nine percent of the way there. Yeah, it's like boy, it tuckered out at just the right moment for them to be at Hogwarts. Like, what if it had done this like just five minutes earlier? They'd be so far away. No, but Jay, here's the thing. See, it says it right here. Not far, said Ron, more to the car than Harry. Not far now. And he patted the dashboard nervously. Are you not aware of the mechanical engineering reality that is telling your car that it can make it makes a difference? Well, I, there's not nothing to that, I suppose. Like, maybe him telling the car is like the car being like, good, because I'm tired. Because like, yeah. there is like a certain sentience to the car. Yeah, that's exactly that's sort like, of yeah. what I was going for there. It's like, well, I mean, to be to be fair, back when I was in high school, I had the I had this uh, 1996 <laughs> Azuzu Trooper, yeah. fully stock, uh, which I basically took to like the end of the world and back. Yeah. Um, but the number of times, and I called it Sue, the number of times that I would like talk to Sue uh, going through some type of like mud crawl or like right. up the side of a canyon or something, it was sort of like, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this. <laughs> come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. It, it makes all the difference. And you know what? Sue always did it. Always did it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Always, always came through for me. Um, so that that's always my thinking there. But I also, this is, this is the other thing is that I, I have a, I have a very deep curiosity as to what types of things are happening here because the Ford Anglia started just as a muggle automobile. It was then taken apart by Arthur and then, you know, put back together and yep. magically enhanced and then flown quite a distance by Ron and Harry to school. And at some point in this process, the car itself is becoming alive. I know, right? Yeah, it's, it's like that's that's pretty impressive magic that it basically it becomes its own like sentient creature. Yes, but then I'm like in, in my head, I'm like almost like comparing it to uh, objects like the Mirror of Erised or like the Elder Wand, which is like definitely like a sentient oh, right. wand. Like it has like a, yeah, they do. The wands do have a certain sentient. It reminds me of like broomsticks, honestly, where like Harry says like he felt like they were like horses. So they could like tell if you're scared. Yeah, yeah. Because yep. like, I mean, they can also fly. So it's like, I wonder if there's something about like the freedom of flight that like frees the object's mind or something. Yeah, that or or even like some amount of like wizards like pouring like I don't even know, like like it sounds wrong to describe it as like part of their life force or something. That seems very like horcruxy. Um but like I like I almost wonder if like if if as time goes on, this is almost something like where like all magical objects can sort of become like like have like a life of their own because it even seems like the um, uh, suits of armor at Hogwarts are kind of in like a similar capacity yeah. like where they can sort of kind well, of like come the to way, life. Like, the portraits work is like it's not just because you painted a picture of someone now it has all those memories like the the person who it's a portrait of can like coach that portrait to like um, be more like themselves. Yeah. So like. But to that end, if you just did have a painting that was magical and you didn't like do a ton of coaching for it, it seems like over time, the things it was exposed to could like inform its personality because there is a lot of like a lot of the different things in the wizarding world have like their own like person. Like even the mirrors always are sort of like your short and scruffy. Or yes. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. You know, it was it's just like, last chapter. I think Yeah, just yeah. last chapter. Yeah. So it's like there. Yeah. I don't know. But the car does seem to like take it the extra mile. <laughs> extra mile. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> and uh become uh, truly sentient. Yes, indeed, which will, will is obviously a huge plot point later on in the yeah. story as it eventually will save yes. our boys. Oh, even then, then another big thing happens here. Ron breaks his wand here, which like even the setup for this is so good because it's like it seems so unthinkable to send Ron Ron to a magic school where he's going to mostly be learning how to do stuff with his wand with a broken wand. Yes. But it's like it's a huge plot point because eventually this is why Gilderoy Lockhart's like memory charm backfires because it picks up Ron's wand. But like the it's like the reason it's not repaired is because Mrs. Weasley is so mad at him for stealing the car. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So this is another area like where, where you're exactly right. They've like woven the story together in such a way where it's like you're not feeling like, oh, you just set that up so that later on this could be relevant to that. You know, it's like, OK, so like the Ford was first used to save Harry from, you know, this particular instance and it was used for this other instance. And then during that particular instance, the one broke. And then because of the fact that they had taken the car from Ron's parents, that means that he they were upset with him and unwilling to replace the wand, which means the wand continues to go like broken throughout the rest of the year when otherwise maybe it would have been repaired. You know, it's like right. it's like, man, it's like no one of these details specifically feels like it was fed into the story just simply to allow 
this other thing right. to happen. Like it's all just very it's all just very connected. Yes, yeah, and exactly. It's like, again, it's like Ron wouldn't have broken his wand if the if it, Tom Riddle didn't open the chamber fifty years ago. Right. You know, yes. It's like it all it all comes back to Voldemort at the end of the day, which is just very sneaky. And then there's another just like fun tidbit about Ron's wand about like um, how you learn in the first book that he has like a hand me down wand. Yes. And that it's like um, like if you look up Ron's or initial wand wood and core pairing like on uh, uh, Wizarding World in the like Pottermore archives, you can just it like the description of the wood is like, yeah, especially if it has this particular core, it should not be transferred from one wizard to another because it won't work well. <laughs> yes. Like, so not only does Ron have a broken wand, but even a fixed wand was not doing good magic. So Ron has had like a severe handicap for the first two years of his like wizarding schooling career. Yeah, I think we even made a video once upon a time. It's like, why is Ron so bad at magic? And it's like, it's actually really not totally his fault. Right. Like he's not he's not bad at magic. He just unlocked a car. Exactly. Yeah. Like we're just tapping around and such. Right. Um, let's see. What else do we have here? You know, we already sort of talked about how we introduced the willow like a book early, which is just really fun here. Um, bam. They they crash into the willow. It just beats them up terribly. I like the way it's described as the the branches having like python being described as thick as a python because it's just sort of that like dangerous snake imagery. That's which true. Will, yeah. Like, come yeah. into play, which, you know, obviously there's a giant snake in the school when that's like the big villain. Yep. Um, yep. So kind of like laying, the, laying some groundwork there a little yep. bit of like, like subliminal, you know, sort of like serpents, yeah. dangerous. Right. Yes. Bad. Yeah. Don't yeah. like can't, can't smash. Mm -hmm. Um, then there's there's this other kind of interesting thing that I think happens, and I suspect that the reason I mean you could do it a couple of different ways from like a writing standpoint, but it does seem like for a beat, Harry is going to consistently miss the start of year feast. Yeah. And it's like you're not really sure if it's like, was it just really difficult to write the sorting hat songs? That in a is way? what I always yeah. think. Yeah. That was sort of like meaningful, or like is it difficult to just like like be like and they went into the sorting ceremony and we met these new characters and it's like all of a sudden you gotta like break off, you know, like rattle off like forty new potential right. classmates and like where they went and all that type of thing. Right. It's kind of like, like realistically genies and Gryffindor and that's about all you need to know. Yeah, and, and Colin Creevy. Colin Creevy. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone else. Nah. Right. Yeah, not not a big deal. Um, we also in, in that as well. They're looking through the windows. They're they're kind of like seeing the preparations for the sorting to happen, despite the fact that they're not in the great hall. We get a little bit of groundwork laid um, where Harry is recalling the fact that the sorting hat had like contemplated putting him in Slytherin. Yep. Uh, that ends up being a massive theme throughout the rest of this story. Yes. Is Harry sort of having that like that split feeling? Like, am I supposed to be? And like, we'll get like the intro to like the parcel tongue, which sort of then is like. Oh my gosh! Like maybe I should be in right, Slytherin, yes. you know. Uh, so that that kind of like in, like lingering self doubt really perseveres throughout the rest of the story. Uh, we get the uh, description of Lockhart's dress robes for the start of year feast, which are aquamarine. Aqu yes, aquamarine. Mm -hmm. Just a fun piece of trivia yeah, in case you're trying to remember that. Right? I've already forgotten what color he was wearing at uh, Flourish and Blotts, though. Was so. it Forget Me Not Blue? <sighs> I think it was. Yes, I think you're right. Now, uh, now, now I'm like I, I desperately Wait almost a like it's like I want to go back and like be absolutely. Yeah certain but uh. yeah so while they're looking into the great hall though while you look that up uh, they are just they are noticing that Snape's not at the table and they're hoping it's because he's been uh, fired or sacked or left um, which you know you get to be reminded that he wants the defense against the dark arts job but it turns out he's out looking for them uh, which I always think is like I get like I uh, it's like why is Snape the one looking for them and not like McGonagall? Yeah, but I, I suppose it's because McGonagall is doing is doing the sorting ceremony like that's like her job as well. Yes. So and then and then I was like, okay, that actually makes sense. So it, maybe it wouldn't be McGonagall, but like then why is it Snape? And it's like because Dumbledore is extremely concerned that the chosen one didn't show up. Yes. And he's yes. like, hey, where's my right hand man? <laughs> right, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. Snape. Yeah, Snape. Snape. I got a mission Get in for here. you. Although the way that this particular scene goes down I mean it is just sheer nightmare fuel to ever have somebody who you are saying something negative about overhear you saying the negative thing about yes. you especially if that person is in a position of power over you yeah. um, so total nightmare fuel that uh, Ron basically has just finished saying or maybe he's been sacked yeah. said Ron enthusiastically <laughs> everyone hates him or maybe he, said a very cold he must voice. have noticed he hasn't got any friends <laughs> <laughs> Ron 
Ron is so Ron. bad. I know. It's like Ron, just look around, man. Look, look man, around. Take in your surroundings. Yes, before before you go talking about people, man. Or yeah. even better yet, just don't gossip. Just just a good general rule to there life. Oh yeah, just yeah. You know. Um. <sighs> so anyway, there's this is like one of those situations. Once again, we kind of come back to the thing I've said before, which is that like this idea of expulsion is definitely being held over our heads. Uh, we discover that they the boys were of course seen in the flying Ford Anglia, which is like one of those things where it's like, do they really catch the like make and model of the flying car? It's like, oh, I know. It's like, what is that? A flying Ford Anglia? I know. Like, <laughs> like everyone's got it. Right. Uh, I, there's also this great line where it says Ron gulp. This wasn't the first time Snape had given Harry the impression of being able to read minds. Oh, and it's yes. like, which is immediately then like you're like, you're like, oh, that'd be scary. But then it's like your suspicions are immediately assuaged by the internet. He's like, oh, I've got the evening profit here. And you're like, oh, that's how we knew. But it's like, no, but he can read minds. He can read minds. Yes, almost that, certainly was. That is definitely a thing that is also going on yeah. for certainly. Yep. But yeah. I think Dumbledore can also do it. Absolutely. Dumbledore can do it. And I feel like actually he there's a there is a, the very next like two pages later. It says for some reason uh, Harry's talking about when Dumbledore is in there. It says for some reason he was unable to look Dumbledore in the eyes and spoke instead to his knees. And it's almost like a like Dumbledore is like desperately trying to make eye contact with Harry so he can get like the truth of the matter. Yes. Like, what yep. actually happened and Harry's like so distraught. He's like, I can't look Dumbledore in the eye. And it's like, if only he could have, then maybe Dumbledore would have gotten the full story just through his mind. I mean, he may be getting it anyway, because I mean, it says like um, uh, they told Dumbledore everything except that Mr. Weasley owned the Bewitched car, making it sound as though he and Ron had happened upon a flying car outside of the station. He knew Dumbledore would see through this at once, but Dumbledore asked no questions about the car. And I mean, that could that could be. Yeah, Dumbledore, like be you know, like looking at Harry and being like, I know exactly what happened. Okay, continue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, okay. Okay. So here's I have another little tiny mini theory here. Okay. Yep. Go where, ahead. Because like when Dumbledore comes in, he is like especially he's like almost uncharacteristically like grave. Like Harry and Ron are threatened with expulsion like all the time or whatever. It's like looming over their heads, but it's rarely coming from Dumbledore. It's normally just like Harry and Ron worrying about it. Yes. But like yeah. it actually says Dumbledore was looking unusually grave, and then the next page he says, if you do anything like this again I will have no choice but to expel you and it's just like what well, first of all empty threat he would never yeah. <laughs> Harry <laughs> my boy yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think he is being intentionally scary here and he's looking unusually grave because because like I think why he really wants to know like the truth like what hair like what the truth of the matter is like like did like were you actually blocked did you like need to take the car or not because like again we like the reason he's hired Gilroy Lockhart is to demonstrate to Harry very specifically the dangers of fame and like yes. how not to be famous right. basically and it's like what Snape lays out I think might be exactly what Dumbledore is worried about right here is like oh you wanted a fancy like exciting famous arrival in a car and it's like oh. Dumbledore might be seeing like Harry Potter, Harry Potter, do not you dare be letting that fame go to your head if you do anything like this again. Like I got, I have a stupid idiot here to teach you how not to do this, and you're already ahead of it. Yes. You know? Oh, and it's so true. And I mean, and the honest fact too is that like Dumbledore, he could have that grave look on his face because he may even be aware. Like when they go back up to the common room two pages later, they're greeted like with applause. Oh, yes. Like like, it, like they, it is well received by everyone. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. it's. I mean, it really. Oh, that's so true. Right. I it's really like, like that. I think that's why Dumbledore is like actually upset because he's like this is what I was afraid of do not be like Lockhart right do not do it you're already kind of showing signs of it like you right because he, he the year on such a high note like oh I, I know yeah because that's the thing too he would have come in so humble for his first year but right. then he wins the house cup for right. Gryffindor like to kind of close out the season so it's sort of like Harry what happened to you over the summer like right did, did you let that get to you uh did you need to come in on some type of like glorious yeah like, you know you try to be all or, famous and showy now right oh yeah, man like, stomp that out right. I will expel you I would never but I will wink <laughs> <laughs> like a flutter of a wink yeah. <laughs> um, after that though w there is there is kind of like an uncharacteristic uh, piece of kindness maybe um, from Professor McGonagall where uh, basically it's like 
Um, Snape is like, well, if you were in my house, blah, 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 but it will be up to Professor McGonagall to decide what these... Uh, what like, hot garbage, too. If they were in his house, he'd love it. He oh. would love the idea that James Potter's son was in his house. Yes, I know. He'd be yeah, like, yeah, ha, 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 ha. I got him. I got him. Yeah. I know. It would be... I feel like he'd be at war with himself all the time between oh, I mean, being like, su- super excited. Yeah, yeah, he is. He is. Um, but the, the line that actually kind of gives me like a little bit of like... And it always makes me happy just because I also uh, can't imagine anybody other than Maggie Smith, so I can just picture her doing this exact thing, but it's like Professor McGonagall gave gave him a piercing look, but he was sure she had almost smiled. Uh, and this is like in reaction to like them making the argument to not take points off for Gryffindor because the term had not technically started yet. And I think that what is really funny about that is that it's it's like I think Professor McGonagall appreciates the logic that's being applied. Yeah. It, it like fits her way of thinking so very well. It's like you just gave me an out. You are absolutely correct. The term hasn't started yet. I know. Yet. I think because like the last year, like when she catches them out of bed, she's like, I would have thought Gryffindor house meant more to you than that or whatever. Right. And it's like, they're just like, their immediate concern is like, please, no, not Gryffindor. Don't do it to Gryffindor. Right. It's not, no, it's not, it was our fault. Don't, don't blame the rest of them. Right. And she's like, mm, you do care about Gryffindor. You do care. Yeah. You do care. Yeah. yeah. Which yeah. is also in a sharp contrast with like, it's like right there, it's being established how much. Harry is a Gryffindor, like from the start as well. Yes, also true. Like his yep. concern about being a Slytherin later on. Yep, yep, yep. Um, but anyway, from there, I mean, they basically have you know sandwiches in the uh, in oh, Snape's office. Yeah, um, there's like a certain amount of like Gamp's law happening here, where like Ron later on is like, my mother can make good food appear out of thin air, and it's like, isn't that sort of what McGonagall does? And it's like, I, it must not be. I, I know this is like one of those where I have to imagine that because basically McGonagall summons a plate of sandwiches that like will instantly like refill itself yeah, as I it's being consumed. It feels like she must like connect it to the kitchens or something. That's what I think as yeah. well. Yeah. And I suspect that within the walls of Hogwarts, especially this would work a lot better because like the infrastructure is almost like designed for it. There's right. like a place to draw from. I wonder if every teacher's office just has like a, a place setting where they're just like, I'm hungry. I know. Yeah. 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 It's, it's It reminds me a little bit of like Bruno's plate from Encanto like yeah. inside of the wall where mm-hmm. it's almost like you know it's like a little like I'm a little place setting so yep. like, yeah, my food can show up here too it's all good we're all good mm-hmm. um, from there we make it up to the uh, the dormitory where they run into Hermione we get the waddle bird I, uh, I literally circled that and I was like I will never remember this that's I, just one of those passwords I'm like waddle bird if what, you say so what a throwaway I'm pretty sure we got this question on Jay versus Ben in the past month I and I, I had already forgotten it and was like I'll, I'll try to remember waddle bird I'll do my very best so if you see me ever out in real life be like hey ben what's the password at the beginning of year two and if i get it we'll we'll exchange high fives it'll be great um this is one of those though where poor hermione has absolutely been in the dark where her two best friends did not show up on the train uh at all and were not at the feast then all of a sudden show up and they're pretty much like you know what i'm gonna go to bed i'm pretty tired and if i was hermione i would be like what like no you are sitting down right now you were explaining everything that just happened there's rumors you were flying a car it's like no we were well we were we're pretty awesome like that maybe you've noticed the party waiting for us inside yeah no big deal uh there is a quick uh shade thrown at percy who's like visibly mad at them for like i guess arriving with the car and he's like oh everyone else is happy for you but not me i don't uh, i'm angry i'm a, i'm i'm definitely the bad guy of this book <laughs> but not really <laughs> once again this is just like one of those where it's like i know percy's supposed to be the red herring for the whole book and i just like <laughs> It couldn't be Percy. I know. It's just like, nah. <laughs> I can't extend him that kind of credit, um, uh-uh. which is pretty hilarious. But anyway, that will round off a, a very fun and whimsical chapter five. I mean, a rather memorable and iconic chapter. Lots, chapter of, on the lots whole. of good setup happening in this chapter for sure. Yes, indeed. Um, and then let's see. I do have a review here. Ben, okay, lay it on quick. me. Um, left for us by it's just a series of emojis. So it's left for us by unicorn, dog, butterfly, rose, pig, panda cat. Hey, you know what? I'm pretty sure I know them rolls off the tongue yeah it does yeah uh they just said love it love the super crowd Brothers youtube channel uh i was super excited to listen to the podcast i love harry potter books and anything to do with the series and listening to your theories and just what you think of everything is so interesting it makes me think of the books in a whole new way so thank you for making your videos on this incredible podcast my question is why does dumbledore and voldemort trust snape i mean both of them knows that one of them is going to get screwed right 
Ah. <laughs> I think you hit the nail on the head. It's just like, yep, both of them is positive that one of them is going to get screwed, and both of them is positive that it's the other one. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. No, I think that's. I think that's. That is exactly it. And I yep. think that really this is like the thing that Dumbledore, the ace in the hole that he has on his side, is love, it is and love. it is the primary thing that Voldemort cannot understand. Yes. And I think like in this way, it gives Dumbledore an edge over Voldemort in terms of this trust because Dumbledore knows something about Snape to be absolutely true right. and verified. And like, I, I think that this is why, like, I, I suspect that Dumbledore had his his worries. Yeah, you know, well, like, I think he like, does. And it's like this is like the thing he has to go back to and lean on because he's like, the reason I trust Snape is because of love. So if I can't trust Snape, then then I can't trust my entire cause. Yes, because like that is what it's built on. And if that's not true, then I'm doomed to lose. Precisely. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And I think on some level when you reach high enough stakes, you have to invest your efforts, your energy, your belief, uh, not only in the facts that you know, but also in the foundation of your principles. And yes. I think that that's probably where, on some level, both of them reside. Yep. Yeah. Yep, I think so. So there you so, go. Great question. There's your answer. But uh, otherwise, we'll be looking forward to uh, Chapter 6, Gilderoy Lockhart, which has humorously off uh, chapter art, which we'll talk about when we get to it. Yes. Um, but <laughs> I love that. <laughs> anyway, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. There we go. But otherwise, uh, thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time through the Gryffindor. Welcome, dear listeners. I'm Jonathan Carlin. And I'm Benjamin Carlin. And we invite you to join us through the Gryffindor, your one-way ticket to the enchanting world of Harry Potter. So grab your wands and dust off your broomsticks and join us as we unlock the treasures behind Chamber of Secrets, Chapter 6, Gilderoy Lockhart. Oh, <laughs> boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. It must have been such a challenge to not use the uh, the picture of Gilderoy Lockhart. From, I like, know. Is it the previous? No, it's not even from the previous. It's, it's Flourish it's and chapter Blots. chapter four. Yeah, Flourish and Blots. So it yes. is so funny that, yeah, the chapter titled Gilderoy Lockhart does not have the picture of Gilderoy Lockhart, even though that picture is used back in chapter four, which is like not something that you would pick up on if you were just like listening to it or like didn't have or if there weren't pictures on it. But it does feel like an intentional slight at Lockhart, if you ask me. Yeah, there's like some big like Mike Wazowski energy here where it's like like it's literally Lockhart's chapter. It's, it's his namesake chapter. And for the chapter art, instead of getting this this glorious, bright, which weekly award winning smile, you get this like half naked root baby plant head thing. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> In the form uh, of a mandrake. The so. mandrake. We we actually saw like a um uh, a mandrake in uh, London. Did we, we not? Yes, we did. This was like one of like kind of like interesting fun facts when we were doing uh, we were brought out by Google Arts and Culture to the History of Magic exhibit at the British Library. That is correct. Um, got all the deets. And while we were there, we were working um, with Google Arts and Culture to basically create a uh, a video that was kind of like showcasing some of the uh, like early inspiration for specific creations inside of the saga. Yeah. And one of those is just simply the fact that a mandrake is a real plant. Like this is not like a magical invention. And the I think sort of where the inspiration was pulled from is that the root system uh, or the bulbs of the mandrake plant can actually like look human like in yeah, they like they kind of look yeah like, sort of like what you see in the movie where it like not like the this particular chapter art image where it just looks like a small infant human child but more like sort of a like a, a root baby that has like a, a cringy face or something yeah yeah yeah. The, yeah the movie the movie's depiction of it is actually like kind of kind of spot on actually yeah so pretty pretty good in that regard um actually this this whole chapter i would say is like the the film adaptation the film 
adaptation of it is is true to form. There there are a lot of things that are very uh, very accurate. There's a few things that I as I was reading, I was like, that does. Wait a minute, that the movie got this a little bit wrong. Like I think in her biology class, I think like the Slytherins are there. That's in true. the movie. That's and I th- true. Yeah. I want to say like in the movie, like Neville like faints when he hears the Mandrakes or whatever. Okay, that's which, a good point. As which well. I despise on two accounts. One because in this chapter the earmuffs are like magical and like no sound should be allowed to get in at all. Yes. And two, if anyone's excelling in herbology, it's, it's Neville. Neville. I know. So uh, I thought that was uh, th- those are the only things that really st- stood out to me particularly different. But otherwise, yeah, a lot of this is like very spot on. Yeah, um, from yeah. The movie. No, it is. And, and probably even in the movie, what they were going for was trying to set you up for that. Like, why is it always me? Yeah. Like when Neville's like, you know, hanging from the, the chandelier or whatever. It's because like, he also just fainted like apparently that same day in her biology class. But it, it, it seems ridiculous to me that Neville was ever not excelling in the greenhouses because that's like his domain. Exactly. Um, so anyway, yes, yeah, so that's that's sort of like a brief overview as we as we enter this uh, particular chapter where just lots of really fun things and and probably some of our all time favorite Lockhart moments. Oh, happen. my gosh. This as I was reading it, like this chapter in particular um, stood out to me as like the one like when we were kids. Yeah, uh, we would have to drive up to uh, we live in Virginia and we have to drive up to New York to visit our grandparents for like, you know, summer holidays or Christmas or whatever. Yep. And on one such occasion, after we had read several of the books, our dad managed to either bar- borrow cassettes or the CD audio books of Harry Potter. Yeah, we had them somehow before we ever properly received them because I know that I know that your wife Beth always gifted them to you as like, a, yes. like something when you guys were dating in college. So yeah. clearly we didn't have those CDs in our possession yet, but we did somehow have the Jim Dale audiobooks yes. earlier uh, and, for for brief stints. Yeah, and it was great. And there, were, I mean, we would listen to it, and like, so we'd like listen. The whole family would listen to it, and it was like every time we got in the car, be like, everyone, be quiet, we're listening. Jeez. Yes. But there was one particular uh, line by Jim Dale that just became like the family inside joke, and that I mean, because he says it. There's like three occasions where he says it, and it's always hilarious. But it's every time Lockhart shows up to Harry, and he just goes, Harry, <laughs> Harry. <laughs> Harry. It's like, what? It's why like, is he it's saying? so funny the way he reads it in the audiobook. And it really, no, it, it really is. And it's, it's like comical because on like one page, there's like two paragraphs back to back where he does it. And it's like, th- I mean, this chapter in particular is even one as well where you, you might need to like wonder if Lockhart has told his own lies for so long that he has started to believe them. That almost has to be the case because like they're like, right when we meet him for the first time in this chapter, he is like boasting about how he has met several whomping willows in his past and knows so much about them and was just giving Professor Sprout some tips. And I don't want to indicate that I'm better at herbology than her or anything. And it's just like, dude, you are surprisingly eager to put yourself like front and center of this like easily disproven lie. I, like, yes, that's exactly it. It's it's like the thing that makes the least amount of sense. I mean, lots of like Lockhart is like ridiculous, but you would think that someone who has made such a career out of being a successful con man that he would be much more cognizant of like showcasing his ineptitude in front of people who actually know. I know, I know. It's like, why are you going up? Like, don't go out of your way to prove to someone who definitely knows about Whomping Willows to be like, I'm so good at this, especially because like, it sounds like he was out there helping Professor Sp- helping in quotes, like helping her with the Whomping Willow without an audience. You know, right, it's like, right. you know, wh- who are you proving this to her? Because like, no, you're not like, are you are you are you just so self-important at this point that like y- you genuinely believe you're helping? But like, but then at the end, like he still he still knows he's stealing the stories. So it's like, what? What are you doing, man? <laughs> he, he's just he's just remarkably delusional. And you're right, though. I mean, it's really funny even just going back to that, like to what we say, because like, we always talk about how much we like love Lockhart as um, 
you know, as a character. Oh. And even even like our, our Wizarding Candle subscription, just a little little plug for that real quick. Um, like that kicked off the year. The first candle of the year for the month of January was called Pretty Obvious. Like we led <coughs> with Lockhart, you know, yeah. as oh. like a, I think a, it's hilarious. That that candle, by the way, is like my favorite candle that we've done. The pretty obvious one. Yeah, that that one's your favorite. Yes, yeah. it is so good. We are we are we have moved on past January. If you're interested in getting in on the uh, Wizarding Candle Club subscription, it is still available. We are now in uh, month two, where the uh, candle scent of the month is called Love Potion. It is called Love Potion. It's kind of like a spearminty, which, yes, which it does. like when you first like smell it or sniff it, you're sort of like you're like this is a strange kind of scent for a candle, but I have to say it burns really nice. It does burn really nice, and if you're wondering like how do we land on like spearmint for a for Love Potion, it is because it is one of the things that like Hermione smells when she smells the Love Potion. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so. That that's the inspiration for the smell of this one, and as ever, of course, it has like a little a little collectible charm whenever you're done burning it. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, so you know, yeah. wizardingcandles.com if you're interested, and I will like we we actually sold out of the first run, so we had to like get get more oil to make more candles, but we have very limited amount. So if you want them, like go do it because I'm I'm afraid we're gonna sell out again. I know, yeah, there, there's a high possibility of that. So definitely <laughs> go and check it out. Um, but anyway, so we yeah, so what I was gonna say though is that um, for like this chapter in particular is one that our family quotes all the time. It is. And Lockhart, it, you know, is like one of these characters that he's such like a buffoon. But like as I'm actually reading this chapter, like page by page, I'm like, I hate this guy. Oh, like, I mean, yes. Yeah. That's I'm like he's terrible. Like he's he's funny to laugh at as a character, but as a person, he's the worst. He's just the worst. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No. And it's 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 really interesting as well because we we talked a little bit last uh, last chapter about the um, like the Dumbledore's big plan connotations <laughs> here, where um, like Dumbledore has hired Lockhart to demonstrate to Harry the dangers of like fame and all that type of stuff. And so when Harry arrives on the flying car, you know, to kick off this school year, there's the, there's the line from the previous chapter that says, uh, Harry's whole body went numb. Dumbledore was looking unusually grave. Um, and this is like when he enters the room to kind of like dole out punishment or hear their side of the story for like, you know what they were thinking. Yeah. And so, you know, our big thing here is that like Dumbledore was like, no, like, man, you had one year of success at school and then you right. immediately let it, it get to your, your head. head like yeah and so that was sort of like our mind blown moment from from the last chapter but then even in this chapter uh when lockhart comes over to him he's he's like saying um you know like like he like lockhart himself is commenting on like uh, that's such a me move isn't it like trying to get front page attention you got a taste of it and now you need more right it's like so like even it's like you know exactly what Dumbledore is worried is happening is matching what Lockhart assumes happened based on his own influence over yeah, one based Harry on James what Potter. he would do. Yes. yes, exactly. So it's like yeah. it's like so that I definitely think that that is like what is happening confirmed. Yeah, yeah. In um, terms of like how Dumbledore is feeling. Yes, yes. yes yep, definitely. I, I absolutely uh, agree with you. I yeah, I noted that as well. I also thought well, we'll come back to it. I okay. guess as as we get there, I suppose I suppose we could just go do our our, our chat our our you know. Our, our comb through, our comb our, through, our comb through. Exactly. Yeah. Let's just dive into it. So we start uh, with Harry's uh, first day uh, at school. He heads down to breakfast. Where I just, I thought this was funny. He just like, it, no, I always love when there's a list of food at the Great Hall because it always makes me so hungry. Yes. Yeah, but on this particular morning, there's like porridge and kippers and toast and eggs and bacon. And then before the end of the paragraph, it's like Harry's down there um, talking about Harry had only just started his porridge when sure enough, and I'm always like Harry, Harry, why do you always choose the blandest food uh, yeah like, like, it's always a baked potato or porridge like yeah. did you have some dry toast as well like come right, on right. man like, he's, like, he's not going for the toast because it came pre-buttered i know right you know? there's, <laughs> no, there's no, egg, no, there's no, eggs and you. bacon there sir right yeah if there's eggs and bacon on the table and you're not going for eggs and bacon then like i'm worried yeah yeah like, what do you what well, I, I don't yeah. i don't get it yeah um there's also i love how like the last book ended with neville being this like hero of 10 points that gets griffin or the house cup and it's better to stand up to your enemies and it's like right away it's like yeah forget that Neville's an accident pro boy with the worst memory ever I, I, and he, immediately it's just like it's like Harry describes him as the boy with the wor worst memory anyone had ever met and then like one sentence later he's like I forgot stuff <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah okay so any any credibility Neville built up in the last book forget that I know I know but it's so sad too because like once you find out how capable Neville actually is you're yeah. just like man what what all 
is he shouldering? Oh, I know. You know, that is like causing him to just like, like just be so unwilling to, to like, you know, I I mean, not unwilling, but like unable to, to like rise above everything else. Oh, I know. I mean, you get a little bit of a taste on the next play page where Ron receives the howler in the mail from Mrs. Weasley, but then Neville's the one who sort of fills you, the audience in on like, Oh, uh, you better open that quick. It's worse. If you don't, my grand sent me one once and I ignored it and it was horrible. But like I, I, when I read that, I was like, I wonder what she sent him the howler for because it must have been last year, right? Ooh, because like yikes. and and whatever it was, surely they all heard it. This can't have been the first time any in their entire first year that anyone got a howler, right? No, but you can even sort of imagine <clears throat> that because Neville is not exactly known for his uh, like like misbehaving kind of behaviors. So like I'm immediately kind of getting some like very like Encanto, Abuela, generational trauma. I'm disappointed in you for not excelling more because you have, you should have all of your dad's magical abilities and why aren't you living up to expectations? Like, like it doesn't seem like Gran would be sending him a howler for like, like you got in trouble and that's unacceptable and so now I am embarrassing you for it. It seems more like like Neville would have in some way embarrassed her. Yeah. And well, I'm so I was trying to think because like the last year there was there is an occasion where Neville loses Gryffindor fifty points. That's by being true. out of bed. That's true. But it does seem like yeah. Harry would have been present for the Howler. Yeah. At also that point, true. or like, is there a like? Does Harry end up in the hospital wing recently after that? Like, I was trying to think. Was there a situation where Harry? would not have been present for whatever this was. Well, he is in the hospital wing yet at the end of the year. Yeah. And that would have been in the interim time uh, where like like uh, Neville's own actions the night that they went through the trap door wouldn't have been regarded as heroic yet. I, but, yeah, like, but you know, and there, could there is, she have heard about that? And Well, there's like the like the line from Dumbledore, like it's a complete secret. So naturally, the Everyone whole school knows. knows. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, but that would that would seem like a strange one. It do, That would seem like a strange one unless it was just sort of like Gran found out at that moment that like, yep, Gryffindor finished last place and Neville lost us 50 points earlier in the year. It's it's his fault. Right, right. Or something. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's it's hard to know, yeah, because even even like she seems to hold Harry in a high regard, but that comes with more uh general cre- like credibility that Harry builds in the years to come. Yeah. So it's like, you know, if he if the news got out to um, you know, Neville's grandmother that the points were lost, but he was with Harry Potter. Like, would that have like buffered that situation at all? Anyway, so my, my chief thought here was that like we know that Neville lives under some crushing expectations from his grandmother. Absolutely, yeah. And, and so it's like, but like Neville also has his own trauma, re like Bellatrix of Strange and his parents, um, of which he's he's not present for that, but he he can see Thestrals because he's seen his uncle die? Uh, yes, yeah, so, yeah, I think so. I think that's right. So, like, Neville, Neville's had a bunch of experiences that would have exposed him to a lot of different things, but I'm just trying to, I'm trying to figure out, like, what might be causing sort of, like, his, his general, like, insecurity in his own abilities and whether or not, like, this howler could have contributed to that. Oh, it seems, I, I, for sure, I think it could have. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, poor, I don't know. Poor Neville. I mean, I guess he, uh, he goes to the hospital wing after he falls off the broom. Like, could that have gotten back to her? Something that embarrassed her? I have. Yeah, I mean, that does happen. Because yep. she, she would have sent him the remember all that very day. Right, right, you right. Know, like there, there might have been some other correspondence and maybe then hair, like maybe none of the rest of them would have been present for it. Uh, yep, but, yep. Or the, like, how dare you fall off that broomstick? You know? <laughs> <laughs> that certainly seems to be everyone else's reaction. That's it, what Madam Hooch is like. <laughs> yeah, get yep. down from there at once. And it's like he clearly isn't in control. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like this is all an accident. You know, he's he's not trying to show off. Yeah, um, I suppose it's possible it didn't arrive at school and it's just happened over the breaks or something or like as a child. Yeah, but it just seems like he'd be with her. It does but. seem like you know if he's been <clears throat> largely raised by her, then when when would he have received it if not at school? And if at school, then why? Why wouldn't the rest of the school have known about it? Exactly. So, so anyway. what did he do? <laughs> right, right, right. And to be absolutely crystal clear for anybody who's like, guys, they're just introducing the Howler because this is the first time it's ever been like, you know, created. And so we need some exposition to explain. We know. We know. But, but like, we also need to, we need to like, like take you know, 40 what, yeah. steps backwards and be like, no, 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 no. no. It's not. It's like, 
<laughs> it's not a plot hole. There's an explanation. <laughs> this is why you guys are listening, right? <laughs> <laughs> come on. No, just yeah, just just for the full disclosure for those folks yeah. who were like, come on, y'all. Um, and we get it. We get it. Um, anyway, but yeah. So anyway, uh, this is like one of those things where you can you can only imagine the kind of. Um, you know, despair that Harry's going through as the Weasleys have so kindly taken him in over the summer and, you know, provided him so, with so much attention and food yes. and <laughs> all yeah. the rest, you know, common things that, that adult parents who are supervising your existence are supposed to do. But um, either which way, I could I could only imagine the the racking guilt that Harry feels over uh, Arthur getting in trouble and, and all the rest that kind of comes through with his howler. Oh, my gosh. I know. It's like yeah, his insides were burning with guilt. Mr. Weasley's facing an inquiry at work. It was like, oh, gosh, that would be. Yeah, I, that that would be that'd be a lot to take in <laughs> for so, the yes. people who don't so much for you. <laughs> the, this is something though where like I am trying to I like as a parent uh, in in reading about the howler situation and all the information that comes inside of the howler. I am like I am like forced to wonder to myself if this is a parenting decision that I that I also would ever make because I feel like it's not you know like it feels yeah. like it feels like this only uh, spreads all of like the negativity to even more ears than would have known otherwise. Do you? Okay, so this is interesting. As we're talking about like Dumbledore's big plan and like his like potential like like fear that Harry has gone the way of fame. Like in the Howler, it mentions letter from Dumbledore last night. I thought your father would die of shame. It's like whatever Dumbledore sent because Dumbledore like gets the truth out of them like they tell him what happened and whatever he sends the Mrs. Weasley does not do anything to like explain the situation in a way that is at least positive enough to prevent the howler. Oh, I you see know? where you're going. That's a good point. You know, like yeah. did Dumbledore yeah. is he just like I think some reparations need to be made here or you know, right. like this Dumbledore voting. like yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> is he like what did Dumbledore put in that letter that caught that led to howler because I feel like Dumbledore is like let me go ahead and put the absolute guilt of God into Harry right now and yes, you know. Yes. Well, and that's the thing is that he he's trying to uh dissuade him from this very way of thinking and so yeah I don't mind that at all I mean I, I didn't even think about the fact that it's uh, that the information is coming from a letter from Dumbledore um, which you know is is definitely like it's like oh, okay there's, right there's his hand in it you know there we can, we can see him playing master yeah. puppeteer right at all I times mean, she she does react in this exact same way when they take the cart the first time so there's that as well but yes letter from Dumbledore there it is he that he communicated and whatever he said was not like, don't worry. I understand there was a problem. You know, I haven't gotten them in trouble or anything, you know, <laughs> right? right, yeah. right. Yes, yes, yes. But the, I mean, we, we've said before that there's a decent possibility that um, like Molly or Arthur or both of them were sort of involved from the word go because we go back to that that scene at platform nine and three quarters where like Molly is like asking aloud to the group like what's the platform and it's like you know the platform you've been yeah. here a million times so it's like it wouldn't be if this is again funneling into uh, Dumbledore's big plan it's not the first time that we've seen instance of it being directly related to like Molly and Arthur right so that would also I think continue to track a little bit with what we already know about the situation at large. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So next up, they get their core schedules. They have a double herbology with the Hufflepuffs, which I just I always point this. Out. I just I think it's funny that they have like double herbology with the Hufflepuffs and double potions with the Slytherins all the time, but never do they have classes with the Ravenclaws. <laughs> you I know, know like why not? <laughs> I, yes. And it's like, is it just too many? Like I, I I've I posed this question a bunch of times with with Neville in particular uh, from the first book where they um, what is it? The, not the venomous tentacular. What is the first? What is the plant they fall on when they go through the trap door? Oh, the oh my gosh, the devil snare. Devil snare. Thank you. I always get those two confused. Uh, similarly with uh, Justin Finch Fletchley, who we're about to meet and oh, uh, JFF. Yeah, and Ernie McMillan. Um, but the, I, it kind of goes back to that thought where I've 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 suggested before that I think that like Neville was maybe supposed to be tapped to be part of the what is otherwise what we always refer to as the golden trio. Mm -hmm. um, this is like one of those where it's like, was it just two? much to imagine like having an additional dynamic coming from the raven claws so oh, I know. it's like you have but, the but luna's there <laughs> Luna's there. Yeah, no, that's true. And maybe that was the way to be like, okay, we're not, we don't have nearly enough Ravenclaw representation. Even, even the fact that Cho Chang eventually is the Ravenclaw like seeker, yeah, like gives a little bit more for that house to do that is like otherwise largely unsung for like the first 
few installments. Oh, of I know. Series. Like especially because like you you could point out like um, I think Quirrell and Lockhart are both Ravenclaws as well. Like, okay. Yep. Yep. Sure. Um, you can do some like extracurricular reading and can like confirm their houses. So it's like they have sort of had some spotlight action here, at least as the bad guys for the first two books. Right. But also it's not brought up that they're from Ravenclaw. Sure. So like even though they were like it, it, they may as well not have been if all you did was read the book. Yeah, that's that's true as well. And I mean, that's that's the other thing. I mean, the Ravenclaws would be difficult to <laughs> illustrate, I think, a little bit in text or, or in this capacity, like for like a double class, just simply because like the Hufflepuffs feel like the mildly empathetic to Gryffindor house, whereas it seems like the Ravenclaws could be like the mildly empathetic or like, you know, uh, to the Slytherin side of things, like where if you're going to have like the like Gryffindor and Slytherin be the opposite end of the spectrum. I would say Hufflepuff seems like the house closer to Gryffindor and Ravenclaw seems like the house closer to Slytherin. Um, and so I don't know if like maybe like I guess Zachariah Smith ends up maybe being a little bit of that character as we get closer to like Order yeah, of the Phoenix. He's the worst. He's kind of well. like the, the super frustrating yeah, like Ravenclaw like, representative where it's like he, no Zachariah Smith's Hufflepuff. Is he Hufflepuff? Yeah. This, okay I literally even wrote that in my notes where I constantly confuse Justin Finch Fleshley with Ernie McMillan and Zachariah Smith and I for whatever reason I uh, yeah anyway. <laughs> They're all right there. Who says why aren't you in Ravenclaw if you can do a uh, a protein charm. Terry Boot. Terry Boot. Terry Boot. Ah, Terramus Bootimus. Indeed. Good save, man. Probably his full name. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's because it, people tend to shorten their last names as well. Their first <laughs> yeah, names. right. <laughs> Good old T Boot. <laughs> Mr. Bootimus. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Boot. Oh man, I do love the line after we um, get the their class schedules here, where you do see Sprout walking away from the Whomping Willow, um, and just sort of learn that she tended to it uh, over the night. Like, oh, yep. I I'm the herbology teacher, so of course I'm the one tending to it because it feels like as the books progress, they give like the other like it feels like at some point it's sort of sort of Snape and McGonagall that just sort of do everything. Sure. You know, yeah. like, but no, no, here's Sprout. She's doing a thing. She's doing a thing. Yeah. And what's funny about that is that I literally wrote my notes because we get the line like um, Harry spotted the Whomping Willow in the distance. Several of its branches were now in slings. I literally just wrote. I always forget this detail. Like, oh, yeah. Like if you were to ask me like, you know, how how did Professor Sprout mend the Whomping Willow after the car crashed into it? I'd be like, she didn't. Yeah. Did that happen? Was I know. That, like, it's always know? like it's, it always like Snape always says you damaged an ancient tree. And I'm always like. They didn't damage it. Are you kidding me? It's <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Like, it's, trees are hardy. Okay, okay they, right, they, exactly. It'll, it'll be fine. They hit, some branches fell off. Whatever. You know. Uh, obviously, they they do repair it though because it was damaged as much as it also damaged Ron and Harry and in the, the car. car. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so then we we get the line that basically um, we like uh, that. Sprout has like dirt under her fingernails that would have made Aunt Petunia faint, whereas <laughs> Gilderoy Lockhart was immaculate in sweeping robes of turquoise, which in case you're just keeping track of all of the different colored robes, which, oh man, could we go back and we could, all right, for <laughs> forget me not blue. Was forget that, me not blue. Yeah. Was that the one from, from Flourish and Blots? That was at Flourish and Blots. And then for the opening feast, was it um, like aquamarine? Oh, that, that it? sounds right. Oh, goodness. I wish I could remember. I, I'm like literally doing this in real time, trying to like like test myself. Oh, man. Are you like, gonna, yeah, can you find the page where it says, uh, I guess it would have been the Whomping Willow uh, chapter. Oh, my gosh. Can we find it? Hold, hold, hold. Aquamarine. Hold, hold. Aquamarine. Yep. I got it. Amazing. Amazing. Man. Way to go, team. Many all... shades of blue so far. Yes, it must. It must go. Well, I mean, I guess the Ravenclaw could be sort of like. I guess know, so. Yeah. yeah. Peeking out a little bit through that. Mm -hmm. uh, goes well with his with his flowing locks, his golden hair. Mm -hmm. uh, um, possibly, but anyway, yeah. So he's wearing the the robes of turquoise, but so just clearly that um, um, he was doing nothing inside of the the prepare or the repair of the tree, and Professor Sprout was basically doing all of it. Absolutely, which um, seems obvious to Harry at least right away that like uh, yeah, well, you didn't you didn't do anything. Um, I think it is interesting though. So then, of course, we have his famous line of Harry, <laughs> Harry, Harry. Just you know, being being old chums, which he gets in there three times in a row. He has Harry, Harry, Harry. Um, but I always think it is interesting that like he he specifically spots Harry and like pulls him aside to like give him a stern talking to or whatever. But like what he says, like I understand natural to want a bit more once you've had that first taste, and I blame myself for giving that to you because it was bound to go to your head. But see here. 
idea, young man. You can't start flying cars and try and get yourself noticed. Like he's just like, just calm down, all right. It's almost like like he he's sort of giving him good advice a little bit. Like it sounds like he's a little is he's more concerned about him than you'd expect. Yes, you no, know? I, I I understand what you're saying here. The question or like the tone of voice that you read it in is whether or not like Lockhart is worried about being like showed up by that, Harry. Uh, okay, yes. Like, Actually, I have two notes. I said oddly concerned for Harry, and then afraid of being outshone himself. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, I, I feel like with, with his overflowing vanity, there's no ability for me to see it any other way yeah. other than that being exactly what happened. Uh, but then even in the same piece of dialogue, we get. Uh, but when but when I was twelve. I was just as much of a nobody as you are now. And I wrote wrong. Yeah. In fact, I'd say I was even more of a nobody. And I wrote correct. Correct. <laughs> I know that he says like all oh, that business with he who must not be named. He he's a, I know. I know it's not quite as good as winning which weekly's most charming smile award five times in a row as I have, but it's a start, Harry. It's a start. It's like, are you comparing defeating Voldemort to winning your dumb magazine award it is and the, saying that yours is better? Yes. It's like you are massive. Like you're downplaying this situation so ridiculously that it is almost like you must be like lost inside of your own lies and think that you are that you've been like triumphing over uh, like challenges of, of like that are uh, like comparable to Voldemort right because that is just it is just so not the it case It is just so not like, the case yeah e- even if all the things that he had done were true they would still not stack up to the, I know Voldemort, so. <laughs> yes that that is the thing you're right like even if even if he wasn't a liar and all the things he had done were actually true, he would still not be as famous as Harry. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, not, not, not even in the slightest. Yeah. So, Which, uh, for the record, is the situation most people believe to be true. <laughs> Right, right, yeah. right. Yes, yeah. Nope. I- including Hermione, which is like one of those things to be continuing in the chapter. I'm just sort of like... <sighs> How like because it, it, it seems like anybody who actually knows anything would be able to tell that he's a fraud in no time flat, and Hermione knows things. Exactly. Well, that's sort of a, maybe like the the true danger of his like branding, I guess. Maybe so. You know, it's maybe like so. you know, it's like he's 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 done such a good job of it that even like perfectly smart people, like people, want it to be true so bad, right? That they just ignore the truth. Yes. Yeah. No, that's fair. That's fair. So we'll we'll keep we'll circle back to that in just a couple of minutes because now the next thing I want to talk about is the is the Mandrakes. Yes. Uh, which is what's happening inside of the first lesson for Herbology. Um, this is like one of those things that I was curious if you had any thoughts about uh, Dumbledore's big plan implications because like obviously Dumbledore does not know that the Chamber of Secrets is going to be open, that petrifications are going to be happening, nor that the Mandrakes would be vital. But I do always find it to be just a little convenient that they happen to be working with the exact plant that is also relevant to the the curing of it, there is that this it, whole book's plot. I, my my interpretation is that it's always just sort of been that like second years always start with Mandrakes, and so it's just conveniently the fact that we also will need those exact things. Um, later that year. What I found kind of interesting about it is that like um, Hermione says it's used to return people who've been transfigured or cursed to their original state. So like obviously they're going to use it to heal the people who have been petrified later on this year. Uh, However, prior to that, apologies. Hermione is going to in is is going to need is going to be transfigured in the wrong way via the polyjuice potion when she drinks it with the cat and it sounds like mandrakes are what she would need to be healed but like for some reason she's healed from like they're able to heal Hermione from that pretty quickly like even though they can't restore the people who've been petrified yet so it's like they're I don't know maybe there just is a different way to cure her from the cat transformation, but it like what she says seems like it would apply. It does. It does. I mean, I, I <laughs> suppose there's some possibility that this is like a um, like like there's some amount. I mean, like because again, to your point, if every second year, every year does this particular lesson, then maybe they have like like medium stores of it that could have been available like when Hermione is turned into a cat because I do I, I mean it is pretty interesting like it, it is used to return people who have been transfigured or cursed their original state like I'm almost curious if like this is something that like if you're even attempting to become like an animagus uh, if it would not be vitally important in like your training uh, because there if is you do have to keep some kind of leaf in your mouth for <gasps> an entire month is it a mandrake is it a mandrake leaf? leaf oh my gosh we would have to fact check that but if that was true that would be so interesting 
Oh man. Because yeah, like uh, the <laughs> the process there's there's like in the Pottermore archives like a deep dive into like what you need to do in order to become an animagus, and one of them is keeping a particular leaf under your mouth from like one full moon to the next or something like that. Some some weird amount of time. But it is it is a weird amount of time. I'm like how on earth would you not chew the leaf the entire time? I know I know like, it's like how would you not swallow it? Like it what be... are the magical properties of this leaf that it's not dissolving in your spit over thirty days worth of time in your mouth where apparently you can't take it out at all how are you eating in this time i don't know that that has always been interesting so while you look that up i will also point out that i was wondering so when because they're making a potion right that they're going to like give to the petrified people is that right yep so uh, but they can't like drink it because they're petrified so it's more of like a like a (gasps) mist kind of thing right i'm so sorry to interrupt you it is to carry a single mandrake leaf in your mouth that is so cool bam man okay okay confirmed that was fun well there you go maybe that's where it's return people who have been transfigured to their original state so it's almost like whatever whatever properties of the mandrake leaf are um, at work, it's almost like you're like permanently integrating that into your body, probably as the way to trans retransform from animal back into yes. human. It's almost right? like it's almost like setting your like uh, like transfiguration compass to like a like a to like point north or something right. like like where is where is like the home position intended ah, to be that's but so even that's kind of curious because then like when Sirius is a dog like he says that like James even suggested like making the change permanent like it'd almost be curious if you could do the same thing in reverse and it would like oh like, like if you did like if you went through the whole and Megas process again but like like the other stayed way. as a dog the whole time yeah oh that's interesting that I have interesting. no idea okay the other thing I thought was interesting is that like so it must be some sort of more like topical potion rather than like an ingestible one. Oh sure okay. because like you can't like well well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's possible, but they must. There must be a topical version of it because obviously the petrified people can't drink anything. Right. Right. So um, it also reminded me, whatever potion it is, I wonder if that is what the thief's downfall actually is <gasps> in Gringotts, because it is used to return people who have been transfigured or cursed to their original state. And like when they go through the thief's downfall, it untransforms Hermione, it untransfigures Ron, and it releases the Imperious curse from the goblin. Yeah. They quickly re put the curse on him, but like all of those things happen. Yeah, no, I totally right? think so. Yeah. So yeah. do they just have like a I'm imagining like an aquarium like filtration system where it's just sort of making the waterfall over and over and over. Right, right, yeah. right. right. Yeah, just, like, but it's just this potion. Yes, it's it's <laughs> what a what a clever little creation. Yeah. Um no, I totally I mean it, it, in some way, shape, or form, it would have to be infused with Mandrake. Right. It's so it's so heavily attached to transfiguration. So uh no, I love that. That's super cool, super interesting, neat continuity, uh, or at least head canon if not. Head- can in continuity. Yeah, yeah. can continuity. <laughs> um, okay, very cool. Very yep. cool. Um, oh, yes. uh, then so uh, for answering this question, Sprout gives Hermione ten points to Gryffindor, which like whoa, scaling much here with the points. Yeah. So this again goes back to what we said in book one, which was basically the sentiment of like it seems like they're giving out like take a point for Gryffindor, and it's like one point. One. It's yeah. Like, well, that seems so slow. Like so so few. And the the curiosity we've we've suggested before is like maybe you can earn more points the further into your schooling you are because like it is a lot more difficult to successfully get like a question right but then like the stakes are also then available like higher right um so like you can you can have more points so i'd be like it'd be interesting if you're like in your seventh year all of a sudden it was like you know you get a question right in one of your classes it's like wow that was impressive that's 50 points right it'd be like okay all right. All right, let's go and it would also prevent first years from coming in and just like ruining your house cup chances because yeah. like they could they they can contribute a little and detract a little but harder for them to contribute a lot or detract a lot right it also but it does seem like it's sort of like levels out around here like 10 points seems like a much more common number like for the rest of the time they're at hogwarts it totally so does. it's yeah. also possible then that maybe like maybe for first years it's just like all right first year is like you yeah of course you can you can play in the house cup but like you know yeah it's the training get, wheels program it's like the training wheels program yeah. you'll earn tiny points you'll lose tiny points like you won't be a huge liability to the seventh years who are like really trying hard here but like uh, second year you're in the full game you're in training yeah. wheels are off training wheels are or off something. yep yep let's go <laughs> or or it just became easier to t- say 10 points instead of one at a time or that, whatever. that's but, also true yep. um let's see <laughs> we learned the cry of the mandrake is fatal fatal to anyone who hears it which is to me i was like wow second 12 year olds are dealing with potentially fatal creatures here that's 
Wow. Okay. Yeah. The, the only thing be standing. Good, I would like. I would really reiterate that sprout. Like really. Yes. Yeah. The only thing standing between <clears throat> you and death right now is potentially a fluffy pink pair of earmuffs. Right. Yeah. Magically enhanced. Hopefully. Magically en- enhanced. Yes. Uh, so anyway, then we get the earmuffs, which do seem to be magically enhanced, so that you don't hear anything, which uh, just makes me one. It makes me bothered so much more that Neville faints in the books because it's like they shouldn't be able to hear anything because magic. Right. Um, so what well, faints in the movie? Sorry, is, he, there is no mention of Neville being good or bad about the Mandrakes in the books, which is just another slap that it happens in the movie because it's not like, oh, yeah, it happened in the books. Right. right, right. Yeah. Or, or <laughs> that even Neville was relevant to the scene. Yeah, Neville's really not at all. So I feel like there could have been a line in here that would have been like, oh, Neville finished potting his Mandrake immediately or whatever, something like that. But doesn't matter. Apparently, also, we say fatal, but apparently these are babies, so they won't kill you yet, uh, but they'll just, I guess, make you pass out or something. Right. Um, then, yeah, we get to meet uh, good old JFF, Justin Finch Fletchley. Yes. Yeah, who's who's like a bit of a character. He he seems like uh, at least muggle-born from one side of the family because he says that my name was down for Eaton. Um, this is always like one of those things that probably makes a lot more sense if you live in the UK, um, but here in America, I always, di- I, I always was curious if like Eaton was uh, like another wizarding school somewhere oh. or like like it didn't occur to me that this was like a like it, it, I don't know it as like a known boarding school otherwise. Oh, right. But uh, but I do think that Eaton is like a fairly highly prestigious uh, muggle boarding school. There you go. Uh, I think specifically for boys, but I, I don't know. I, I didn't get that far into my fact checking, but I think that that is the case. Okay. Um, otherwise, he seems to uh, similarly kind of be like fascinated with everything to do with um, Lockhart's antics. He's got the line here. It says, uh, I'd have died of fear if I'd been uh, cornered in a telephone booth by a werewolf, but he stayed cool and zap. Just fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> okay, bro. Yeah. Um, yes, it totally sold on it. It surprised me. He says, of course, a mother was slightly disappointed, but since I made her read Lockhart's books, I think she's begun to see how useful it would be to have a fully trained wizard in the family, which to me is interesting because they're in year two. So like he went through his whole first year and his mom was still like, I don't know about this. <laughs> <laughs> mm, not sold. Are we, are we sure? I mean, it kind of feels like how the Dursleys might be if <clears throat> like like Dudley had been accepted where it would be sort of like they'd be at war between being like honored that their their child had been accepted and also like like I don't know if I like I don't know what, if we, I we, like we, this. Of course, I have to imagine after like does he show is he still around? No, he is. He continues to go to Hogwarts. Who's that? Justin Finch Fletchley because oh, he's sure, in the yeah. Dumbledore's army. I think so. Yeah, yeah. which is almost surprising because it's like apparently his mom is on the fence and all that sells her is the Lockhart books. But then one this year her son is going to be attacked by a basilisk and two it's going to turn out that Lockhart was a fraud. So yeah, you should be like uh, Justin. You're still at Eaton. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. This, this <laughs> is, uh, turns out this year has not been safe. The one person I was able to look up to is a fraud. So we're not doing. We're not. We're not doing thousand. good. No, you're not going back there. You know what's <laughs> interesting though is that as I even wrote the note and I mentioned before that he reminds me of Ernie McMillan, but even his first ever uh, like you know introduction reminds me of Ernie. Like we, me and you always joke. There's this like line in Half Blood Prince where Ernie like catches up with Harry, Ron, and Hermione. He's like, "I sold DA lags." Yeah, you know, and it's, uh, it's sort of like, "Oh, we go way back." Um, <laughs> to last year. To last year. Several months ago. Like, also, you're like 16, bro. So yeah. <laughs> like, cool it. Um, but anyway, so like his his intro is, I mean, just about as friendly as you could ask of anybody. I mean, he's immediately just like, no, you are, of course, the famous Harry Potter and you're Hermione Granger, always topping everything and even throws Ron a bone and says, wasn't it you in the flying car? Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, I mean, Ron's not super like pleased <coughs> that this is coming up in this particular occasion, but at, at bare minimum, this is somebody at Attempting to be like, hey, I know all of your names and I know a thing about each of you, right? Uh, which is not the worst way to like make friends. I know. It's know? I, I mean, he's doing. Yeah, he's doing good. I mean, I mean, he maybe should have gone for the chess game, but maybe you know, so. Yeah, maybe. that's that's yeah. a good point. Yeah, like read the room, dude. Didn't you hear the howler? <laughs> or it should be like, yeah, like, look, Ron. Clearly, everyone's already forgotten about the howler. Like, chill your bones, man. Yeah, also true. Also yeah. true. People just thought it was cool. People just thought it was funny. Yeah, like, do you think that's gonna? Does that make it worse? Apparently, Ron is so embarrassed by the howler that he refuses to even ask for a fixed wand for the rest of the year. Yeah, like it must be so evident that he cannot do magic, you know, like 
what what does he think? I don't. I, the fact that he goes the whole year without asking for a new wand is like bananas to me. It is bananas, and this feels another one of those like like uh, sort of writing challenges where maybe you come up with the idea that like of having Lockhart's wand backfire at some point in time, and so like the Howler is almost an installment so that we are able to like understand. Mrs. Weasley's frustration is at such a high level that Ron doesn't even find like enough comfort in asking for a new wand. And it's otherwise like then at wizard school with one arm tied behind his back because he doesn't have the most essential tool for doing wizard stuff. Yeah. So it's like it, it almost feels like you're like if you're going to commit to like the backfiring Ron wand later, you have to find a way to pre-solve the question that is why doesn't Ron just have a new wand? I know, and, and right? it's like this is as close as we get to an answer. This is as close he, as we he's get. He's too afraid to ask his parents. Too afraid to ask and he's got spellotape. tape. You know, that's gonna that'll that'll fix it. Yeah. Right? This this reminds me so much <coughs> of uh what we watched like Rugrats growing up a lot and yeah. uh like Stu Pickles is a big inventor mm-hmm. and you know solves problems with rubber bands, bubble gum and, and scotch tape and such. Duct tape. Yeah and this this feels like just just the Stu Pickles. Yeah, just yeah, just yeah. just tape it back together. This is also like a um a pun that goes over I think American heads because like spello tape. Whenever I read it, I'm like, yeah, that's a funny name for like magical tape. Spe- they do spells, spello tape, of course. But um in in like England, like what we call what we call Scotch tape, they call cello tape. <gasps> so spello tape is like a play on that. <laughs> oh. Wow. Yeah. Man, that's there not me go. learning that for the first time ever. There okay. you go. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. Um, yeah, so we're anyway, we're seeing the issues that Ron is having with this particular wand uh, where they're trying to transfigure beetles into buttons, um, which is kind of an interesting one where later on in the uh, in the chapter, we know that uh, Hermione has a whole handful of little uh, perfectly transfigured buttons. And I'm like, hey, those poor beetles. <laughs> jeez, jeez, man! It's like can't can't you like break them free of their of their being inside of? Um, I know one thing about Hermione Granger is that she hates beetles. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Turn these beetles into buttons. Lock that beetle in a jar. Yeah, absolutely no empathy towards these. No beetles. beetles. Yep, yep, um, <clears throat> yep. So maybe maybe that's just a little. It may, I'm joking, but maybe it's foreshadowing. Yeah, maybe you know, that's for, right. For yeah. Rita Skeeter to come in in book four. Mm-hmm. Um, something to look out. This for. is like when Rita Skeeter in like book four starts being such a problem. It's like why it's. Like it, it seems like she would be problematic the first three years too. Like certainly she's like writing articles and stuff now. Yes, that is a good point. You know, and where's the Rita Skeeter articles about Sirius Black? Like certainly she had things to say about that. Almost certainly. what a bungling the ministry is doing or something something or other. Wow. Yeah. Good. I mean, what a headline. Exactly. I can see it already. What a bungling. <laughs> what a bungling. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it definitely seems like uh, Rita should have should be showing up, but may- maybe they're maybe they're just not like it's not like relevant <coughs> stories to what they're dealing with. And yeah. so like they're just not like making the headlines. And and like for most of the series, like through like with Sirius, like there could be all sorts of headlines about him and they could be like super incriminating and stuff. But like none of them really have like any empathy towards Sirius. So they're not like, wow, can you believe what this this person's yeah, writing Skeeta says yeah yeah so maybe i guess in the cool. wider wizarding world things are just pretty calm right now yes yeah yeah um so next thing we get though is uh a we get to meet the the boy that harry saw uh, at the sorting hat ceremony the night before which happens to be the one and only colin creevy mm-hmm. um which is maybe possibly like an indication that like harry himself is just cursed with bad luck because in an entire year's worth of schooling where the primary objective is to not lean into his fame there happens to be a new kid in his house who is all about emphasizing harry's fame oh yeah 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 i thought this was this is so she, she just immediately comes up like can i take a picture we sign it yeah that's pretty fun i thought also he says like uh someone in his dormitory said if i develop the film in the right potion the pictures will move which is just interesting because it means that like the fact that the pictures move has something to do with the development of the film I always thought it maybe had more to do with the camera because whenever you see the cameras like in the movies or I think even in the book it like describes them as being like smoking and looking like very old fashioned cameras. Yeah, we were seeing. Yeah, you're right. We were seeing that uh, during flourish and blotch chapter where the the photographer is taking photos. But they're like they're they're like much more modern film cameras. You know, like even in the 90s, like our dad had a camera that shot on film. Yeah. You know, like it doesn't have to be some giant flashbulb smoking thing to get a f- like a film picture if it's just the potion that makes it move. I you know. know. I, well, I wonder if maybe the possible difference here is that he's using a 
uh, muggle camera. Yeah. And, and so like maybe because it's a muggle camera versus like a wizarding camera, like you have to use a potion that is then influencing the muggle film. And oh. you're, you're almost getting like a live photo. I suppose. I suppose. Thing. So you think like a like a wizard camera would? There are wizard. Okay, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Like wizard, wizard cameras, cameras would just automatically have moving pictures. Exactly. I see. Yeah. This is okay. this is more because it seems it seems like he's Muggleborn and uh you know he I mean his dad's a milkman. Um, <laughs> Does so, it say that in this one? Yes. My dad's a, he's a milkman. He couldn't believe it either. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm taking loads of pictures to send home to him. Honestly, really adorable. Oh, I mean, like yes. you know, for for any 11 year old to be like, I can't wait to. <laughs> Send, send photos back home to mom and dad. It's like if like now being a parent, if there was a world where Addie at 11 is somewhere and she wants to send me photos from there, like that would just fill my heart with sheer glee. Oh, I know, right? You it's know? like also it's just I feel a little bad for Colin here because if he just like managed to catch Harry like in the common room or something like at night, like I'm sure Harry would have just been like, oh, sure, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, Harry's you know? a nice enough human being. <laughs> yeah. Like it's the, the problem is, is that again, going back to Harry being cursed is that Draco Malfoy shows up <laughs> inside know. of this conversation <laughs> Followed by Gilderoy Lockhart. It's like, are you kidding me right now, bro? <laughs> it is like the worst two possible people to show up while signed photos are being discussed. Uh, but I do love this one particular line from Colin, who we know ends up being quite a brave character. He's a member of Dumbledore's army. He dies at the Battle of Hogwarts. But um, Malfoy, who is now going to be like, you know, his upperclassman, it sounds like Colin's kind of a small kid anyway, yeah. um, stands up for Harry uh, to, to Malfoy and says, You're just jealous, piped up Colin, whose entire body was about as thick as Crab's neck. Um, you know, that honestly, I find that to be like pretty admirable. Like, it he's is. clearly in the right house. Oh, but he's definitely know? in the right house, and it is pretty brave of him to do it. And also, not for nothing, he's a thousand percent correct. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Malfoy's like, Jealous. And it's like, Yeah. Yes, you are, dude. You're so jealous. Yeah, that is exactly yeah. what is happening right yeah. now. <laughs> and, this, and this this muggle kid just just caught you in one. Just caught you in one. He's like, who didn't? Yeah, what does he say? Of what? I don't know. I don't want a foul skull right across my head. Thanks. It's like, yeah, but you do want all the attention that it gets you. So not to mm-hmm. mention, it's a pretty baller scar. Pretty baller. I know. It's like lightning, lightning bolt, bolt shape. Yeah. Come on, right, dude. Seriously. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, that what Ron uh, threatens threatens him to eat slugs, which is of course later a spell he's actually going to try and cast at Malfoy, which will backfire and hit himself and make himself. Puke, puke slugs. slugs. Yeah. Yep, yep. Gross. Yep. Trying his best though. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, yeah, so then of course, uh, like, like I just mentioned, Lockhart stumbles into the situation and yeah. once again, just has more advice, uh, you know, for, for Harry about how like you're, you're not quite at this stage of your co- career. <laughs> it isn't sensible. Looks a, a tad big headed <laughs> is, is what Lockhart says to him. And this is like one of those lines like where he specifically says at this stage of your career. And this is such like projecting Lockhart's own uh, like beliefs, intentions, and values onto Harry that he is assuming that Harry is developing his own fame-based career at, at like as a twelve-year-old. Yeah, like that. All of this is very intentional. Yes, of course. Yeah, I want to yeah. say like it's um, there is a thing I think um, there in whatever like the ebook chapter about Lockhart where like even as a student like I guess. Because he, is he Muggleborn? Is that right? I want to say. I can't remember. It I can't might remember. be the case. Maybe, maybe he is the only. He might no. be the only wizard. Yeah, to, in his family. In his family. Yeah, like there were like squibs and then him. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which which possibly is like feeding into this like this inflated sense of like ah yes I am better than my siblings or something. Right. Like that. But yeah. then he like arrives at Hogwarts and like fails to realize that like everyone else there is just as magical as him and he's yes. <laughs> right. I want right. to say he tries to pull a stunt where he like writes his name in cursive across the entire Quidditch field. Yep. I think. Yep. And it's like, uh, it's like, I can't, I feel like when you read about it in the book, it's like no one's really impressed, but I feel like that'd be such a hilarious prank in real life. Oh, like, like if you managed to pull that off, like right. I'm like, I don't know. I feel like maybe that would have earned you some popularity points. It could have. It could yeah. have. I mean, this is this is like uh, like I feel like if Fred and George just weren't beaters on the team already, then they probably would have done uh, exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. Like, yeah. They, you know, they put up a giant like whiz, we, we, Weasley wizard wheezes up in the sky before they leave. Right, right, right. You know? yeah, maybe yeah. they would have done like, you know, poo. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was like every time we go to play Quidditch, the, the Weasleys have just written another message out there. Yeah, <laughs> that, that yeah. Like them. yeah. I also yeah. So anyway, Lockhart shows up. I'm almost surprised Snape doesn't show up at this scene too. To uh, yeah, me, right? Like, you know? yeah, I know. Why not? Why, Why not? not? Potter. 
<laughs> giving out sarn photos. That'd be a thousand points from Gryffindor. Right, right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, man. Let's see. I, yeah, I love uh, Lockhart just name dropping at every or just listing all of his accomplishments off at at all or because we get into his class next, right? Yeah, yeah. They go into his class and he's uh, holding up his books. Travels the trolls. I love his little introduction. He says, "Me, Gildroy Lockhart, or Order of Merlin, third class," which is like the only other time you mention the other classes is that <laughs> he's not first class. He's not. Yeah, I, yeah. I underline third class. Too. Yes. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Weird flex, but okay. Weird flex, yeah. <laughs> Honorary member of the Dark Force Defense League and five time winner of which weekly's most charming smile award. <gasps> but I don't talk about that. <laughs> it's like, I love the, but I don't talk about that. <laughs> it's like, it is like, it's come up twice in this chapter, bro. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Like, oh man. But all, uh, all of these things, it's like, it's pretty funny because it's like, yeah, Order of Merlin third class, which to me is almost sort of like, like, the whatever governing body that that hands out the order of Merlin's knows that he's a fraud and they're like in like the public is almost demanding like him be awarded something right like, fine. We'll give him the lowest one right you know like, all and right, then right. He, even then he's an honorary member of the dark force Defense right League. yes and his only other like major accolade is winning a, like, a magazine thing. So it's like none of these awards are as prestigious as he's making it sound like they are. Oh, I know I know. Yes, but I don't. This is also. I think this entire line is just like it is like word for word in the movies. Yes, yes, it you is. Know? Yep. It's just like the delivery is so good. It's like I didn't get rid of the banded banshee by smiling at her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just wrote LOL next to it. Oh my like, god, yeah. I can't stop laughing. Oh my god, I know. I highlighted this whole thing and just wrote gold next to it. It's yes. like this is one of my favorite like just introductions ever. It's just like he's so smarmy and stupid. Oh, yeah. oh my mm. gosh. Uh, let's see. Uh, um, bu- 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 they take the quiz. They take the quiz. Fifty-four uh, quiz. They take the fifty-four question survey <laughs> about <laughs> about Lockhart. This little focus group here. Yeah, all right. So here's me answering. One. What is Gilderoy's favorite color? Gilderoy Lockhart's favorite color: lilac. What is Gilderoy Lockhart's secret ambition? I put hair care products. What, in your opinion, is Gilderoy Lockhart's greatest achievement to date? I just wrote, "Wow." <laughs> 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 yeah, that sounds about right. It's like, oh, come on. It's like yeah, th- that that is like just inviting compliments in a way that is so like <laughs> absurd. <laughs> I know, right? Oh man, if everyone would like to leave us some comments down in the YouTube about what do you think is our greatest accomplishment to date? <laughs> you know, just whatever you think. What, whatever comes to mind. Whatever, whatever comes yeah, to mind, yeah, you know? Yeah. yeah. Oh man, no, don't do that. Um, let's see. And then let's see. He goes on um, to kind of answer all of these questions for us. So uh, I clearly state in chapter 12 that my ideal birthday gift would be harmony between all magic and non magical peoples, which he's talking about wanderings with werewolves here, which like uh, obviously he's a fraud anyway, but it's like a surprisingly progressive stance towards werewolves. If you like have to consider like what the situation must have been like if he wants harmony between magical and non magical people in a book called wanderings with werewolves then it sounds to me like context clues would suggest that the conflict in the book is between a werewolf the magical people and the non magical people muggles right so he wants harmony between these groups of people but the the conflict would have been between a werewolf. So it's like, like, is he advocating for werewolf? He's rights? advocating for werewolf rights. Okay. It, like, okay. in a, you know, you know, illegitimate way, yeah. but it's there. <laughs> it's like, I mean, at least, at least we can get on board with the messaging, if nothing else. If nothing else. No matter how much of a fraud he is. <laughs> yes. Um, I uh, did, I did highlight the very next line, though, that yeah. says, uh, cause that, that is his favorite, uh, like, like gift. Is that what he wants? Is, or, yeah, ideal birthday gift. Yes. Um, I wouldn't say no to a large bottle of Ogden's old fire whiskey. I, that's just trivia for me. It's just like, okay, mm-hmm. if not, if not, uh, harmony between magic and not magic people, then Ogden's fire whiskey. Okay. Remember that remember one. remember that one that's Stash like my, that's his real that's his real answer yes. um, and then this is this is I love this line right, right down here and it says his secret ambition is to rid the world of evil and market my own range of hair care hair care potions and it's like what is just especially hilarious about this secret ambition is that uh, Harry Harry Potter uh, literally does rid the world of evil and his entire fortune is built on a line of hair care potions. It is. It is. <laughs> so yeah. So like, so like, like <laughs> Harry lives out. Harry lives out Lockhart's 
dream. Right, right, yes. Also, uh, you're calling this a secret ambition. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. What's my secret ambition? It's like uh, definitionally impossible to know. Yes, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, like I, w- I would literally write, if it's a secret. Right? I know, yeah. right, come on now. I shouldn't expose, this is a trick question. I shouldn't expose you yeah. here in this pop quiz. <laughs> also, why would you keep that a secret? I know. Uh, yeah, yeah. That would be like, like my my secret ambition is to run for president of the United States. I shall tell no one. Shall tell no one. <laughs> like, I'll probably get that. People will just know. They'll just know. That, I mean, at some point in time, <coughs> I will get there. Uh, I'll win the writing. Uh, yeah, exactly. I'll win. I'll win the writing. I'll win the writing based on being such a good person. People are like, it has to be Ben. He's not even campaigning. Uh, it has to be Ben. And then, and then I'm, in my acceptance speech, I would I will just say, <laughs> little did all of you know, this was in fact my own secret ambition. Mm-hmm. <laughs> to, to Thank ar- you for making it possible. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, yeah. yep, anyway, so that's. I <laughs> humbly accept. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Oh my gosh! Uh, then, then he does. He dives into what what feels like could be a decent opener for it does uh, like a defense against the dark arts professor. He says, "Now be warned. It's my job to arm you against the foulest creatures known to wizard kind. You may find yourselves facing your worst fears in this room. Know only that no harm can befall you whilst I'm here. All I ask is that you remain calm." So, I mean, kind of hilariously is like, I mean, if Lupin had said this before the Bogart lesson, it would be just dead true. Yeah, like, right. Because like he says, you may be facing your worst fears in this room. Like in year three, at least in the year as we can tell, based on like in Fantastic Beast, Dumbledore's also teaching Defense Against the Dark Arts and is also doing the Bogart lesson. Yeah. It would suggest that like later, possibly this week, he would be teaching the Bogart lesson to the third year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like, okay. You'd think. Yeah. Also, like there is a bit of like in spite of himself, Harry leaned <laughs> around his pile of books for a better look at the cage. It's like like Harry has pretty much, I think, already decided that Lock Lockhart is a fraud, but it's like I think it's a great demonstration of like Lockhart's showmanship that like Harry's like, wait, wait, what do you have here? <laughs> so, <laughs> like, oh. okay, I'm interested. <laughs> they're, like, they're I actually, don't believe you, but like there's a thing. There's a we're going to have a thing. Right. And then like, but again, it's like what kind of delusions does he have here? Like he has this Cornish pixie thing and like either he thinks the kids are just going to be able to do it. No problem or like that, like, but like he knows he can't do it. Oh, I so know. Like, yeah. What is he doing? I, I, I know it's like it's like this is so this is so like <clears throat> not a good play like I know it's it, like to the point where it's like like you just have to ask how delusional this man actually is. Yeah. Um, so anyway, there, there's the line though. It says the pixies were electric blue and about eight, eight inches high with pointed faces and voices so shrill it was like listening to a lot of budgies arguing. I just had to look up what a budgie was because I was like, what is a budgie? Uh, it's small, colorful parrots. Oh, parrots. Parrots. Yeah, okay. Yes, indeed. So wow. for I, I imagine squirrels. Squirrels? Yeah, I look like budgies. Oh, budgies. Yeah, like I, I was thinking like a bird, which I guess a parrot is. A parrot is a bird. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so you were dead on. There we go. Um, yep. So you got that. I am almost surprised though. It does say within minutes, half the class was sheltering under desks. Like I am, I am almost surprised that they can't handle them in a way. I I know. You know? Yeah, because like he, like the fact that like Seamus knows what they are. Um, and like I mean, he's just sort of like, well, they're they're not very dangerous are they like you know this I'm trying to imagine what like a like a real life version of this type of thing would be like you know like if, if somebody were to like uncover like a like a crate full of kittens you know what maybe it may, maybe squirrels is accurate yeah, if yeah, someone yeah. Was like a cage of squirrels you'd be like well <laughs> I yeah, worst fears confirmed. But if someone had a giant cage of like fifty squirrels and was like, "Let's see what you make of them," <laughs> and just let them free, I'd be like, "Whoa, okay, hold on." <laughs> there are so many squirrels right now. <laughs> so many squirrels. I, I guess that would be. You know what? That'd be. It's a pretty fair comparison because I don't think I would know what to do. <laughs> That's a good point. And squirrels are otherwise like they. I mean, it, it's really funny to me that you could like walk down the street and the squirrel could be right next to you, and you, and you in no way, shape, or form panic at all. I know, but, but if yeah. there were 50 squirrels in your classroom, yeah, it'd yeah. be like, this is too many squirrels. <laughs> this is a lot of squirrels. This is a lot of squirrels. How did you get them in the cage? Uh, did you go to the cage? Why are they out of the cage? Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's okay. really funny. Uh, the the next thing is the, uh, like, so <clears throat> but obviously everybody's having a really difficult time. Neville's being lifted into the air by his ears, which sounds just incredibly painful. Um, I think that, yeah, so then um, Lockhart is like, okay, come on now. They're only pixies. And he uh, bellows into the air. Uh, pesky pesky pesternomy, which I think is it's sort of like a um, uh, mad gabs almost of, yeah. of just like like pesky pixies 
pester no me. Like, yes. Like no me. Like don't pester me anymore. Right. These, these pesky pixies pester me no more. It's like he's trying to like morph English words into sounding Latin. Yeah. You know, which yeah. is like what most of the spells are like based in. Right. So it's like it's like, but all you did was just sort of mispronounce a bunch of English words rather than say magic words. It's it's a lot more similar to uh, to Ron's spell to turn scabbers yes. yellow on the train. Yeah. So it's like it's like in that vein. It's like and sure enough, it had absolutely no effect. <laughs> um, yeah. So does does nothing at all. Um, and at this point in time, the bell rings, which does the bell always ring that was like one of those where i was like the bell i think i think it's so is yeah. there a bell okay yeah okay. sure enough that's fine then um <clears throat> but yeah so then lockhart runs out the door and catches sight of harry ron hermione and is just basically like well i'll just i'll just leave it to you three to nip the rest of them back into their cage uh this is because his wand has been taken by the the uh pixies and thrown out the window <laughs> um which i find to be kind of hilarious because i'm pretty sure actually i fact checked it before we before we did this uh when they they are recruiting Lockhart to come and um, like go into the Chamber of Secrets with them. It says Lockhart was blasted backwards, falling over his trunk. His wand flew into the air. Ron caught it and flung it out the open window. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, this comes back to haunt him later. It's like yeah. Man, my wand went out that same window again. Ron's getting a lot of ideas. He's like, oh, Ron, what wand out the window? Got it. I'll use that later. Eat slugs. Got it. I'll use that later. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We're getting like lots of lots <laughs> of setup for Ron for the rest mm-hmm. of the story. Um, anyway, but then uh, like Ron is just basically like, can you believe this guy and her Hermione is still just sort of being like, like he's got all the, he he just wants us to have a hands on experience. But like, this is like one of those where like, like, uh, Hermione, well, they're going to say, you've read all of his books. Look at all those amazing things he's done. And Ron says, he says he's done. And it's like, Ron is just like, you know, right. from like a student's perspective, he has figured it out very fast. Oh my gosh, I know. It's like, I wrote that down. I said, good instincts, Ron. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, it's a great example of like the difference between Ron and Hermione here, like what Ron is bringing to the table. It's like, Ron can just like see right through it immediately. And like Hermione is like, it's in books. Like it has to be true. He's a teacher. Like all all respect must be given yeah. at all times. And Ron's just like, like, you know, uh, how about I look at the situation plainly and recognize the truth of the matter? <laughs> this is not being able to see the forest for the trees yeah. type of situation where like, yeah, Hermione is, she's entrusted books as a reliable, uh, like source of information and in like for good reason for so long. Right. And it's like all of a sudden the thing that has been so reliable is steering her wrong. And it's right. like, she just can't see past the books, but it is it is like one of those things where I think I think I can't remember if this is just a movie quote or not, but um, like I think at some point in time, Hermione says like I'm highly logical. It allows me to see past like all of the other, you know, like uh, details or information and cut straight through to the to the actual whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm doing a bad job paraphrasing paraphrasing yeah. this particular thing, but uh, she says like she's not smart. She's highly logical. Yeah, she says that about the potions. No, well. Well, she describes the potions as logic puzzle. Okay, yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah. But this this seems like she has let logic uh, be thrown out the window. Yeah, bit, right. Yeah. In the name of being enamored by Gilderoy. Yes, 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 indeed. indeed. So um, anyway, but that does bring us to the end of Chamber of Secrets, Chapter Six. Do yes, we have a review for does. the day? We do have a review for the day from uh, W Gill six twenty eight. Hey, here we go. All right, so says, uh, absolutely love the podcast. It's so fun to listen to the stories with such a fine tooth comb focus on each chapter. The theories that are discussed are so fascinating, too. My husband asked me these questions while we were listening, and I wasn't sure of the answer. Could it, Okay, so this is the question they have for us, then. Could it be possible that Scabbers was a real rat when he was with Percy in the first two books? Then, when Sirius escapes, Peter Gr- Pettigrew kills the rat and takes his place in the Weasley household. Is Scabbers missing his toe mentioned before book three? This could be a bit of an explanation for why Fern and George never questioned Peter Pettigrew being in Harry and Ron's dorm since it didn't happen until the third year. So I, to me, I don't think it is. I, I'm pretty sure by the time we meet Scabbers in book one, he's already missing the toe and it is definitely Peter. But I, I don't hate the idea that like Percy went to Diagon Alley and picked out a rat and had a real rat that Peter then 
replaced. <laughs> replaced, yeah. Because yeah. I, I think I think kind of like the big <clears throat> explanation is that like Peter wanted to live with a wizarding family that would kind of like provide him with a continuous source of like news <clears throat> about what was going on in like the comings and goings of the wizarding world. Um, so I, I, th- I feel like it makes the most sense. The other thing too, I think is that there's like sort of like the unusually long lifespan of yeah. scabbers, which I, I guess could still come with some amount of replacement, but yeah, it's, it's it would, it would have to be that a bit of a coincidence that like, if that's true, then the coincidence would have to be that the very year Percy got a rat, like Peter came in and just like replaced himself as the rat yeah, right which, away because I think there is a line where like Ron says like Scap is better than my family for and Sirius interrupts him and he's like 12 years 12 years Here's a long life for yeah. come and go like, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> good, good serious impersonation <laughs> thank you thank you I, I can like feel Sirius's like frustration with like, <laughs> like, like you, you see do you <laughs> see the timing yeah <laughs> awfully fortunate is it not yeah um no, that is super funny. It's a great question, though, and it would it would bring me a lot of comfort versus the scenario where, like, because that's the other thing, too, is that, like, Peter is just, like, I mean, it just, it seems like such an abysmal existence, like, to subject yourself to. Yeah. To just, to just being someone's pet for so long. It does. Like, you know, in, in this particular capacity, and to be kind of like a sucky pet, too. Like, yeah. Oh, like, I know. Yeah. There is a, so I, I don't, I don't think... I'm pretty sure as long as we've known Scabbers, as long as Harry knows Scabbers, he's Peter yeah. the whole time. As for your question about what, like, could that explain why Fred and George don't see Peter on the map? Um, the our, our theory there is that the Marauders don't show up on the map except to the other Marauders. Yes, and it would <clears throat> it would sort. I mean, this has sort of been the theory, just simply because it would be a <clears throat> way for. Uh, like if the map were to fall into the wrong hands, it would protect specifically the Marauders from anybody attempting to use it against them. Right, like um, Snape or something. Right, <laughs> which which the map specifically insults. I mean, that's like a like do we. I guess we don't know for sure whether the map will only insult Snape in particular because the four of them just openly Did. disliked him or if it would insult anyone who read it, but we just don't ever see it do it again. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it could be some sort of built in defense mechanism there. Um, and that would explain it. So if you're wondering about then in the movie, how Harry sees Peter on the map, that's not canon. That just puts it in the movie because they didn't want to explain it in any other way. They also don't explain in the movie who the Marauders are. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's like that's like one of those things where I've wanted to make a video for a long time, which is just sort of like details that the movies leave out that I'm curious, like how they impact non book read people because there's I mean, I, like the other really big one is that like in Deathly Hallows, uh, Harry just has the mirror, the broken piece of mirror that like connects him to uh, April Fourth, yeah. and it's sort of like like if you're just watching the movies and you're like, where did the mirror come from? Like, right. what's the deal with the mirror? Why, like, why do why do they have that? It's like, does that like I I have no idea. It's like I can't I can't not watch it without knowing all the context that I know from the books and so many rereads and everything. But yeah. Like, I, sometimes I'm like, if you were just watching the movie, are you kind of like, uh, wait, what? <laughs> like, hey, it's almost like they're relying on you being like, uh, what? Do, are we supposed to know about that? I he must have had. I don't know. I guess I just forgot where he got it. Yeah. Maybe he had it. Yeah. Maybe he had it. Okay. Um. <laughs> It's been like a year since I saw the last one, so whatever. Hey, no big deal. It'll be fine. It'll and make then, sense when it makes sense. Or else they're just like, yeah, you'll uh, anyone who doesn't know, they'll be there with someone who knows, and they'll be like, what was that mirror? And he'll be like, Sirius gave it to him in year five. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Some, like, oh, like okay. That. I don't remember that, but I believe you. Good deal. I'm on board. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> so that'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see if they ever do subsequent variations, which it sounds like they're going to, uh, like like how much more they will be able to maintain true to form, because it, it, the proposed HBO show, at the very least seems th- like it is being described as a 10-year project with seven seasons one for each book so yeah it does seem like there should be lots of room for details like this to to make it in there but it does anyway, yes so. we've gone on such a deep tangent at this point so we have so yeah. anyway long story short um pretty sure sh- yeah um it, it, it is possible that peter replaced an existing rat i i think he's just been 
Peter the whole time. I think so too. Yeah, yeah that's that's where I'd be at. But uh, great question, either which way. And in the future, if you'd ever like to leave a review or question for us for a future episode, we would absolutely love it. So yeah. definitely uh, go to any of the places, Spotify, wherever pods are cast, really, uh, and leave your, leave yourself a review for us to find. It does help the show with a little bit of discovery, which is always great and a good way to kind of support us. So I know. We, yeah, we we're it. we're well on our way to our very, very hopeful uh, hundred thousand subscribers over on YouTube. So if you haven't subscribed yet, please go ahead and click that button. Just just for the laws, man. Just to, just to get us a button. You I know? know. I know. It'd be so cool. We could put yeah. it on. We could put it on our, our. We have a set here. If you've only ever listened to us, we also have like a, a a video version on YouTube that you can see. Like you can see us sitting here in our chairs. Yeah. It's highly riveting stuff. I know, really, yeah. very, very riveting stuff. We have a flickering lamp behind me and stuff, and a sword. There's a sword. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, you, you know, just you know, if you want to check it out. Um, otherwise, that is going to bring us to the end of chapter six. Join us next week for chapter seven: Mudbloods and Murmurs, as we travel once more through the Gryffindor.